Bruno, A Dark Mafia Romance Written by Raven Scott Narrated by Jack Callahan Prologue La Cosa Nostra There's a very powerful feeling that comes with being a made man. From the way people treat you, to the easy money, easy women, and the sense of family that ties true crime brothers. You feel invincible, unstoppable. It's like a drug. Speeding at 90 miles per hour, you become a different person. Cocksure and brash. You start throwing the dice on your freedom, on your life. Committing criminal acts in the name of loyalty and ball-kicking revenge. Risking it all in pursuit of a colossal payoff. Moving too fast for logic to remind you that every high has its come down. So shit-faced delusional that you feel nobody can touch you. Not unless they want to wind up in the trunk of your car by the end of the week. That's how they want you to feel. The bosses. The godfathers of the mob. That's why they recruit prospects young. Young and desperate. Amateur street-level criminals willing to trade their souls and blacken their hearts for a shot at a big-time score. That's right. In this sorry-ass pool of misguided faith is where the raging megalodon sharks of the mob reef feed. Once you're in it, you start to realize all the rules. Trust, honor, it ain't so. Nobody plays fair in this game. You can't trust anyone fully. Not even your own brothers. The only way to win. Make it to the top before somebody's bullet plants eyeballs into the back of your skull. Myself, I don't have any regrets. Clichéd as fuck, but I know in my heart this life chose me. Like everyone else, the oldies lured me in with promises of money and notoriety. Most never get there. Most limp along, never achieving the success they were promised. But I did. Was I to live like some asshole's bitch the rest of my life? Fuck no. I always wanted to be boss. Knew it from day one. To live, die, and be remembered as the boss, no matter what it took. Hell, I knew that hunger was dangerous. Real fucking dangerous. Like a little dumbass bitch, I always figured I'd be okay. Thought I was better than that. Like a cocky ass fucker, I saw myself as the exception. Not like most of those wise guys out on the streets. I was raised tough. And I saw what was coming out of this life. Knew what to expect. Most don't. See, it's only later, when you're a made man sworn into that life, that you start to taste the bitter aftertaste of what you become. And it's a bitch of an aftertaste. When the mob has you by the throat, by the balls, infiltrating your every thought even while you sleep, most realize it's too much for them. When you learn all that power is just a fucked up mental state with deadly repercussions and shit, Therein lies the dilemma for everybody who eats the poison. There's no walking away from the mob. No ifs and or buts about it. No walking away. Ever. Not even for the idiots and the pussies that should have never been let in to start off with. It's a sad fucking truth for those who are weak. It's an unhappy story for others, whose lives found new priorities and things they'd rather fucking do. But there it is. You're theirs until death, or until the jury brings their guilty verdict. You're mafia for life. La cosa nostra. You can't leave. Shit. They'll carry you out feet first before you'll ever do that. Bruno De Luca. Chapter 1. The Very Unfortunate Beginning. Sicily, Italy, 1973. You ready? Bruno winked at his brother. Guns nodded firmly. Bring it on. 
Nobody saw when the two brothers in black scaled the metal gates around the parking area of Alcantara Gorge, Sicily. No one noticed how the fluorescent street lighting bounced off their bodies, casting eerie, elongated shadows. The streets were empty and quiet tonight. Although partially lit and locked behind tall steel gates, the parking lot was unguarded. In the moonless dark, the lonely car park seemed somehow sinister, but these men were used to a sense of foreboding. Two broad-shouldered bears of men scurried in unison deep into the parking lot and disappeared behind the far wall of the unlit security box. It was one of only five blind spots from the security cameras, perched on telephone poles on the perimeter, facing inwards. With his back to the wall, Bruno's eyes panned the scene and quickly sighted on a red Fiat. He looked back at his brother and grinned. Over there, that's our mark, he whispered. Guns glared at the vehicle. You think it's alarmed? Bruno shook his head. Not this one. Guns nodded. Cool, I've got your back. Drawing a knife from its sheath on his belt, he slid the blade through the base of the sash window, unlocking it from the outside. He pressed upwards with his palms to free the bottom of the window from the windowsill. Once the sash was freed, Bruno placed his hands underneath the sash and pushed up the window, allowing guns to climb inside. Swinging a black duffel bag from over his shoulder, he passed the other man the bag and waited in silence for a few minutes while his brother tinkered around inside. When the lights went out and darkness fell, Bruno switched on his torch and knew the surveillance cameras were now as dead as the lights. When guns gave him a thumbs up from the open window, Bruno jerked his chin towards the red car and narrowed his eyes, listening intently to his surroundings for anybody else who could be around. Silence. Squatting low, he hustled across the tarmac towards the shiny red Fiat in the far corner. Without hesitation, he shrugged off his bomber jacket, wrapped it around his fist, and punched through the window, shattering the glass with a smash. With his fist inside the vehicle, he dropped his coat onto the floor of the car. He felt just under the window frame on the inside for the lock, then, unlocking the door, he clicked it open and jumped in. At once, he shoved a screwdriver from his pocket into the ignition. He turned it like a key and grinned as the engine fired. Flicking the headlights on low beam, he shifted into reverse and turned the wheel toward the exit. A natural-born risk-taker, Bruno's veins were stiff with adrenaline, but his hands rested calm and easy around the steering wheel like an Indy driver's grip. Rolling slowly forwards, he raised his eyes to the locked gates and saw his brother loitering there. He watched as the other man tugged a pair of heavy-duty bolt cutters from the duffel bag. Then, positioning the giant cutters over the stainless steel chains, he snapped them in half with two bites of its metal teeth. Bruno sighed with a mild frustration. If he had his way, they'd have cut the front gates in the beginning and walked right on through. Surely that was why they were dressed head to toe in black, right? Even if the cameras caught them, they couldn't possibly be identified. But his brother always wanted to be careful, always cut the cameras first to make sure they'd never be caught. Guns was no coward, but he'd always been vigilant. Every week, it was the same routine, different location. Every time, it was the same. The slow, boring approach was Guns' style all over. Bruno waited a moment as Guns quickly opened one of the gates. As the vehicle came up to the exit, Bruno nodded to his brother who closed the gate behind him. For a few minutes, he waited out of sight just up the street while Guns kicked on the power again. Then, when he saw the lights come on, he eased the car forward and watched the fence where they'd come in until he saw guns climbing over. For just a heartbeat, Bruno's fingers tightened around the soft leather of the wheel and a ghost of a smile washed over his lips. No witnesses, no evidence, no conviction. Bruno reeled off his brother's mantra in his mind as guns approached the car. This was the fifteenth or sixteenth time Bruno and his older brother had done this, and the setup was perfect, flawless. 
They were like a well-oiled machine when they tag-teamed. No frills, no mess. On the average run, they could jack six cars, and that could bring them $3,000 a night, cash in hand. Too good to be true? Too good to last? Bruno often wondered. Still, he tried not to think about it, knowing that he wouldn't be stealing cars forever. He'd move up the ranks soon enough. Time would take care of that. When his partner got close, Bruno leaned over and pushed open the passenger door. Guns leaped inside, then slammed the door shut. Jamming the wheel right, Bruno burned rubber leaving the place towards the highway. As they stormed onto the main road, Bruno floored it. He laughed triumphantly. The job may have been mind-numbingly easy, but the thrill in his veins never died. He loved it, but not everyone around him did. His father had warned him of this destructive streak, told him, Once organized crime gets into your bones, it doesn't get out again. You change on a cellular level until you need it like your blood needs oxygen. And he was right. In spite of that, Bruno knew that walking on the cutting edge of a knife was what he did best. So, what in the world was wrong with playing to your strengths? Besides, was there really any straight to narrow path out there for the son of a mob boss? Of course not. It was in his DNA as much as it was in his father's. As the beast roared down the highway, it sent the cool night air jet-streaming into the car through the smashed-out window. Guns swore. Bruno, you fucked up the window. Again. Bruno glanced over at him. Leave it to you to break the window when you got the tools and skills you need to pick a goddamn lock, Guns grumbled. Yep, any lock in less than ten seconds flat. But where's the fun in that? Bruno scoffed. Picking locks is for pussies. He glanced at his brother again, a grin curling on his lips beneath his black balaclava. Guns barked a laugh. Ha! Well, I like to keep things a little more subtle. I'd rather keep my ass out of jail, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. And I wouldn't mind not losing a few hundred on each job every time you do that, Guns retorted. Bruno made no reply, eyes narrowing on the clear road runway of tarmac ahead. Closing his foot down on the accelerator, he watched the speedometer climb past 80 miles per hour. Lighten up, bro. We've done this enough times before, Bruno said finally. Relaxing his shoulders, he switched on the car audio. It was as simple as breathing to him as he sped away to the beat of Africa, Toto singing from the cassette player, oblivious to the unmarked Lancia pulling out of the shadows from the lay-by. Suddenly, a double shaft of light pierced the darkness from the right, slashing into Gunza's eyes. Out of nowhere, a lone police car peeled up on their path. Guns nudged Bruno, anxiously scrubbing his face with his hand. Shit, we got company. Bruno punched off the radio. What do those fucking ass wipes want? He growled from behind the wheel. Huh, let me take a motherfucking guess. How about, maybe they heard the music you shouldn't have been playing through the busted window you shouldn't have broke. How about they saw the busted window and want to know how the fuck that happened? That settle your curiosity? Guns sneered. Quiet, I got this, said Bruno. Abruptly turning off into an unlit side road, he checked the rear view to see how much distance he had between him and them. Guns growled. Removing his holster, he tossed it out the window, then snatched Bruno's twenty two caliber pistol from his belt and chucked that, too. What the fuck are you doing? Bruno barked, turning again and doubling back on himself. It's dark out, fool. They didn't see me throw them. I didn't ask you to throw my gun. I asked you to shut up. Bruno gritted, mounting the pavement as he veered left this time back onto the main road in the opposite direction. Motherfucker! Ah, shit! Guns yelled as he was thrown about. Shit! Through the rear window, Bruno saw the car gaining on them in hot pursuit. Quickly, he shifted into high gear and sped onto a diverging road away to safety. Bruno rounded the corner and raced away. 
The sirens diminished as Bruno and guns roared through the night. Bruno looked puzzled. I think we lost them. The two men glanced at each other and blew out the breath they'd been holding, then focused their eyes back on the road. We can't go back home, not yet, Guns said. Bruno nodded. I'll call one of the guys, see if they can pick her up tonight. Guns agreed. Having arranged a pickup spot, the two men pulled into a watering hole a few miles south and parked out the back. Then they swiftly pulled off their balaclavas. They moved quickly inside and towards their regular table. The bar itself was as dismal as downtown, but it was a place to have a drink where no one knew them. The bar was empty, quiet. The two men often drank in the taverns outside of town, drinking beer and occasionally scotch. Gathered around their table, they raised their glasses to a job well done. They left the vehicle in the parking lot out back with the keys in it. They'd earned $400 to $500 from their parking lot loot tonight. Bruno took out his lighter and lit up a smoke. It was a waiting game, and for the first time, nobody showed to collect the car. Instead, Bruno received a call from the bosses. There wouldn't be any pickup this evening. Apparently, there were too many cops on the street tonight, but they didn't explain why so the brothers would have to keep the vehicle safe until morning. When the two men finished their drinks, they called it a night and left. Back on the road, Bruno headed for their home in central Sicily. He loved Corleone. Warm, picturesque, and peaceful, it had a rich natural beauty, a city unpretentious and homely. A stronghold for the mafia, it was known for its dangerous city residents, but it would always be home to Bruno. The family lived in a mansion, but inside the home, the family was pretty normal. A few minutes into their drive, a police car shot past them like a Formula One racer. Just as fast as Bruno could register what it was, an ambulance followed seconds after. The last stretch of road before they came to their home was pitch dark, but there were flashing lights up ahead. As they neared home, sirens screamed back at them. Both men stared in wide-eyed shock as police units and medics raced to the scene. What are they doing? Guns wondered aloud, lifting his head out the passenger window, trying to see over the crowd. What's going on? Bruno asked. Pulling up on the curb, he killed the engine and rummaged in the glove compartment looking for a flashlight. There was an ambulance and a world of other people out there. People, local residents, were gathered in the street. Shadows were everywhere. The two men rushed out of the car and ran across the street, then through the shrubbery in their front yard with officers, while hearing the click of the media cameras. They emerged at the front door. No, hell no! Bruno roared in a deep, savage voice. He ran closer, shoving men and women aside. Fuck! Guns grunted. Whoever did this, let's go find them. I'm going to find them, he declared. Bruno held his brother back. Oh, they'll get what's coming to them. His breath caught and he silenced himself. Betraying emotion was off the table. That would show weakness and he wouldn't let that happen again. The world never saw Bruno De Luca's anger, but it was there. The horror of the situation was only just dawning on him as he saw his mother. She stood in shock and horror, lights whirling, having a full-out meltdown. When he called her name, her eyes followed his voice and she rushed over to him. Throwing his big arm around his mother's shoulders, he kissed her hairline. It hurt like a son of a bitch to see his mother like this. Bruno tried to ignore it by tightening his arms around her. Why? She muttered into his chest. Bruno listened quietly as his mother told him what had gone down that night. As she spoke, his eyes settled on a gurney carrying a big black body bag being transported into the back of an ambulance, and his heart froze in his chest. An image that would burn itself forever in his memory. A reminder of how quickly things could change.
Chapter 2 Just like that. One week later. Disheveled and unshaven, Bruno and his brother looked up as two plates of breakfast were plonked down in front of them by a young woman on the DeLuca family staff. Guns picked up his fork with just enough of a sigh to show he felt as wistful about things as Bruno. Their father was gone. He'd been taken away in an ambulance that night, but there was nothing more anyone could do for him. But Bruno would never forget the face of the monster who took his father away. A great life was taken from the world by none other than the man old dad called his best friend. The media said it was a suicide, but that was bullshit. Their father was a deeply religious man. A strict Catholic, he'd never have done a thing like that. The murder was so cruel, it shook the whole family. What kind of person would execute his best friend? It was treachery. The work of evil. The worst part? Bruno was powerless to do anything about it. Proof was what he didn't have, told to leave it alone. It angered him more than anything had or possibly would ever again. He vowed never again to trust a man who wasn't his own blood, like his father had trusted his best friend. Bruno glanced at his brother, but guns didn't meet his eyes. He chomped bitterly, uncomfortably, on his scrambled eggs, like it had been made with sand or kitty litter. They ate in silence by themselves. It had been this way since the shooting. Just as Bruno stood to leave, he was stunned to see his mother come through the kitchen door. He was even more shocked to see that she was fully dressed. Martina hadn't shown her face much, hadn't left the house, hadn't worn anything but pajamas since their father died. Bruno stared at her for a moment. The first thing he noticed was that her hair was tied back from her face rather than curled to her shoulders. Very rare. And her face wasn't made up like it usually was, and the dark circles under her eyes showed like a fresh punch to both cheeks. But in her glassy eyes, he saw a the-show-must-go-on strength behind her shimmering tears. It shouldn't have surprised him at all. That was Mom through and through. Bruno looked over at his brother. Pull out a chair for Mom, go, Charlie, he said. Addressing his brother by his street moniker, Guns, was strictly forbidden in the family home. It always seemed rather odd to Bruno. Odd that his father had no qualms about his sons joining the mafia, had no issue with a life that would be their destruction, but to bring their work home with them in any way, home to women and children, innocence, well, that was the true crime in Dad's eyes. When Guns looked up from his toast to meet his mother's eyes, he jumped to his feet and dragged out a chair. Sit down, Mom. Bruno went over to her and looped one arm with hers, then escorted her over to the table. Her body felt bony and moved slow and weak. He suspected she hadn't eaten in the past seven days. When she sat down, Bruno fetched a fresh mug and poured her a black coffee from the pot. The two men watched her intently as she took a sip. When she placed the mug gently down, she looked them both dead in the eyes. Your Uncle Gabriel and Cousin Marco will be paying us a visit this morning. She took another sip of her drink. I gave him my word that we were okay, but he wouldn't take it. Bruno and Charlie glanced at each other, then nodded at their mother. Until now, she hadn't allowed any visitors since the incident. Bruno opened his mouth to ask if this was the only reason their Uncle Gabriel was coming around today. But when the housekeeper came into the room with a steaming plate of breakfast for Martina, he closed it. Martina ate in silence as her two sons had done. When Bruno saw tears streaming down her cheeks as she ate, he wanted to take her hand, but he knew she wouldn't accept it. Neither he nor Charlie said a word, tried to hide their awareness. It simply wasn't the way in their family. 
Twenty or so torturous minutes later, the doorbell sounded. Both men stood up and waited while the housekeeper led Gabriel and Marco from the front door to the dining area. Marco and his father stepped into the room, looking every bit the Italian gangsters they were. Well-dressed, Gabriel wore his suits crisp, his graying hair stylish, slicked back. He had an air of authority and always acted as smooth as he looked. What's up for breakfast? he asked, heading for the chair beside Bruno's mother. A ghost of a smile passed Martina's lips, and she got up to fetch two more coffee cups from the cupboard. The four men gathered around the table and waited for Martina. Bruno gave his cousin a singular nod in greeting and watched as he twisted his gold ring on his pinky finger. Marco, at 22, was a junior version of his genius father, with dark pit bull circles under his eyes and broad shoulders. When Martina sat down, Gabriel smoothly took out a handkerchief from his suit pocket and gave it to her. Getting right down to the point, Gabriel, who waved his hands when he talked, wasted no time in explaining precisely why he was here. He looked Bruno and Charlie dead in the eyes and narrowed his eyes into an iron glare. Bruno glanced at his mother and recognized the look on her face that told him she was hiding something. She knew exactly what was about to go down. First off, I am deeply sorry for the loss you and your mother are suffering. Second, I know that I must do as my brother would have wished. Don't think I'm not aware of the way you two have been earning a living. He shook his head, jacking cars with the nonchalance of opening a can of soda. I tolerated it before, but things are different now. You don't have your father to protect you. That responsibility falls into my hands now, and I'll do what I need to make sure you're safe. Bruno scoffed. With all due respect, uncle, what makes you think I need anyone's protection? Gabriel growled. This ain't the game, my kid. The mob always comes first. That's the rules. If you don't do as they ask, they'll retire you, shoot you in the back of your head, and leave you where you dropped. If you join the mob, you'd better make peace with the fact you're going to die. It's inevitable. You're going to die, or if you're lucky, you're going to jail. Those are the two consistent effects on the streets. Your father was a smart man. That's why he lived to the age of 63. The mob is worth more than that, and you know it. It made Bruno feel he was part of this family where they were all friends, all brothers, and they all helped each other. It also strikes me as odd that you hold such hostile feelings toward the mafia when they're responsible for so much of your income, Bruno said with an inward grin. Gabriel's nostrils flared. Bruno glanced over at Marco, but he sat there expressionless, nodding along with his father's words. Gabriel sat quietly for a moment as the four sipped coffee companionably. Then he reached a hand inside his coat, pulled out a sealed envelope, and said, I want you to take this and put your son through school. Martina looked at the envelope silently, a little surprised, and waited for him to explain. My son? You mean my sons, surely? Gabriel fixed her with a look. Bruno growled grudgingly at his uncle. His chair screeched as he pushed back from the table and left out of the room. Charlie followed. From the other room, they could hear Gabriel's voice through the air vent above their heads. Your sons are utter lunatics, Gabriel said. Now your son, Charlie, he's real special. He's a college material. Bruno rolled his eyes. Scholastically, Charlie always performed much better than he did, but Bruno knew he had no fewer brains. He knew he wasn't stupid. I can't see what college has to do with getting anywhere in life, Bruno muttered. I make more money in one day than most do in three months. How about that for something special? He sneered. Gabriel's voice sounded again. 
I've got the friend of a friend in the admissions office at the college. I'll get him in. Studying will keep him occupied and off the streets. I want your Charlie to make the most of his considerable assets. Martina sighed in defeat. It was no secret she'd always thought her eldest had a calling to be a doctor or a lawyer. And what about my Bruno? What will he do? She pleaded. I need to do what is right, Gabriel replied. But I can't perform miracles, Martina. Do you understand? You're Bruno. He's a brawn guy. It'll be worse if I try and get him in. They'd laugh him out of the interview room. Charlie has the brains, not Bruno. It ain't fair, but life rarely is. All right, Martina said finally. I'll take the money, but I can't promise he'll attend and say nothing to Bruno. It'll hurt him too badly. Bruno bit down hard on his bottom lip. The woman often lied out of love for Bruno. He didn't blame her for that. Terms like dyslexia weren't recognized back then. Not that it would have made any difference. His father would have done anything but admit that the great Michael DeLuca's son had a learning difficulty. As a young kid, Bruno had endured some merciless bullying from other boys. Too proud to ask for help, Bruno told nobody. He didn't know he was dyslexic at the time. It didn't have a name back then. The only thing teachers cared about was if you were very bright or very stupid. Bruno turned to his brother. Do you hear this man? Maybe he's right, Bruno. I'd be a fool to make the same fatal errors as our father. We haven't been accepted into his life yet. It's not too late to get out. Logically... Statistically, the chance that Charlie could avoid meeting the same ugly fate as his father was almost too obscure to contemplate. It was impossible to know who or where or when it would happen again, but one thing was certain. The odds of survival were almost impossible. Tell me you don't mean what you say, brother. Charlie shrugged. Gabriel's right, Bruno. You don't mean that. Take it back, Charlie. Accountancy? Life in an office? That's not who you are. Charlie swore, his anger giving an indication of his fears. I want nothing to do with the mob. I've seen enough and made my decision to get out of it before they got their hands around my jugular as they had around our father. If that life could turn a man against his best friend, then what do we really have here? There's no honor, no respect, no loyalty in that. There's so much betrayal, so much treachery with everybody. That isn't the brotherhood. It's nothing, he sighed. This is how it's gonna be, Bruno. Shaking his head, Bruno left the room. He'd heard enough. Enraged, he went into the garage and sat down on a spare tire, then sank his head in his hands. When his father passed, a man he'd loved and admired... Bruno had waited for tears to fall. They didn't. He'd waited for his heart to ache. It didn't. He'd only felt anger. It also proved true something his father had always told him. The most fatal mistake? Trust. There are some people you trust. People who you go so far back with. I don't care who you think you know. Who you think likes you, loves you, cares about you. You can't trust any of them. Not unless they're your own flesh and the blood. Even then, you can't trust anybody in this life, only yourself. He always told his boys. Growling, he looked up and the lights flickered in his eyes. He took his pistol and shot out the lights. Spotting a can of gasoline, he grabbed it, then poured the liquid all over the floor, then threw a lit match and watched until the car exploded into flames. Ash and heat hit his face, but it was annoying more than painful for Bruno. The real pain was in his heart, he knew inside. He would never again work with his brother. Just like that, everything changed. The fire burned hot and the fire truck showed up ten minutes later. They contained the fire to the garage that sat at the back of the property.
Bruno found he couldn't care about any of it. He had lost his partner for good. From there on out, Guns was dead to the mob world, known only as Charlie DeLuca, the man who walked away. Chapter 3 Life Changes Quick A few weeks later, the morning dawned cloudy and dark like Bruno's mood. Everyone around Bruno was dying. Nobody was safe anymore, not even the bosses. His father, boss of the largest crime family in Italy, had just been murdered. And he was sick of not being able to go out of the house because of who could be waiting for him outside the front door. Bruno had to do something, and quick. He knew at that point he needed to be a man of power, a man people talked about when he walked into a room. Not the fucking walking target. Not a damn pussy nobody feared. The kind of guy nobody dared even look at the wrong way for fear of what might happen. A man like his father should have been. Men like that don't get whacked. Men like that don't have to put up with any of the world's bullshit. At that time, Bruno figured either he stayed and he'd last a few more months, then they would kill him, or he could take off and go. By the time he'd awoken this morning, Charlie and his mother had already left for the accountancy college with Gabriel. So that was it. With a William Henry accountancy book under his arm, Charlie would attend accountancy school alongside their cousin Marco. Charlie told Bruno he preferred kicking ass on the streets, wreaking havoc wherever he pleased, but he felt at ease with the campus atmosphere at home. And he soon found the view from the lofty study rooms in the library was more pleasant than it was down where the air smelled of piss. In truth, that might have been because it was as far away as he could get from the mob without leaving Italy. He'd been straight since leaving the mob. The only thing he had in common with the mafioso was the three-piece suits, crisp white shirts, and his Italian surname. He was anonymous and liked it, only another handsome young man with a ready smile. The mob was nothing to him. His life certainly would be no part of it, and he'd told his brother he felt confident that this great sense of freedom would last forever. Bruno, however, had never expected to be so utterly and completely alone. The house was quiet and empty. His mother could no longer live in the house where they had spent such happy times. I'll leave anywhere but this house, she said. The memories were too painful. It hurt her too much to even see Michael's possessions. In his room, he counted his money and realized that he would have to conserve it. With all the money he'd made over the past five years, he should have had boxes of it. But as quick as he'd made it, he'd given it up. Drink, women, rent, and gifts to his family. All the youngsters did this, not because all of them were stupid. Bruno certainly wasn't, but because they really didn't think they were going to be around that long. You only live once, enjoy it while you still got breath in your lungs, were mantras they lived by. Checking his drawer for any cash he may have missed, his fingers graced the cool surface of his father's mob ring, hiding in the back. Bringing it out between his fingers, he studied his father's gold ring and recollected. Michael had been a difficult man, a cocky son of a bitch with an ego so big he was lucky his head didn't explode. To his credit, he'd never brought his business home with him. And most importantly, he'd treated his woman right. No real man hurts a woman, he'd always said. Outside the house, it was a lot different. There was always a war going on. As a child, Bruno wanted to be a normal kid, but you can't be normal growing up in that life. He had to live the way his father wanted him to live. Anytime Bruno cried as a young child, his father had hit him with a belt. When Bruno was 12, he told his dad he wanted to play baseball after school, and Michael had threatened to throw him out on his ear. He insisted that one day, Bruno would thank him. Yes, Michael DeLuca had been an asshole of a dad, 
a mini Hitler with too many rules. The hours of weapons training were character building, not allowed out of the house to go to school when there was trouble, and not allowed to play sports in school. This was common for mob guys to treat their kids this way, but his father had been especially brutal. Bruno never understood why his pap had been so fucking hard on him. All the doors were double locked and bolts were put on everything. His parents didn't speak much about relatives who would one day disappear from his life, but mom and pap couldn't hide a lot. Bruno always knew the family was different. On the TV and radio, he'd hear of people he knew were his relatives, missing and dying. And his father couldn't hide the truth, that he was a big-time crime boss, a godfather, from Bruno's sharp mind and open eyes for very long. Michael ran his crime family differently than other bosses. He had been a very sophisticated business-like boss. He'd wanted both his two sons to be La Cosa Nostra before they'd even grown up, to succeed his reign in a formidable duo. Well, so long farewell to that idea. Shaking off his thoughts, Bruno stuffed the money back into his drawer and went downstairs. Then, shrugging on his coat, he disappeared out the front door. He went back to the only thing he knew, only thing he was any good at. Crime. Specifically, theft. How did he get into that? Well, the oldies always paid brazen kids who didn't care to steal cars. It was one way the older guys would take kids off the streets and groom them for a life of crime and violence. And for the oldies, those guys would send the cars to chop shops, sell the parts, and make a pretty penny off of that. The bosses took it to the multi-million dollar level. There wasn't much choice about what he was doing. Bruno had felt somewhat the same when his father passed, but he couldn't abandon what his father had started. It was everything that the Luca family was, a bloodline. He did what he had to do to prove himself worthy of that life. His pap had told him he'd have to show the mob he was a stand-up person, a man that would perform, a man that wouldn't back down, a man that wasn't going to cry when troubles arrived at the door. That shit didn't hold any water in the mob. Working the streets alone was tough, real tough. Bruno always hated this kind of work without his brother at his side. He saw all kinds of fucked up shit no man should ever see, made him feel like a real thug. But what was he going to do? This was his rite of passage to who he would become, and nothing about being the son of the boss helped him. Bruno did the same shit as the rest of the youngsters, making his bones, as it was known in street vernacular, but Bruno De Luca didn't plan on stealing cars much longer. When Bruno rolled up to his home at the end of the day, he noticed that Marco's car was parked outside. He went indoors to meet his cousin in the living room. Everything all right? He asked. I was going to ask you the same. How are you holding up? Bruno sighed. I'm fine, but since you're here, there's something you need to know. Your father isn't going to like it, but he's going to have to live with what I decide. And what have you decided? I'm leaving for America, Marco. It'll be much better for me there. I'm going to join Castillo's crew. Marco sighed. Bruno, you choose the wrong friends, and it will cost you. My father's warned me about the guys in America. More cold and ruthless than any of the men you know here. There were reasons people called Castillo a user, a man who took what he wanted and didn't care about the consequences. He got the respect of the lower-level members of the family quickly, but the oldies didn't trust easily, even with the family. Bruno's face went hard. I don't care. I'm going. You're not going anywhere, Charlie's voice sounded from the doorway. Bruno glared at his brother, who came storming into the room. Oh, yes, I am, and you're coming with me. You're crazy, you're mad, Marco accused. Bruno laughed and glanced back at his cousin. I haven't come this far by worrying about what other people think of me. Marco and Charlie glanced at each other, but didn't say a word. 
Shaking his head, Bruno left the room and went down the hall. In the kitchen, Bruno saw his mom sitting there. His shadow fell across her, and she looked up. I've heard about a man that called Castillo in America, he told her. He felt very good about it. Martina pulled his big body into a tight squeeze. I made the you boys take English lessons so you could communicate with foreigners, but I never dreamed it would be where you would end up, in America. But there's something special about you, Bruno De Luca. My intuition knows this. Bruno held her in his muscular grip as he gazed down at her face. She sighed. Just to be careful, son. With that, Bruno turned and disappeared upstairs to collect his luggage bags. With a ticket to America and a couple of hundred dollar bills in his back pocket, he hauled his bags downstairs. At the door, Bruno handed over his gun to Marco. Marco stuck it in his jacket. Bruno turned dramatically and left the house. His taxi hit the road for the airport. Bruno prayed. He knew in his heart he was a good man. His father was and would always be his idol. He could remember, vaguely, his father's most important lesson. You can't trust nobody in this life, even yourself sometimes. If he had a dollar for every time his father said that to him, he'd have a mansion of his own by now, buying Dalmore 62 whiskey by the casefall. Bruno sighed. If only his father had listened to his own advice, he would probably still be alive. He knew it was dangerous, but he figured he'd be running the streets in San Diego early on. He knew about that life by now. He also always knew he'd do whatever it took to survive. That he promised himself. For all the bad that had happened, all the mourning and all the tears his family had shed, Bruno knew something good would come of it. Chapter 4 Only the Good Die Young Coronado, San Diego, 1975 Keeping firm eye contact at the man built like a brick shithouse guarding the door, Bruno De Luca killed the engine. Waiting on some of the others to arrive, he eyed the man up and down. The door bouncer. Disgusted by what he saw, he let out a husky sigh of disapproval. Fucking prick. Seemingly, there wasn't anyone in the world Bruno cared to impress. Dressed in casual jeans and an off-white shirt, a size or two too small stretched over his hulking chest, this buffoon was every part the classic bad boy dickhead. Still stalling, Bruno's eyes roamed the warehouse. Nothing special from the outside, it had dents and rust spots all over. Large and as wide as it was tall, it wasn't a modern fortress, only enormous sheets of welded gray steel and a near-flat roof. The building looked as dispirited as his mood, but it was safe for cons and fugitives. Ultimately, that was all that was important. This was Castillo's hangout, mob territory, the place where he did all his business. As usual, there were several goons standing guard. With this jackass at the main door, two outside the front gates, and another two patrolling the perimeter with walkie-talkies linked up to the guys watching the 24-hour surveillance cameras. Security was very important since there were only a few of them in the mob family. Twelve men was all they were. So formidable was their reputation, the world thought they were an army. Nobody, not even the FBI, knew there were only a dozen of them. It was a perfect, dead quiet Sunday morning. Sunlight cut through the windscreen. Slipping a pair of black shades over his dark eyes, DeLuca studied his tanned, bestial face in the central rearview mirror. He was handsome, and the highway of adversity ahead would see him become even more handsome. Clean-shaven, chiseled features honed to a fine edge. Eyes black as coal, with the magnetic spark of twin diamonds. Always precise and impeccably dressed, he combed his severe black hair straight back and checked himself up and down. 
He reached with two fingers to center his tie, and as he did so, his fingers graced the cool metal of the silver cross he wore around his neck. A small, gentle touch against his two hundred pounds of pure feral power, his mother's trinket, and she'd made him promise he'd wear it for good luck. He was religious, but not superstitious. Bruno didn't need lucky trinkets for shit, but it was a vow he'd keep for someone he loved. Sideways glancing at the brute at the door, he closed a loose fist around the cross for a moment and contemplated the potential causes for today's meeting, then tossed it back under his shirt. As tense as always, there was the not-so-slim chance somebody had fucked up and that somebody was in deep shit with the boss. And in this world, deep shit usually came hand in hand with a bullet between the eyes faster than you could say the words, death sentence. In the early hours of the morning, Bruno had received a call while he'd been sleeping in bed. Prying his eyes open, he grasped his phone from the bedside cabinet. The call had been from Vincent Castillo himself, the undisputed mafia boss of San Diego. The boss told him he was calling a special meeting with the crime family at 10 a.m. sharp, which meant he better be there by half nine or shit would go down. He couldn't complain. At least there was never a dull moment in this life. But judging by the anger in no-nonsense Castillo's voice, the only thing Bruno was sure of was that it definitely wouldn't be a pleasant meeting. DeLuca didn't know it yet. But today was the day when everything would flip upside down. As usual, today's meeting would be held outside of San Diego, at this warehouse beside the docks in a tiny town of only 11,000 people named Coronado. Coronado, San Diego was hardly a high crime area. People left their keys in their trucks and didn't lock doors. All the work Castillo and his guys carried out was the organized kind. He didn't give a rat's ass about petty theft. A straight-up big-money kind of guy. Surprisingly, it was the mob who kept them safe. Not intentionally. It just so happened even criminals shook at the knees at the thought of Castillo and his gang of dark and deadly men. So, it was smarter for them to give Coronado a wide berth. The residents of Coronado didn't want to believe that, but it was the truth. If Castillo and his crew didn't put the fear into criminals like they did, they'd be really fucked. Bruno opened his car door. As if on cue, two men in chalky gray sedans nosed up to the pavement alongside him. Glancing out of each side window, DeLuca nodded at the two men behind the wheels. To his left, Frank Amicino king of the snooker table. To his right, Blade. Just Blade. Nobody ever knew his real name, and no one even dared ask. A miserable fucking bastard with two red eyes and dark receding hair. Sliding out of the driver's side of his vehicle, he shut the door, stepped onto the pavement, and made his way toward the entrance. When he heard two car doors open, he stopped and looked over his shoulder at his crime brothers as they got out of their vehicles, both tense, humorless men dressed in suits and ties. Both of them marched his way. Both looked dead-ass serious. Striding over to him, the slapping of their patent leather shoes reverberated from the pavement. Bruno turned, struck out his palm, and shook hands with the guys. Frank, a short man with a precisely trimmed mustache and a blue bandana that lived around his forehead, spoke first. Any idea what's about to go down? He muttered in a heavily accented tongue, his I'm certain it's going to be a bloodbath voice turned up to the max. Bruno shook his head. Nope, Castillo's royally pissed. I know that much. Blade snickered. Hell... Murderous is more like it. Shit, this doesn't sit right with me, Bruno grumbled. If there was anything that got on Bruno's last nerve, it was secrets. Things he didn't know, but felt he should. Frank huffed. Every fucking day there's something else. Same shit, different day. I don't know. Castillo sounded more pissed than I've ever heard him before, Bruno commented. 
And you know what he's like. That man can't see past his damn emotions when something gets him all bent up. Blade checked the time on his phone. We gonna go inside or what? Bruno nodded. He gestured towards the door and followed his brothers towards the entrance. The goon doorman, muscle bound and strapped with a shoulder weapon, slid the deadbolt aside and bashed a signal with his knuckles to the other side. Receiving his cue, his associate, with both enormous hands, turned each of the three locking handles on the steel door, the only way in and out of the Castillo crime family's building. The goon on the outside, who had maybe a hundred pounds on Bruno, nodded into Luca's direction with a stare that held all kinds of menace. As if he might rip his cock and balls off if Bruno even looked at him in a way he didn't like. Slapping his palm against the metal door, the big brute seethed in Bruno's direction. Does he have a death wish? Sighing, DeLuca stared straight ahead and fisted his fingers as he passed the ugly bastard to keep from blowing up. As if Bruno would even be the slightest bit cautious around this caveman asshole. No, bitch. A smirk tore through his stern expression, amused by this guy's moxie. The three men entered the room and saw the guys gathered inside the building. Some were dressed in heavy fleece workmen's jackets, some in suits, black, navy blue, and gray as usual. Snarling, the heavy ape slammed the door shut behind them. Yep, fuck you too, bitch. The common room was very noisy this morning. Everyone had been speculating what was happening. As always, Bruno stood for a moment to take in the atmosphere of the place. The large room appeared to be spotless, dustless, and in perfect order. The scent of cigars and whiskey permeated the air in the room. Trendy retro lights hung from the towering ceilings and the enormous meeting table just ahead of him. The bar ran along the wall to his right, where the girls loved to serve them drinks. Yet, the best part of this place was what you couldn't see. The spiraling, rickety staircase at the end of the room leading to the basement, the gym, and boxing ring. In truth, it was more like a dungeon than a gym. Three boxing stands and a pro-sized sparring ring. The place smelled of sweat and aerosol sprays. A vending machine stood against one wall and a water machine at the corner. Three screened overhead lights provided the only illumination, but Bruno loved it. He was as light as air on his feet, and they held fights there every weekend to take the edge off. When Bruno's crazy flag was flying, there was nothing like going savage and punching the hell out of someone like a pit bull cut up on crack to find his come down. It took all of five seconds for his best friend Antonio, Tony, to appear out of the shadows and come marching over. Bruno, how you doing? His voice sounded gruff, making him sound scarier than he really was. Tony was a burly man with a long-ass beard that women found ruggedly handsome, whatever the fuck that was about, and a scar right down one side of his face. A sly little son of a bitch, immoral as hell, but a real stand-up guy to his family. Bruno had met Antonio in his first week here. An almost instant rapport made them friends. With a nose that had seen too many bone-cracking fist fights, he was a scary-looking motherfucker, but he was a talker, not a fighter. Not unless you pushed his damn wrong buttons. What? You missed me, you goddamn pussy? Bruno laughed, slapping his friend hard over the side of the head. Why Bruno loved this man like a blood brother was beyond him. Perhaps because they'd faced so many life and death situations together. Perhaps it was the isolation after losing his father and effectively his brother too. In any case, he'd sworn to keep the world at an arm's length when his father's best friend betrayed him so absolutely. But as it turned out, they made a good team. Working side by side, the two men had hit it off early on to eventually become best friends. It might sound foolish, especially with all the backstabbing assholes he'd come across in the mob. Then again, Bruno was an excellent judge of character, rarely wrong. 
His judgment had gotten him this far. He wasn't dead yet. Grinning like a bitch-ass Cheshire cat, Antonio jogged across to one of the tables and pulled together a few chairs around it. At that moment, Marco came out of the john and Antonio collided a chair with the other man's knees. Fuck, he roared. Shit, sorry, brother. Antonio smiled and stepped back. Coulda fooled me, shithead. Now move out of my fucking way, Marco demanded. Needless to say, he didn't like Antonio, didn't see his good side. Marco had only been in America a little over three months. He hadn't wanted to leave Italy, but when Bruno heard about a prestigious internship at a local firm for Charlie, he and Marco left Italy behind them, seeking the great experience and prospects it offered. Yeah, Marco was still out of sorts as he missed Italy like crazy. And he'd never liked Antonio, and that was fair enough. After all, Tony was a smooth-talking con man with a perpetual smile as phony as his promises. He was also a dark horse candidate for mob boss when Castillo retired in a few years. Bruno thought so anyway. He couldn't see Castillo's little fairy princess of a son going for the job. Like it or not, Tony was the man for the job, and the only man on this earth Bruno would step aside for. And you don't become the boss by being liked. For the most part, though, Castillo's motley crew got along without too much bloodshed. After all, they were in this together, weren't they? Bruno lifted his chin at his cousin and then turned his attention back to where the guys were standing. Searching the room, his gaze found the boss, an ice-cold, vicious man who kept his face out of the limelight, his eyes perpetually shielded by black shades. A killer's eyes lived behind those shades. Bruno didn't have to second-guess that the Briani suit he was wearing cost more than three months' rent for Bruno. Castillo was a real old-school gangster. The classic image from the movies, smoking cigars in a black overcoat, hat to match, and his shirt buttoned up to the top. He looked like a boss, acted like a boss. In his early sixties by this time, but you'd never know it. Not unless he was making a plea to the judge and jury as a man too old and sickly to be guilty of any crime. Yeah, he'd done that too, or three, or fifteen times before. His expression was always the same. Stern, formal, suspicious. Today, it was different. Angrier, malevolent. In one look, in one glance, Bruno knew Castillo wanted blood. A ball of dread unfurled in his gut, making him glad he wore a gun in his belt. It was against mob rules to bring a weapon to meetings. Fuck it, the motherfucking rules can suck a dick today. He was nobody's fool. Joining Antonio at the table, he dropped onto a wooden chair, keeping Castillo in his periphery. Castillo was one of the only men on this earth Bruno was afraid to cross. He didn't earn the moniker, the Cutter, for nothing. Over a hundred kills to his name, he wasn't the sort you'd turn your back on. He was utterly ruthless, and everyone knew he'd have you killed in a heartbeat if you gave him reasonable cause. Bruno realized something else as well. Castillo looked agitated, like his inner self was going batshit crazy. He looked more crazed than he'd ever seen him. Restless and upset, Castillo talked to his underboss, Francesco, in a quiet fury. The slam of his hand on their table confirmed Bruno's assessment. Clearing his throat, his underboss motioned for everybody to be quiet. Come over here. What do you think we called you guys here for? A goddamn slumber party? Francesco sneered. Dead silence fell over the room. One by one, everyone hustled up to the meeting table and took their seats, acknowledging each other with poker faces and distrustful eyes. Everybody but Castillo's son in the crew was present. That boy could get away with murder. Bruno, Frank, Blade, Albert, John, Carlo, Francesco, Joe, Billy Bones, Antonio, Marco, and King Kong of this shit, Castillo himself. 
Twelve men assembled from all over San Diego. Twelve men, as deadly as they were criminal. Over the past six months, these men had become like Bruno's family. Fearless motherfuckers who trusted nobody, and very few of their own did they really trust. Bruno had taken a criminal oath to work under this man and with these people. His underboss, Francesco, was only 27. Half a dozen newspapers littered the table, as did three copies of the Coronado Times, which lay face down in front of Castillo, who stood at the head of the table. Castillo coughed, and everyone snapped their heads in his direction. Hanging his head, his eyes stayed on the ground for a while, like he was thinking about how to say what needed to be said. Clearly troubled, he raised a palm to his head to hold it over his eyes and half his head as he rubbed his temples. When his head came up and his hand dropped, he sighed furiously. <sighs> Death took my son last night, Castillo announced in his usual cut-the-bullshit-get-to-the-point style. For a moment, silence reigned in the room, not even interrupted by a single cough or the wheezing of the two leather lungs, Billy and Tom. Everyone held their breath. A knot formed in Bruno's throat, and he swallowed hard, trying to dislodge it. They knew who the killer was, right? For Castillo's sake and sanity, Bruno hoped so. Castillo plopped into his chair, a man broken. Who knew so much love could be wrapped up in a man so dark and heartless? Do we know who's responsible? Bruno asked. Francesco shook his head. They're not mafia. We suspect that much. He went on to explain that his body had been found on Castillo's gravel drive. It's already in this morning's papers. Castillo slid the three morning papers across the desk. One to Bruno, one to Marco, one to Joe. Struck with disbelief, Joe tactlessly blurted, Fucking hell! He shut his eyes, pressing his palms up over his face and the top of his bald head. He lifted the paper in the air, letting all the boys see. Everyone was riveted to the bold black lettering of the morning headline, Mob Boss's Son Murdered. At Francesco's nod, Bruno read the story aloud. It explained Bobby Castillo was killed in a shoot and run between 10 and 11 p.m. last night. He was taking out the garbage at his home when someone pulled up in a Camry and shot him. There was a witness who said it was silver with a bashed up rear bumper, but that was all they knew. His bullet riddled body was found by the side of the road. When Bruno was done reading, he tossed the newspaper to the side and shook his head at every fucking word. The utter lack of respect for the deceased and his family irked him to the core. The boss has been in Tijuana after a stir with some good-for-nothing Mexicans, Francesco added. Didn't get back till 11 or 12.30. Then, on his drive home, he passed his son's house and decided to stop. That's when he found him. And he wasn't the first one. Cops were everywhere. Bruno almost drew his gun and marched right out of there to find the man, then decided against it. Castillo would get the man with his own bullet. Bruno was sure of it. It shouldn't take long. Slowly, Castillo rose to his feet again. Bobby, he was a winner, Castillo declared. Would have been the youngest mob boss the world's ever known. A man more powerful than anybody ever knew. He bellowed louder and louder with force. Like he was as determined to convince himself of this as well as his men, body shaking as he spoke. Everybody nodded, although nobody meant it. It was a sad truth, but Castillo's boy had a chicken shit's life of jello, a heart of marshmallow, and balls of cotton candy. Inwardly, Bruno scoffed, more like a goddamn labradoodle than a scorpion, like his father. Soft, shaggy, cute, and cuddly. Under average build, he'd weighed maybe 140 pounds. He had soft, ascetic features, and his skin was pale and splattered with freckles. More pretty than a man should be. 
with a mop of lemon blonde hair on his head. His voice a high alto, he spoke as effeminate as he acted. His almond eyes as soft as a baby deer's. Innocent, almost childish. You get the picture. Bruno would keep his mouth shut. He'd rally round Castillo and tell him what he wanted to hear like everybody else. But deep down, something about his son's death made no sense to him. What the hell could they want with Bobby? DeLuca was sure he'd never know. He knew one thing for sure. Bobby was too much of a nice guy for anyone to want to hurt him. And yet, he'd become the youngest member ever to be shot down. Reassuringly, Francesco patted the boss's shoulder, then took him by the elbow and sat him back down. Bruno watched his brother's faces. Castillo's uneasiness was making everyone edgy. Bruno stiffened with anger. He was desperate to say something, but knew he couldn't. They couldn't let their emotions win, but that's what they were doing, following the boss's lead. It was fucking sad. Castillo wouldn't get his son back. It wasn't fair. His death didn't even make much sense. But that's the way it was. If they moped over the loss, got too angry or too emotional, everything they'd worked too fucking hard for would turn to dust. Emotions were like quitting in this game, and winners never quit. Only time would tell who he would choose to exact his revenge on his son's killers. Even the cops would kill for Castillo. Give them $20,000 in a brown paper bag, and they'd take care of it by the end of the week. Bruno glanced at Francesco. He looked down at a black toolbox that he set on the bar and stood up. Fellas, before you leave, Joe and I hijacked a truck last night and we got hold of a shitload of guns. Everybody here gets two to keep. Everyone fell silent as Joe paced slowly around the table, holding each gun to his face and checking to make sure they were unloaded with the safety on before placing them down in front of the guys. Dispirited thank yous came from each man. Soon after, everybody was dismissed. Bruno went to the john, and when he walked out, he expected to be alone. He spotted the boss at the bar. You want some company? he asked, making his way straight toward the broken man in the $3,000 suit. Why the hell not? he replied deadpan, shrugging. Hunched over the bar, half-cocked elbows perched on the lip, Castillo refused to spare a glance Bruno's way. A silence stretched between them until Bruno finally found a few words to ask the man how he was holding up. Castillo met his eyes, and Bruno was shocked to see his tears welling up. Bruno stiffened. What the fuck? Wrapping his arms around Bruno, Castillo held him tight and began to cry. Minutes passed as they hugged in silence, the boss holding him like he never wanted to let go. As the boss held him, he became less and less comfortable. He idolized this man. He identified with him, respected him, a man who was now clinging to him like a baby in times of trouble. Bruno had never felt so relieved that these walls around them hid them from the rest of the world. I'm hollow inside. Castillo whispered. I'll hunt the bastard down and kill him. I'll exact your revenge in the ugliest way possible. Make him suffer right to the end, Bruno vowed softly. Hate was the only emotion that made any sense to Bruno, and it appeared to calm the boss. Breaking his hold, Castillo stared at Bruno again, his face so twisted with emotion that Bruno couldn't tell who he was. Taking another shot of whiskey, the boss waited for his heartbeat to calm. He stood still, glaring at him. DeLuca, if I told you to shoot Antonio, would you shoot him? He asked, with the nonchalance of opening a can of soda. Bruno hesitated and then nodded. Yeah, I would, he replied, sending the boss a blank stare as if he were completely unfazed. Quietly thanking heaven and hell that his olive Italian skin never betrayed the red cheeks of a man whose blood was boiling with rage. Castillo narrowed his eyes. It was the look he got when he was reading somebody, feeling them out. 
Cupping Bruno's chin, he tilted it so that he met his eyes and his voice lowered. You sure about that? Yep, no big deal. Bruno gave him a singular nod. He sounded sincere, looked sincere, yet he was lying through his teeth. It was his duty to do as the boss asked, no matter what. If you didn't, he'd make you regret it. There was no other choice but to lie. Even though he was sure Castillo knew damn well his answer was straight up BS. Good, he said as he grinned darkly, patting him on the shoulder and then turning his attention back to his drink. He found a lot of sadistic shit like this funny. This was one of the things about Castillo that royally pissed Bruno off. You take another gun or two if you want to. The rest we're going to unload up in Harlem, where we got no enemies. Bruno nodded. Thanks, boss. Shifting in his seat, he glanced around the room and found himself staring at the empty leather armchair where Bobby had always sat. Then to the empty place at the coffee table where his best friend always sat, a man he loved like his own brother. Fuck that, and fuck him for suggesting such a thing. He'd rather take a bullet or a baseball bat than kill the man who was like his own flesh and blood. There was a long silence between them, and then Bruno finally asked reluctantly, Was that an order? Castillo looked up from his drink, his eyes cold and assessing. No, it wasn't. He didn't explain any further. Bruno heard the other man's phone start buzzing. So without another word, Castillo turned toward the door and left. Bruno kept his eyes on Castillo as he walked outside and curled his lips cruelly over his teeth. What the fuck was all that about? Shaking his head, he took a swig of whiskey to wash away his thoughts and resolved to forgive the twisted fucking hypothetical question the boss had just posed, seeing as his only son's ship had just departed for the gates of hell. Unable to control himself, he cupped his whiskey glass firmly in his hand and fired it behind the bar in a baseball-style pitch. Closing his eyes, he savored the sound of it smashing into tiny pieces, then stormed the hell out of the place. Chapter 5 Heads Up When Bruno pulled up outside the mob's private social club the following morning, he sensed something wasn't right. Castillo had put everything on hold for a few days while he sorted out the funeral arrangements for his boy, which was just as well. What Bruno really needed was a drink. A strong fucking drink. He'd come here every night for the last six months, but never in the daytime, and he'd called his brother, Charlie, in to meet him. Bruno counted himself lucky he could do that. Strolling into the bar and over to his booth, Bruno took a seat on the plush seat and nodded to the waitress to bring him over his usual. You let me know if there's anything else you need the woman said, voice low with a husky edge that set his dick into a fury. Bruno nodded, expression stern. She smiled and then sauntered away. He hadn't seen this girl before, but he knew her type. Tits up to her chin, skirt up to her hips, and hair in every shade of platinum. It was the species prototype for the girls who worked in Castillo's bars. Most of them made themselves available to any member of the crime family, and Bruno never understood that. All of them sassy little spitfires, eager to be used. They didn't want a relationship any more than the boys did. They would just walk in and expect Bruno to have sex with them. Hell no. He couldn't help but wonder how low a person had to sink to aspire to that. Then again... Who was he to talk? Bruno liked his women like his Annie, who even now waited at their home for him. While Bruno was brash, confident, his woman was quiet, almost shy, sweet, easygoing, and low maintenance. His Annie was off limits, and no one in the crime family or outside of it hit on her. Hell, they wanted to, but they wouldn't fucking dare. Charlie, however, well, 
Bruno had no idea how many of the mob's women he'd had between the sheets in the back of his car in the drink cellar. There was no stopping his brother when he wanted something. Chicks with watermelon tits were no exception. Needless to say, Castillo's guys didn't like that much. And Bruno had warned them. Anything happens to Charlie and they're all dead. It was strange. Charlie was one of the nicest guys Bruno had ever met, yet he was the worst with women. The fucker. Bruno finished his cigarette and ground it out into an ashtray when the door opened and his brother crossed the threshold. Charlie hated the mob clubs, but it was early, so he knew the place wouldn't be busy. Opening the door, he paused slightly in the doorway, his eyes perhaps adjusting to the change in light. His suit was high quality, and his shoes gleamed as he marched towards his brother. The jukebox was playing softly against the quiet chatter of the girls who worked there. The place was dingy, and oh, so very ordinary. The single redeeming feature? It was empty. Except for Roberto at the bar at the back of the room, a local, who had long drowned out the death of his wife in beer, was having his first for the day. Bruno motioned for Charlie to come over. By the time he reached the table, Bruno already had a whiskey waiting for him. Although the two men might have taken different paths, there was a profound respect between them. They both wanted the same things. Money, power, notoriety. Neither of them was known to ever take a day off sick or leave work early for anything. Not when there was work to be done. Swinging into the seat opposite, Charlie checked his watch. I don't have long. You know what my schedule is like on a weekday. Bruno raised his glass to the man in front of him and waited for Charlie to do the same before he thanked his brother for coming. Charlie threw back half the glassful in one hit and held his eyes closed for a second as he swallowed the strong liquor. Wincing slightly, his eyes pinged open. Now tell me why I'm really here, Bruno. It wouldn't have something to do with what happened to Bobby, would it? A tense sigh slipped out of Bruno's mouth. Listen, things are getting crazy. Real fucking crazy. He dropped his voice to a confidential whisper. The boss, he fucking broke down in my arms yesterday. Shaking his head, he brought his glass to his lips and tipped the entire contents down his throat like it was water. He nodded at the waitress again to order a second round. It's understandable under the circumstances, Charlie shrugged. He opened his mouth to speak again. Before he could, Bruno interrupted. Not in our world, it's not. Life fucking sucks. Shit happens. The worst thing a man can do? Show the world his weakness. Polishing off the rest of his drink, Charlie leaned closer. It doesn't make sense to me, the whole business of the boy's murder. Even if I were Castillo's enemy, there's a hell of a lot of people I'd like to blow the brains out of before I'd be gunning for that cuddly little fawn. God rest his soul. Bruno nodded. You know who killed him yet? Bruno huffed. I don't. What I do know is, the man who shot him knew it was the only way he could get to Castillo. And it worked. The man's weak. Emotional. Vulnerable. Whoever did it now has the upper hand. Charlie's head fell and rose again in a slow, thoughtful nod. You could be right about that. So back to my original question. Why am I here? You need to get out? Bruno's eyes narrowed on his brother as he leaned forward across the table. Charlie had been plotting ways for his brother to escape the mob since he'd sold his life and soul to that life nearly five months back. Hell bent on ridding the DeLuca family from the mob once and for all. It didn't sit well with his brother, lounging in his pretty accountancy office 500 feet in the sky while Bruno took chances on his life every day on the streets. Fuck no, are you kidding? He argued, his voice simmering with pent-up frustration. Charlie raised both hands and sat back. All right, all right, I'd be a fool not to try, wouldn't I? 
Both men locked eyes, Bruno's fierce and stubborn gaze on Charlie's frustrated stare. The gentle patter of high heels approached steadily from the bar, and the two men looked up. In his periphery, Bruno saw Charlie smile and puff out his chest when his eyes hit the dolly-faced waitress approaching their table. Balancing a black tray on the palm of her hand, which carried their two drinks, she then set it down. Here you go, fellas, she sang. Bruno reached out a hand to receive his drink when suddenly the girl dropped the tray, and before anyone could react, there was the high-pitched chink of smashing glass on the floor. Then suddenly, the young woman stood there with shock on her face, unmoving, as if frozen in time. She paled as she stared at Charlie. She backed away, keeping her eyes on him. Swiftly, she turned on her heels and bolted for the back door behind the bar. A shiver of revulsion ran down Bruno's spine. Turning his head to his brother, he asked, I take it you know this girl? Charlie covered his mouth with one hand, rubbing a palm over his clean-shaven chin. When Charlie offered no answer, Bruno leaned in close. I don't know what you've done to hurt this woman, you filthy pig, he sneered. He loved his brother, but he had a zero-tolerance policy on the mistreatment of women. Shit, Bruno, take a fucking chill pill. I'll calm the hell down when you answer my fucking question, Charlie protested. I didn't do anything to her, I fucking swear. Grabbing hold of Charlie's tie like a noose, he yanked his upper body so close that the two men were eye to eye, nose to nose. To hell with what you think you did or did not do. I know hurt in a person's eyes when I see it, and it's clear from what's just happened that it was you that caused it. Charlie nodded. Bruno released his grip, and Charlie coughed, rising to his feet. That girl? He whispered forcefully, that girl came on to me. I brushed her off, thought she looked too young, too vulnerable, but she persisted. Then she takes me back to her place and we're having a great time. I was all ready to go and she tells me to stop. I tried to calm her down, but she wouldn't, told me not to touch her. You want to know what I did? Bruno scowled, disbelieving. Charlie kept on. I put my clothes back on and I left. That's what I did. Fixing his tie, he shook his head. You think it's Castillo who's losing it? Why don't you take a look in the fucking mirror? I'm your goddamn brother, Bruno. Not a street thug like you and your little friends working for the devil. Not giving his brother any time to apologize, he felt in his pocket for his money, tossed a note onto the table, and marched right out the door. Fuck, another stupid fucking mistake. Bruno dropped his gaze to the $20 bill in front of him, feeling downright awful. Knowing he'd fucked up, he took a deep breath and blew out a loud sigh. What kind of man didn't trust his own brother? Plus, Charlie had been in his corner, stood by him since the day he was born. Guilt rode him hard. Maybe this time the lesson would stick. What can I say? We all have flaws, God knows. Charlie fucking did too. In spite of the evil that Bruno was, he always told himself he wouldn't do what the other mob guys did to women. Some days, he and his brother were like two pit bulls ready to tear each other's heads off, but real fights were rare. Both brothers had gained recognition in their fields, except Charlie was sought after in the straight-laced world of numbers, while Bruno was sought after by the underbelly of society. With this thought, sunlight shot into the room for a moment, and then the door slammed closed again. Bruno's gaze flicked up, and he saw Castillo scanning the room in a cold and calculating manner all his own. Holy fucking shit, not today. Abruptly, Bruno shuffled to the left and leaned against the corner between the two walls, concealing himself in the darkness. Bruno watched as the man made his way deeper into the bar, and he felt it the very moment that set of dark eyes fixed on him. Bruno! 
Castillo bellowed menacingly. Approaching him, his heavy stomp reverberated, shaking the walls. Standing up, Bruno straightened his shoulders and walked boldly toward him. Boss? The two men stopped in the middle of the room. Bruno was certain Castillo's dark shades masked a whole bitch-ass blubbering sea of emotion, but his voice sounded all business. Bruno, I want you to take a ride with me. An order, not a suggestion. Bruno looked over Castillo's shoulder to the clock and inwardly grumbled. It was eleven. Can't a guy get a half a day off sometime? Guess he had too high of hopes. Deep down, it felt good to be needed, and he always got involved and would never let the family down. Bruno took a step forward. Castillo turned, and placing a hand over the other man's shoulder, he led him out the door. At times like this, Bruno remained acutely aware that he could be walking to his doom. Heading out onto the street, the two men moved in silence to an old van Castillo had parked on an empty side alley somewhere in the neighborhood. A commercial van of some kind. No windows, just double doors at the back. I'll drive, Castillo gestured with his hand for Bruno to hop in the other side. Jumping into the van, the two men slid into their seats and headed away from the neighborhood. As they cruised along the highway, the air around them grew thicker. Bruno wound down his window, letting in a cool stream of air. Not sure whether the old man was embarrassed by what happened last night, Bruno swung his gaze over to him. We'll get past this shit, boss. We'll be greater and stronger than we've ever been in your son's honor. Castillo huffed. Yesterday, I shouldn't have let that happen. Being the tough guy, his words were as close to Bruno was going to get for a plea for Bruno not to tell anyone about it. I understand, boss. Casillo went silent for a while. Bruno sensed the boss had precisely the same idea he'd had this morning. Go into the social club while no one was around and get himself stupid drunk without consequences. Changing the subject, Bruno asked where they were going. A smile immediately shattered the boss's robotic, deadpan expression. Removing his hand from the gear stick, he knocked twice on the metal panel behind them, which separated the front from the back of the van on the inside. We need to take this body out of town, he said, matter-of-factly. Like it was no big deal. The norm. Which it was. Bruno didn't have to ask to know it was the body of Bobby's killer. He'd be willing to bet it was. When Castillo had a score to settle, he didn't wait around. However, Bruno honestly thought it would have taken the boss a little longer considering that just yesterday morning, they didn't have a clue who did it. And his son meant too much to him not to kill the filthy cocksucking murderer himself. He needed to see the man fall by his own bullet. We're going to have to spread him around a bit, Castillo added. That meant he'd had a couple of guys chop him up, so there would be no evidence. He drove out past the lake across the border, pulling up on the curb. Castillo cut the lights on his vehicle. They'd waited until nightfall to dispose of the body. The motherfucker was fish food now. Emotionally drained, Bruno closed his eyes. How long have you worked for me, DeLuca? Five months, give or take. I started out as a croupier moving from table to table until eventually I started working for you directly. The day I got the job, I lost my only hundred bucks on my first visit to a casino. Bruno could see a serious chat was coming. We've got big trouble coming. Everyone's tense. I lost my son this week. He was going to be great. Movie producers would have made a film about his life. I want you to be one of my inner circle people. I think you could make it as my underboss. Coming on the heels of my son's murder, I could be gone any day, too. All of a sudden, one day, it could be boom. When I'm gone, I'll be just another headline. But for you, it would be a whole other story. If I die, you and the boys have got to keep this thing going. Bruno said nothing. What was there to say? As night fell... 
They had sat silently since Castillo's declaration. Then they finally exited the van. The lake gurgled and trembled, heedless to the two men on the bank. The boss stood where water and land met, eyes filled with confused and angry emotions. Control had been lost from Vincent Castillo's life. His life had shifted in a way that could not be restrained, like the unsettled water beneath him. Would this man ever be the same again? Bruno lifted body parts from the van and tossed them into the lake. Then they drove to another site to repeat the process. Castillo muttered to himself, Enough of this dwelling shit. He's gone now. It's time to move on. The head, which was concealed in a hessian bag, went to the rats in the gutter, next to the shit-smelling sewers and trash where it belonged. There's no damn reason to beat yourself up over this, Bruno insisted. You were as great a father as you are a boss. Life just dealt your boy an ugly hand. Castillo didn't wait for permission when he grabbed him by the shoulders and fixed him with a stare. A stare so cold and menacing, Bruno felt it in his stomach. Nobody hears about this, capiche? Bruno nodded. Capiche. The old man never told Bruno who the man was or how he was found. All he knew was the man was a stranger to them, and Bobby hadn't known him until the ill-fated moment they met. Did Bruno ask any questions? No, of course not. It was better that way. Castillo dropped Bruno off at the bar that night. The two men said their goodbyes and went home. Bruno had never seen this man afraid, but he saw it in his eyes that night. Castillo was taking stock of his life, past, present, and future. And he feared for his life, fearing that this could be the beginning of the end for the family. Chapter 6 Home Sweet Home The alleyway that led to Bruno's home smelled of piss and the general misery of harsh city life. Holding his breath, he came up to a line of 19th century terraces which dominated the street. Run down and dingy, each looked nearly indistinguishable from the next, packed in like sardines. He stopped dead in front of a house with no car out front, and all the lights turned out. Home fucking home. Proceeding through the front gate, he gave the place a cursory glance, feeling nothing but disgust. Was he supposed to be fucking thankful for this BS? It was hard to see it at the time, but this motherfucking neighborhood reminded him each and every day of why he worked so hard. It made him work harder. It was this shitty-ass apartment that kept him driven. To keep out of it, he needed to rise in wealth and position. Bruno stood at the front door, sliding his key into the lock, when a rivulet of water splashed onto the top of his head. He groaned, muttering a string of curses. Fucking twisted blessing in disguise. Four times the tiny porch roof above him had collapsed. Four times he'd patched up the goddamn death trap. Twisting his key in the lock, the door creaked open. He stepped inside, wiping his hulking black shoes on the mat. The house was quiet and as dark inside as it looked from the street. Tracing his calloused fingers over the wallpaper, his forefinger found the light switch. It clicked on, activating a dim and disappointing, flickering performance from the little shit of a light bulb which hung from the ceiling. Grumbling, he immediately turned around and locked up with his key from the inside. Then, as usual, he busted closed the two rusty deadbolts which clung top and bottom to the door. This was important. Particularly from dusk onwards, the neighborhood was especially dangerous. The risk of a robbery was so great, even the windows were double-locked and blocked out with newspaper. Like it was in competition with the menace that existed outside, the interior of the house had spawned a real fucking danger zone of its own kind. Not expecting his woman to be awake at this hour, 
Bruno tiptoed his heavy body down the hall to the living room. With each assaulting step, the floorboards complained with pathetic squeaks. Meanwhile, he dodged bowls and Tupperware like they were landmines, containers Annie had peppered all around to catch the water from the leaky roof. The place had the nearly intolerable smell of mold and mildew. The electricity could and would cut out any time there was a severe wind or rain, which wasn't too often, but often enough. Shit, if hell were a precursor to greatness, he was in the right fucking place. With tired eyes and a sore body, Bruno nudged open the living room door, clicked on another cheap dim light, and headed directly over to his favorite spot in the entire godforsaken dump. Dropping into his torn leather armchair opposite the television, he kicked off his shoes and rubbed his aching feet vigorously for a minute or so. Straightening, he closed his eyes for a moment and tilted his head back. As the back of the chair tilted to accommodate his weight, the tension in his muscles started to disperse, his pain throbbing into the leather fibers. Body still aching like an old man, Bruno snapped open his eyes and reached for the cabinet drawer beside him. Fingers fumbling inside for several heartbeats, he found what he was looking for. He withdrew his hand with pinched fingers and tapped a few painkillers into his hand. Gulping them down his dry throat, he waited for the pain to subside, then leaned his head back again. Sitting alone, he stared out into the cage-like walls. As the drowsy, transient effect of the drugs took effect, it gradually dawned on him that he'd become nothing he'd thought he'd be. If he were to somehow bring his father back to life, he would see that everything he'd invested in Bruno had been a tired waste of time. Everything his father had thought he would be had seemingly fallen apart. Bruno was a thug, a street-level criminal. Not only was he the underbelly of society, but he was also near the bottom of the barrel as far as the mob was concerned. Sure, he'd only been working for Castillo for nearly six months, but shit, he hadn't gone anywhere in that time. At least, it didn't fucking feel like it. It wasn't often that doubt crept in on him, but when it did, it hit him like an AK-47 opening fire on his skull and shoving those thoughts aside was about as easy as extracting the bullets from his own brain tissue while bleeding out on the ground. Right, fucking impossible is what it was. Bruno looked around, dreary and disenchanting. Everything that had seemed exciting and magical about this place at first had oddly leaked away. Initially, Annie begged Bruno not to live here, dug in her heels and threatened not to live with him at all. Yet, here they were. The stubborn-ass caveman Alpha in Bruno wouldn't listen to his sweet little saint of a woman. The place was cheap, but they really didn't have a choice. It had been real difficult finding a place to rent. Everyone knew the key players under Castillo, and no one wanted a scum-of-the-earth criminal as a tenant. It was this shithole or nothing. Eventually, Annie conceded. But since when did Bruno wait for anyone's permission to act? By that time, the deal had already been done. Annie's fear made sense. She was raised in a sheltered middle-class bubble in uptown Coronado. While Bruno hustled the streets back in Italy, she'd studied music and had a scholarship to a fancy-ass American college the sort with colossal sweeping pillars holding up the ceiling and statues of historic students sprinkled on the lawn. So blind was she to the real predator-prey world out there, she thought herself safe to do as she pleased so long as she wasn't hurting anyone. What a difference a day makes. She learned her difficult lesson the hard way, When she started college, around the same time she and Bruno met, she'd play viola in the school's practice rooms down in the basement after closing hours. One evening, right before the holidays, the janitor found her alone and tried to rape her. Walloping him over the head with the body of her viola, she stunned him enough to escape. When Bruno found out, He showed the horny little pervert ways to use a broom he'd never even dreamed of. 
As for Annie, she was always shy, but she became exceptionally shy after that. She became so afraid, so much more aware of the dangers out there. It took Bruno a while to get her to open up, but she'd climbed out of her shell a hell of a lot since then. Most importantly, she held on tight to Bruno from that day forward, knowing she'd found her man. And she was right. Bruno's dark heart felt only for her. He'd often wondered whether his heart sensed her innocence from the start. Attracted to the overwhelming good in her, he refused to let her go. She kept him sane in his ugly world of violence, murder, and hate. Having Annie at his side gave him so much more than a convenient place to get his rocks off. She became his anchor, gave him a purpose outside himself, beyond his own selfish greed for money and power. When he'd come to America, he'd wanted to stay single and focus everything he had on getting to the top. But her, his sweet Annie, he could not resist. Everything about her enhanced who he was, made him stronger. She believed in his dreams even more than he did. And even though he was a soulless bastard, he loved her. He was sure of that. Nobody had taught him about real love until he met her. He'd never once cheated on his girl, and he was proud of that. The floozies who threw themselves at him weren't worthy of his love. Nobody was but her. They couldn't afford to marry, but no doubt about it, she was his till the end. Because of her, he could never regret any of the choices that brought him to this moment. Bruno stretched in his chair and reclined it backward. Beyond exhausted, his heavy eyes were about ready to close for the night when he caught a glimpse of a shadow crawling along the wall. Keeping the rest of his body still, his hand felt for his gun. Sliding it from his belt and concealing it under his shirt, he snapped his head to the left and his cold heart warmed instantly. Seeing his Annie lingering in the doorway, resting on the door jam, he quickly shoved his weapon away. A slow smile crossed her lips. Looking into the cool, mesmerizing eyes of his woman, Bruno swallowed the saliva collecting in his mouth. Suddenly solid as iron from the fire, his cock jumped to attention. Everything about her appealed to him. Everything, just as she was. Like the delicate, masterful music she played, there was something about the quiet, sensual woman that powerfully attracted him. The couple had been together a long time by Bruno's standards, and yet her effect on him was as strong as when he'd first met the woman he would claim as his, and his alone. Did I wake you? he murmured. It's all right, she said, stepping into the room. I was only closing my eyes until you got home. It was sweet. The woman couldn't sleep at night until he was there beside her, held her breath each day until she knew he'd come home safe. Drove her crazy when he had to go on the road with the crew. As she walked his way, slow and effortlessly sensuous, Bruno saw her more clearly. Her jet black hair flowing like silk over her petite five foot five, 120 pound frame. She wore the same type of clothes as when he'd met her, long-sleeved turtleneck jumpers and faded blue jeans, and managed to look even better. Everything about her was asking to be fucked senseless, like her beauty had been honed to another level of perfection. She had that sort of holy shit stunning figure most women prayed for and teenage girls would kill for. One of those perfect ten girls to whom luck or fate had dealt her life a perfect hand, at least until the night she'd met Bruno. When her body reached him, a raw, visceral energy zinged between them. She bent at the knees and brought her mouth to his forehead to plant a lipstick stain on his skin, and Bruno didn't mind one iota. Meanwhile, his eyes had drifted downwards to her cleavage. Sweeping her hand to the ground before she rose, he noted she took both his shoes in hand. You must be hungry, 
Want me to bring your dinner in here for you? She asked, angling her face to meet his eyes. Inwardly, Bruno smiled. He loved her this way, naive, nurturing, dependent, and he hoped she'd never change. Talk about wishful motherfucking thinking. The mob life corrupted everything it could touch with its icy fingers. That's why he kept her away, shielded her from it as much as he could. Shut her in the house, chained her to the stove all day. Bruno wanted to make sure she didn't know what her husband was. But she knew, even if she didn't allow herself to know on a conscious level. Annie had told him, in her own sweet way, she thought he was being a class A control freak, which he was. You're holding the trigger too tightly, Bruno, she'd tell him. You're so afraid to lose control, I feel like you're an animal in a cage. She didn't understand. In the past, she'd told Bruno she wanted to be more independent. Well, that ship had fucking sailed the night he spotted her in one of Castillo's bars. Innocent, adorable, his. Besides, Bruno knew she secretly loved taking care of him. He could feel it. She repeated her question, but the big man didn't answer right away. He was too engrossed in Annie. He still remembered how she looked the night he'd met her. Those big blue eyes, bright pink lips, hair free flowing over a form-fitting burgundy dress. He'd tried to fight his desires, knowing he was no good for a woman like her. But he'd craved her like he'd needed a high. He wasn't sure why he felt attracted to her to such a profound level. But what he did feel certain of was that in one look, in one glance, he knew she would be his. He looked up at her, not feeling so sleepy anymore. No, I'd like to eat with you. His low baritone purred. She smiled. It wasn't often they got to have a sit-down meal together these days, but she always prepared supper for two just in case. I'll just heat up our plates and you can come on through in a jiffy. Shoes in hand, she headed out the doorway, ass moving rhythmically below her killer little waist, so conducive to Bruno's twitching cock. When she disappeared from sight, he waited to hear the turn of the knob to the kitchen door to quickly pull his gun from the waist of his trousers and tuck it deep behind the cushion of the sofa. Weapons and women didn't mix. Joining her in the other room, he took a seat on one of the kitchen chairs around the table in front of the plate with the largest portion. Swallowing a bite of his chicken, he realized his appetite had bizarrely dissipated. It confirmed his suspicions that the hunger he felt was not for food. Licking his lips, he eyed her sexy little ass from behind as she fixed the drinks. He couldn't help it. A full day's denial of his instincts was more than he could handle. Rising from his seat before Annie could sit down, Bruno shifted the plates and cutlery onto the counter, then took control, lifting the hem of her turtleneck, exposing those cute little dimples on her lower back. When she pulled away and ran around the other side of the table, he gladly chased after her. She could run away from him, but she couldn't avoid the inevitable. Grasping his woman by the waist, he lifted her up and held her under his arm. Hoisting her onto the kitchen table, caveman style, he put his knee onto the lip of the table, his body hovering over hers, sinking low until her eyes met his. Sapphire gems with thick, dark lashes curled ever so slightly. Fuck, they were beautiful. She blushed, biting her bottom lip. Bruno. He held a hand over her mouth, silencing her. Hush, I don't want to fuck you. I only want to hold you, he uttered softly, inching closer to her velvety lips. Crushing his lips to hers, he kissed her deeply, her mound brushing against his cock. The way the curves of her body fit under his made their contact so scorchingly intense, it verged on pain. 
Certain that her panties were already wet, he reached down to unbutton her jeans and gently slid his hand inside, resting it on her panties to check. Pulling her mouth away, she avoided his heated gaze. Slowly toying with her clit, making her wetter against her will, he loved to see how far he could take her without letting her climax. Tugging her jeans off, he moved his hand up her calves, then to her thighs, letting his fingers wander over her panties. Moaning against his lips, she arched her back to meet his exploring fingertips. He ripped her panties off and dove two fingers into her. Mm. She moaned, arching underneath his muscular frame. She rose slightly to guide him into her deeper, but he slapped her hand away. He spread her legs wide, pinning her down on the table. He pressed into her, kissed her mouth, then that cute strawberry birthmark on her neck, then back to claim her lips again, his tongue dancing circles around hers. She tried to unbutton his shirt, but he wouldn't let her. Not yet. Casting his gaze downward, he pushed her knees up and raised her ass to his mouth. She couldn't hold back her moans when he buried his face into her pussy. Poking his tongue inside her, he sucked and swirled his tongue lovingly, tenderly, groaning in satisfaction. She grabbed a fistful of his hair in pleasure, silently begging for more. She cried out for him to slow down, but his tongue moved faster until she was whimpering in frustration at the mercy of his tongue. Her clit swelled against his lips, and she moaned into orgasm. He didn't stop, didn't give her a chance to recover before he took over her again. Blood roared through his cock as his tongue twisted around her clit in a fury. Your turn, she moaned. Looking her dead in the eyes, Bruno shook his head, slow and unyielding. Groaning, he kissed her pussy like he kissed her pouty, heart-shaped mouth, dominating and unforgiving. She tasted as good as she looked, sweet with potent levels of pheromones, that he relished every drop of it. He then started on her body again. Greedily, he sent her screaming into orgasm over and over her entire body moving in a tidal wave of pleasure as his tongue flicked across her clit, sliding into the shallow depths of her pussy, enjoying her juices. Nothing else mattered in that moment. Satisfied she'd had enough, he eased off the table, his hands reaching behind her knees. He tugged her ass to the table's rim. A slow, sexy smile spread across her lips. Obliging, she spread her legs wide. He smirked. Without warning, he thrust into her pussy, hard enough to let her know who was in charge. He groaned sensuously as she let out a whimper. Ramping up the speed, her pussy walls swelled around his cock. Crossing over to his bestial side, he pounded harder, gripping her thighs tight. Wetness shot from her pussy running down onto her inner thighs and his balls. They both groaned at the same time as he released inside of her, balls deep, thrusting one last time as hot cum shot into her core. Moments passed as they both came down from their earth-shattering climax. Her eyes were tired and heavy, but his eyes remained glued to hers. His callous palm smoothed over her soft skin. Kissing her nose, he inhaled her scent again. The sweet, warm cocoon of them being together made him feel supreme once again, sending a shiver up along his spine. Bruno, she whispered. Fuck that voice, that soft, vulnerable voice. Scooping her up in his arms, he carried Annie upstairs to their bedroom, all his fatigue forgotten laid her on the bed so she was stretched out across the sheets. Staring at her, Bruno wondered what had made her stay so long. She should have sent his ass packing long ago. Bruno always told her she'd regret falling for him, and yet she allowed herself to love him anyway. 
for now. She'd laughed when he told her this. There were still some rough edges she'd like to smooth out, but she said she hadn't minded that. He often wondered whether over time she would come to resent, or would she love him unconditionally as he loved her. When her breathing changed and he knew she was asleep, Bruno pulled on his jacket and, sitting on the edge of the bed, kissed her on the cheek, then went out the door. Chapter 7 Framed Beyond the grubby southeast outskirts of San Diego, the wealth of the city took over, although it was shrouded now in the black of night. Bruno De Luca drove slowly past darkened homes, all bitterly larger than his own, and the fancy-ass shops locked behind security bars until morning. As he approached the far end of Salio Drive, just before it connected to the main street, the road narrowed, marked by a thick neon signpost for the nightclub Viscous. This, too, belonged to the reigning mafia kingpin Vincent Castillo, it was a place Bruno went to a lot and was a huge deal around here. Bruno's car rumbled up to the nightclub. Killing the engine, he stepped outside. Eyeing the place over, he grinned. It was anyone's guess why the boss had requested his presence, but the big man didn't mind at all. An absurd number of people queued around the block to get inside the most exclusive club on the East Coast. Seeing a light on upstairs, he knew the boss was inside. The man had seemed calmer once the gunman was dead in the ground, although evidently not calm enough to sleep. Bruno strolled right up to the door, oblivious to the whiny complaints from those waiting in line. As he neared the entrance, the enormous security guard, arms muscular creations with bulging veins snaking, and a carved, severe expression on his face, moved aside, pulling back the red velvet rope. DeLuca entered, without sparing a single word to the doorman. Inside, the fluorescent lighting bounced off the hospital's slick, shiny floors. Alive with an electric heartbeat from the DJ booth, the club was filled at this hour. It was well worth the half-an-hour commute into town. Heading over to his usual table, he sat down and jumped into a conversation with Blade and Johnny. When his phone vibrated with orders from the boss, he knew the fun was over and raced upstairs to join him. Outside the old man's office, he raised a knuckled fist to the door. Before he could knock, a thunderous fury he recognized as Castillo's voice caused him to pause. It sounded like the man was alone, his heavy footsteps pacing the room in a stormy temper. Leaning close, he blocked out the sound of the booming music in the club below and listened with his free ear to what was being said. Believe me when I tell you this, the boss growled. I'll break every fucking bone in your body before I go down, least of all for a crime I didn't commit. A promise, not a threat. Castillo didn't do threats. Holy fucking shit. There was no fucking way. Had the body parts they'd only just disposed of been recovered? No. Even if they had, how could they have been linked to Castillo or himself so quickly? All he knew for sure was that the law had launched a total war against organized crime in the past few months. The state of California had received a $100 million from Congress to get rid of organized crime and was determined to win this war. Perhaps they were only clutching at straws. And besides, by that time, Castillo carried that much around in a suitcase. What could they do to him? The boss continued, his voice verging on a blind motherfucking rage. There's no fucking way you'll get away with this. I swear on my mother's grave, on my father's legacy. You take me to court, I'll pick up the phone and send somebody to bring me your kneecaps. How'd you like that? Whoever had gotten themselves on the wrong side of Vincent Castillo was about to learn this man had what law enforcement didn't. The Castillo family had the fear of God and the fear of the 22 behind the judge's ear. I can make that contract any time, and I'll have you. Boiled, 
baked or fried within 24 hours. That's the way it's done in my family. Bruno took a step back from the door, not out of fear, out of shock. He'd never heard the man confess to what he might do so openly. It was too dangerous and simply wasn't done. One tape-recorded call like this, and he could go down for the next decade. Castillo may not have been worried, but Bruno was. Had he cracked? Maybe the boss really was losing it. On a growl came the sound of the landline phone slamming down onto the receiver. A tendril of unease slid through the big man outside the door. No sound emitted from the room after that. Heedful, Bruno waited a short while before colliding his knuckles with the door. Once, twice, DeLuca, called the boss, voice threatening and abrupt. At the boss's words, the door trembled beneath Bruno's knuckles. Yanking the door wide, he stepped into Castillo's office, his dark brown eyes sweeping around. The small room was tidy, unpretentious, and homely. A rare steak lay forgotten on the antique desk. A hunk of meat lay on his fork across the plate. Five or so feet behind the desk was the window. The boss stood alone, heels together, hands cupped, arms hanging straight down like a military soldier, staring out. The air in the room was choking and smoggy, like he'd been mainlining cigarettes, and smelled sharply of immediate grief. Bruno tore off his jacket, tossed it onto the hat tree beside the door, and moved deeper into the room. Evening, boss, he said, stepping into the office. How you doing? You're late, Castillo quipped without looking at him. Castillo was a unique man, sure of himself, abrupt. It won't happen again, boss, Bruno replied. Stepping closer, he repeated his question. So, how you doing? Pivoting on his heel, Castillo glared directly into the big man's eyes, locking his gaze with a look that said he had a lot of shit on his shoulders. Good, all good, he replied dryly. He never talked about himself. A man who loved his accomplishments almost as much as he loved himself, the boss wasn't particularly modest, only very private. And he figured the less people knew about him, the better. As Castillo marched over to his black executive chair, there came a powerful bash from behind him. Holy shit! The window frame had swung wide on its hinges, ramming the wood frame into the outside wall. Turning quickly, the boss tugged the window to a close. As he did so, the same irrational breeze that was its cause gusted through the closing window in protest, sending the stack of letters on his desk flying into the air, helicoptering onto the ground in front of Bruno like sycamore leaves. Bruno hastily collected the mess together, gathering the boss's mail into a thick wad. Placing them into the mail tray on Castillo's desk, something unsettling caught his notice. Alarmed, his gaze fixed on the letter at the top of the pancake stack of envelopes. Jerking his head up, he stared at the boss with questioning eyes. Have you seen this? He asked, slipping the sealed letter from the top of the pile and inspecting it front and back. Castillo took his seat and shook his head. Let me guess, it's from attorney Nick Leonard, Golding Law, he scoffed. Bruno gazed at the letter and then back to Castillo. Goldman Law, he echoed. That's correct. Don't worry about that. Leonard doesn't have shit on me. File it away. He gestured to a stainless steel set of drawers against the wall. That cabinet over there. Boss, I'd at least read it if I were you. Bruno held out the letter with an insistent hand. DeLuca well knew Nick Leonard was a sly bastard who knew how to get a jury under his thumb. They'd lost three men to the motherfucker in the past six months, ten to life locked up in the joint. Like the cocky little motherfucker he was, he loved sniping criminals, especially for heinous crimes, thinking he'd get away with it. Not in this life. Trouble was, he'd become so valuable the government hid him like a man under witness protection. 
The only time you'd see him was the day of the trial. You think I don't know what I'm doing? I already know what it's going to say, Castillo said with a shrug. Goldman's is just a bunch of monkeys in suits, trying to carve out a living by bluffing that they got something on you when they don't have shit. I say fuck it. I've been in this game longer than you've been alive, kid. I won't eat their bullshit. Crossing his arms over his chest, he seemed confident, as always, rolling with any punch. Bruno sighed. Don't walk into a trial with those bastards with your eyes closed. If you fall against Leonard, you'll fall hard. Vincent raised an eyebrow, silently reminding him who he was. Cool it, DeLuca. His tone was level, perhaps mildly agitated, but in his cold eyes, Bruno could see tiny cracks appear where his resolve had been. It's none of your damn business anyway he said, throwing his hands in the air. So shut the hell up or get the fuck out of my room, he sneered. Unfazed, Bruno leaned forwards over the desk, dropping the envelope in front of the stubborn-ass old man. Boss, don't blame me for giving a fuck. I'm in your corner. Help me help you. Tell me who you're in trouble with and what they have on you he demanded, an imperative, not a question. He couldn't help but feel the boss was balancing on a tightrope, running with a blindfold, and every step might be the one where he falls. Watch yourself, DeLuca. He looked angry now. Fuck it. He can stay mad at me. What's loyalty if you don't tell a man when he's in over his head? And if you're wrong, Bruno probed, undeterred. You're headed for the deep end, boss, he growled, pointing a big finger between Castillo's killer's eyes. The old man threw his head back, chest jumping up and down as he chortled to himself. And you're going to save me? He shook his head, smile wide. I ain't your Cinderella, baby cakes. Bruno scowled, fists bawling, bones cracking tight like a snake squeezing the last breath out of its prey. I didn't say that. I said, you're skidding on thin fucking ice. Now he was mad too. Real fucking mad. I'm not here to sweep you off your feet, princess. That's right. Two could play at this fucking game. I'm here to stop you from making the biggest fucking mistake of your life. Castillo snickered, shaking his head from side to side. Listen, damn it. Bruno barked, getting his bulldog on. You know I'm right as much as I do. If Goldman Law sends you down, I can't help you. When it's all said and done, there's no patching it up after the judge drops his gavel. He let out a frustrated breath, eyeing the boss in outrage, allowing his drumming heart to calm. As I said, if you fall, then you'll fall hard. So treat me with some goddamn respect when I tell you I'm prepared to fall just as hard to keep you right here, out of jail where you belong. Do you have a problem with that? Suddenly silent, Castillo stared at the other man for the longest time. A man who stood fierce and unblinking in the face. The Vincent Castillo. He had more kills to his name than any serial killer on record. A man who, until now, had never set foot out of line. Castillo had taken him for a chicken shit like the rest of the guys, all hard-ass shells of real men. Not Bruno. A fast learner, he'd figured out quick it's not the getting, it's the keeping. Cold-blooded, the bottom of the barrel, and yet, the first in his corner. Sit down, Vincent said rising to his feet, gesturing to the chair on the other side of the desk. With a slow, singular bow of his head, Bruno pulled out the chair opposite the boss. Only when he'd sat down did Castillo follow. Scooting his chair forward, he leaned over the desk, all business, forearms flat down, hands together, and fingers interlaced. I like you, DeLuca, so I'll level with you. But let me be clear, you betray my trust and I'll send you straight to hell. Gabish, Gabish. 
he sighed. All right, there's a shitstorm coming my way, and I don't want you or any of the others to get caught in the crossfire. I'm being framed for murder. Framed by the goddamn Mexicans, the ass wipes. Mexicans? Bruno's brows jumped in shock. The Mexicans' reputation was for having a lot of moxie. At the bottom of the crime scheme, they'd do anything. They were wild, spawned from the cruelest depths of hell. Always greedy for more, they would sink even lower, using hell's deadly force for their own gain. So it wasn't that he wouldn't put it past them, but they didn't have the kind of power to send Castillo down. Italians beat Mexicans every fucking time. And how the hell are they going to pull that off? See, I thought the same, ignored their threats for the past month, and now I get letters from the biggest law firm in the state. Apparently, they got a case against me. Bruno felt something ugly claw at his insides. When's the court date? You've got time, right? Castillo cursed. I've got two days. Fuck a duck, DeLuca muttered. An instant later, questions quick-fired from his mouth as fast as they entered his thoughts. Who did they kill? When? And how the hell did they incriminate you for it? They're barely smart enough to tie their own fucking shoes. That's true, but let me remind you, Leonard has been after my ass for years. What I suspect is that when this case fell onto his desk, he was using every IQ point in that head of his to set me up for the fall. What I know is, the murder was the work of a Mexican gang from Coronado's south side. Yes, loan sharks, all of them. When people didn't pay on time, they were killed killed without one single twinge of conscience, without remorse, without regret, without guilt. And as the boss explained, they'd finally killed one guy too many, a big-time loan shark. Bruno wasn't surprised they were trying to pull a stunt like this. The guys from the south side didn't like the Italian mob. Everywhere, fingers of blame were being pointed. Apparently, the hard evidence linked to only one man. Where was the body recovered? Castillo shook his head. The dumbass Mexicans killed him in one of their social clubs. Then took him out back, cut him up, slid him down the middle Mexican style so that he wouldn't float and tossed him in the river. But the dumbasses forgot to puncture the lungs and the body floated. So why'd you call me here? If you didn't intend to tell me, Castillo glanced at the clock, and Bruno followed his gaze. A quarter past two a.m. I called you here because I will be arrested this morning. Forty-eight hours after or less, I'll face the judge and jury. I don't want you to tell anyone about it because in a couple of days, I'll be set free. Bruno gasped inwardly, feeling like the wind had been kicked out of him. Controlling his reaction, he showed no outward signs of the worry blasting through him. This was almost unheard of for Castillo. To Castillo, the threat clearly appeared negligible. He was accustomed to it, and he considered letters from attorneys basically bullshit, throwaway threats. It made some sense. He'd never been prosecuted before. Bruno feared that was exactly how the prosecutors wanted it. Bruno peered down at his watch. How many more hours did the man have left? And if you don't walk free? If I don't, it's prison food for the rest of my days. Tend to life upstate. I'll never run anybody out to save my own skin, living under the Federal Witness Protection Program. Ha! Not Vincent Castillo. There must be something I can do. The boss's words bounced around in Bruno's mind, searching for a solution, turning like a Rubik's Cube. Life. Sentence. Just the thought had a wave of dread crashing through him. I'll have it all taken care of soon enough, Castillo reassured him. If the judge doesn't rule in our favor, he leaves the world forever. Case closed. Vincent loved a challenge, something that would push him to the wall hone his skills. For Bruno, this was too fucking close for comfort. 
He was a planner, a strategizer, never a fly-by-the-seat-of-his-pants kind of man. The past few weeks had been hell, and he had every indication that it would continue to be hell. Boss, I hate to say it, but if the Mexicans have been crazy enough and cruel enough to frame you for this, don't you worry that even if you did get off, they may send gunners over here and shoot you anyway? Castillo laughed. Son, I'm a mafia boss. I've been taking chances on my life every day for over three decades. When I walk free, Leonardo Felipe's pussies will have a little hissy fit, but what's he gonna do about it? Bruno sat forward. Leonardo Felipe, head of the joke-ass Mexican cartel? That's who sent you up? He shot to his feet, fists clenching. I have a feeling he'll drop any testimonies his men have against you real soon. No, Bruno, you can't skate on weak ice and not expect to get wet. You're not gonna bribe him? Bet he's never seen a million dollars cash in his life. Bruno smiled. That's his real agenda. That's what he's really after. Castillo shook his head. What? Give him money so he has even more power? The judge will roll over soon enough. Bruno sighed heavily. Listen, Bruno, anything happens to me, remember this. Never, ever get involved with drugs. Don't you let your greed overcome your loyalty. Don't risk dipping into drugs as I've seen in some of the youngsters. You can steal a big drug dealer's money, but you can't steal the drugs. I know that, boss. His father was the same way, same generation, and always made sure nobody in his family fooled with drugs. The phone on the desk suddenly rang. Bruno sat down and waited while Castillo listened to someone on the other line. Hanging up, he informed Bruno that the judge had agreed to rule in his favor, hands down. The judge, Judge Peterson, was on their side now. Relax, Bruno. All I ask you to do is keep the boys busy while I'm gone. Tossing his arms over his enormous chest, Bruno gave Castillo the once-over like he'd lost his damn mind. Sure, it would serve him right. But shit, if the call were being recorded, the boss was as good as convicted. He still felt uneasy about the whole thing. He knew this judge. I don't know. Something doesn't smell right here. I think you're being a little paranoid, my friend. Isn't it better to be paranoid than walk away a free man? Bruno countered. Leaving Castillo alone, unquestioning, he stalked out the door. He vowed he'd do whatever it took to rebuild on the ashes should anything happen. If Castillo went down, it would be a major embarrassment. This could bring the family to the edge of extinction, but the mob was fully capable of resurrecting itself. Fuck it, Bruno growled. He refused to give up. Sitting down on the old black leather couch in front of the mock fireplace downstairs, he picked up the phone, punched in a few digits, and waited for it to answer. Someone needed reminding to play on his side of the fence. Bruno knew he had to work fast if he was going to stand any hope in hell of saving Castillo. He had to do what he had to do. It was a risk, but he could handle it. Bruno met Marco in his car, somewhere out of the way in a car park by the ferry at the docks. He told the man that a very bad, very dangerous man was dead, and Vincent, who was the prime suspect, would soon be taken into custody. Castillo was certain he wouldn't be taken down. What judge, what jury would dare convict him? Bruno glanced across to the small cabin which housed lockers. Marco's father had a locker over here, a place he stashed cash in plain sight, and he and Marco were the only other people on earth to know it existed. What the fuck do you need with two million large? Marco's brow drew into a deep frown above his stormy eyes. Though he didn't wait for the answer, he just headed to the locker. Fiddling through his pocket, he found the key and unlocked the safe. The two men took a cool two million and Bruno was on his way. Bruno De Luca drove out to a bar on the outskirts of town. Whilst technically in San Diego, 
The bar was situated in a gritty industrial zone on the edge of North Tijuana, where shootings remained frequent. People slid out of the way as Bruno marched down the pavement and stalked hastily through the doors of the bar. Some people hated the smell of exhaust fumes or hospitals. Bruno hated the smell of dive bars. They all smelled the same. Cigarette smoke, urine, sweat, and dust. The atmosphere of the place had a severe sense of foreboding, and the gray light which fell down through the windows blurred the faces in the room. Imitation wood from floor to ceiling, the dull walls and sagging furniture seemed not to have changed in the past twenty years. Most of the lunchtime crowd had drifted out. Bruno nodded to the barman as he passed the bar. Not taking any chances, he'd arranged to sit down with Leonardo Felipe at a dive bar owned by the man himself. Miraculously, he agreed. Bruno had a golden moment in which he believed he would show the Mexicans who really owned this town. He had a strong sense that Castillo's fate hung on whether or not the Mexicans would play into his hands. After officially becoming a made man a few months back, Bruno had sat in on a number of sit-downs with rival mobsters. This wasn't his first rodeo. He assumed this would be kick-ass easy. He assumed wrong. The bartender nodded as Bruno walked to the rear. Two bodyguards, stripped to their shirt sleeves, were shooting pool at the table in front. One of them stopped as Bruno walked past. He said nothing, a permanent frown dragged at the corners of his mouth. Bruno joined Leonardo in a large booth around the back. The Mexican gave a singular nod of his head for the man to sit. Hair steely gray wool, eyes gray too, his face deeply lined. Leonardo eyed him suspiciously. What's this about? he asked as he leaned forward. Bruno maintained his tense, defensive posture as he replied, I hear you've been spreading some nasty rumors to the cops about my boss. Listen, kid, you got balls, I'll give you that, but you could offer me ten mil, cash on the spot, and I wouldn't take it. I don't want your money, I want revenge. He taunted, licking his lips before placing the rim of his tequila glass to his mouth, an arrogant smile plastered on his face. Fuck your revenge, Bruno sneered. Leonardo's smile faded. That's enough. This ain't protocol. Where's your boss? I'm sure he wouldn't be too happy to hear you playing outside the mob's bylaws. Bruno's jaw locked. And fuck protocol, too. Jumping angrily to his feet, Bruno lunged across the table, nostrils flaring, showing his fangs like a dragon. Grabbing the man's blazer jacket, he tugged him closer, so close the other man wafted his hot, acidic breath into Bruno's face. The jackass then smiled from ear to fucking ear. I'm telling you, you disrespected me in a sit-down, and I say count your blessings that I'm letting you walk out of here alive. No, bitch. Bruno slammed his hand on the table, spilling Leonardo's tequila. Count my fucking blessings, my ass. It's your fucking grave you're dancing on. I came here to offer you two fucking million to take the heat off the boss, and I'm supposed to be fucking grateful? Leonardo stood up suddenly. Not gonna happen. Snapping his fingers a couple of times, his bodyguards looked up, and he edged slowly out of the room. Now, if you'll excuse me, I got work to do. See you in court. Bruno gave him a killer stare. He turned and walked toward the exit, a bodyguard at either arm. See you in court, my ass. Fuck no. Take your two million and get your ass back to Mexico. If you don't, I'll make your life so miserable, you'll be begging for me to end it. Leonardo kept walking and started to laugh. Bruno's eyes popped with shock and surprise. What kind of man walks away from two fucking million dollars? He growled and stood to his full six foot six height. Understand what I'm telling you? He yelled. And fucking oh, DeLuca. Leonardo called back at him. 
Bruno turned around at last, and the face he looked into was the only person left in the bar. The server who'd appeared behind the bar met his gaze with wide, fearful eyes and said with a smoker's rasp, God help you, young man. Bruno scowled. Well, they have been warned. Chapter 8 Totally Off the Rails Hold out your wrists, please. Bruno glanced over his shoulder to stare towards the commotion forming behind him. He saw the anger on Vincent Castillo's face as he looked at Bruno and his men, still sitting on their chairs, staring at him with identical expressions of shock and bewilderment. It wasn't often that something surprised Castillo. This evening, however, two uniformed police officers had come into the social club. Castillo didn't understand why. What he understood was that he had been handcuffed and was now being read his rights in front of almost 200 of his closest friends and associates. Raising his voice so that he could be heard by the entire crowd, the officer said, Vincent Castillo, you are being arrested for the murder of Gennaro Gacci. Castillo's eyes went wide, his mouth hanging open. All he could think to say was, are you fucking kidding me? The room was near silent, murmurs weaving through the bar. The larger officer proclaimed, You have the right to remain silent and refuse to answer any questions. But if you choose to speak, anything you say can be held against you in a court of law. You have the right to an attorney during questioning now or in the future. Do you understand? The room was dead silent now. Castillo groaned. What does this have to do with me? The two men in blue yanked him out of the booth with enough force to make him stumble forward. Take it easy, will ya? Castillo protested. Whispers followed him as he left his VIP booth in the mob's social club. Cocky ass motherfuckers. It wasn't only an arrest, it was a public shaming. What is this? What's your deal? Bruno growled. The officers didn't meet his glare, and neither did Castillo, his tanned face flushing with anger and embarrassment. A few minutes later, the cops pulled away, with the crime family's boss in the back seat. Bruno began to pace back and forth, anger exploding through his body. Freezing in his tracks, he turned to Marco. Get his attorney on the line. The big man felt his blood pressure rise. He needed an escape, time to think. Storming out of the place, he drove out to a quiet little bar just outside town. His head was spinning, and he needed to calm down, get numb if he had to. For once, when he walked into the room, no one recognized him. He looked around, panning the scene. Just ahead, chicks serving drinks behind the bar a couple of guys shooting pool off to the left. Same shit, different party. What was out of the ordinary was the perfect ten he saw polishing glasses, and his dark, burning eyes found her through the clear glass. A gold digger with a perfect figure, who liked to shake her ass and grind to the beat. So what? What was so wrong with having the time of his life when his future was slipping through the cracks? She was a nice-looking girl with an easy smile and breasts as large as her head. Bruno was keeping an eye on her as he continued ordering drinks from the bar. She looked like she could run a tight line in those heels, not one foot out of step. Then she tripped. A drunk put his arm around her waist. Get your filthy paws off me, she screeched. Yes, a sassy little spitfire he liked the look of. Bruno rushed over to where she'd fallen and helped her to her feet. Are you okay, sweetheart? She buried her face in Bruno's shirt. Bruno felt himself stiffen. He consoled her in his arms as he guided her to the bar stool beside him. Making her sit down, he ordered them both a drink. Like whiskey? Her eyes illuminated green, then turned a cool turquoise in the glow of her lighter. Yes she answered, lighting up a cigarette. He threw an arm over her shoulder. 
His jokes were making her laugh when his puns were funny and even when they sucked. She ribbed him playfully, inching closer to his lips. She gave him a sexy kiss on the cheek and then the mouth. She was so fucking horny, toying with the cigarette smoldering between her fingers. Her skirt was hiked up to her upper thighs. Halfway through their drinks, she was calm and happy. She liked him, and sadly, he felt that way for her. Bruno sighed in defeat and threw back his whiskey. No denying it, they were heading for the deep end tonight. He was too engrossed in conversation to see who came through the door. A brash groan sounded from behind him. What the fuck do you think you're doing? Bruno didn't have to look to know who it was. Hunched over the bar, half-cocked elbows perched on the lip, he turned his head slightly and caught Charlie out of the corner of his eye. The whore was grasping at Bruno now, her fingers openly caressing his arm, her other hand caressing the front of his jeans. Getting drunk and laid. What do you think I'm doing? Bruno replied deadpan. He took down two glasses of whiskey, knocked down half of it in one sip, and sighed with satisfaction. Taking another pull of a glass of scotch, he then clamped his teeth around a cigarette, and the whore lit it. Her beauty hit him full force, a real feisty little firecracker. Bruno reached for another glass. Charlie abruptly slapped it away, sending the glass hurling like a suicide jumper to the floor. Easy, you've had enough, he said sharply. Bruno stumbled back a bit while mumbling indistinctly. Brother, just because I don't have to bullshit my way into a woman's panties, he mocked. Charlie stepped between them like he was about to break up a fight. The whore seethed in Charlie's direction. Do you want a coffee? Bruno gave her ass a light tap as she walked away. Luckily, his brother always had his back. You need to remember the woman you have at home. She's far too good for the likes of you, but if you do this, you'll lose her. All right, all right, Bruno said. He finished his cigarette and ground it out in an ashtray. A look of disgust marred Charlie's chiseled features, his icy gaze refusing to back down. You're totally off the rails. So they all say, Bruno remarked as he didn't get up to leave. Bruno. Charlie grabbed his arm with more strength than was his usual. I'm Bruno DeLuca. I stop for no one. Bruno tried to jerk free, but the guy was one determined bastard. I'm fucking her tonight. A girl with a body and a sexy strut. No, you're not, Charlie yelled back at him. If you wanted to get your rocks off, pull one off in the bathroom or go home to your woman. He had to go and ruin everything. The bastard. He wasn't releasing him. Be careful, Bruno. I'm the only man in this goddamn world who's not afraid of you. You know that? Those no-good shitheads have taken the boss, Bruno grumbled drunkenly. Why are you acting like the game's already over when Castillo's already won? His lawyers will get this all straightened out. Bruno shook his head. He understood life would not be normal for a very long time. And if not, well, you can't say the guy didn't have it coming. Christ, he's as bad as they come. What did you just say? Bruno let out a gravelly tone somewhere between a growl and a huff. He wobbled as he got off his stool. I'm putting you in a cab home. Why are you here anyway? Charlie, the recluse? The hermit. He had no friends, no visitors. I needed to check to see if you were okay. Marco told me you'd be here. He also told me to give you a letter. It's from Castillo. You can have it when you're in the taxi. Come on, I'm taking your sorry ass home. Going home in the car, Charlie handed Bruno the letter. He tore it open at once. The letter told him, should anything ever happen to him, that Bruno should arrange a meeting with the man named Frankie Peterson. Suddenly, his booze-fucked mind sobered. He felt terrible. 
In a day's time, Castillo would stand trial, and Bruno wasn't sure he could be saved. DeLuca could only wonder what twisted curveball fate had dumped in his lap. Chapter 9 Around and Around It Goes Rain pelted down, slashing at the windshield of the unmarked black sedan as it moved slowly through the traffic on San Diego Street and turned right onto Courthouse Square. A block away, a dozen members of the press shuffled impatiently at the foot of the steps of the courthouse, waiting for the notorious mob boss to arrive. The first day of the trial everyone had been waiting for was finally here. Hundreds of people lined up outside, cold, shivering, and drenched, either hoping to honor their hero or to see the infamous mafia kingpin take his final steps as a free man. It was the worst day California had seen in months, and still, the parking lot opposite the courthouse was jammed full. Some, the most devout supporters and the most hardcore haters, had been there for hours. Uniformed deputies stood at the perimeter of the plastic barriers to keep them under control. Squad cars cruised around the block, warding off trouble. The media carnival was almost ready to begin. Fighting for a prime spot were cameras, lights, cameramen, and eight television remote trucks, including one from CNN. Technicians trailed wires across the ground, covering them with silver electrical tape. Photographers leaned precariously over the plastic police barriers, pushing their luck for that one golden front-page shot. Blazing a path through the streets of fascinated residents, the black sedan approached. Castillo sat in the back seat hidden from the outside world by the tinted rear windows. The man everyone was waiting to see, wearing a dark gray suit, white shirt, and a wine-colored tie, hands cuffed together at the wrists, feet cuffed at the ankles, held against his will. Though it wouldn't be long before he was free, he was sure of that. When the world handed Vincent Castillo a raw deal, he made sure those responsible felt the demon's karma owed them. He'd trap the parasites responsible, open the door, and throw the devil in. Those bitch-ass motherfuckers better prepare to get laced. His attorney was permitted to ride with him, tall, professional, tough as iron. Beside him sat a city marshal, there were two other marshals in front, including the driver. You've sure drawn a crowd, said the marshal in the back seat. Castillo's eyes swept over the crowds. Cockroaches, he remarked contemptuously. The boss leaned close to his attorney's ear. It'll be a breeze, he said, his voice a confidential whisper. His attorney sighed, his light eyes revealing nothing. Best case, yes. Worst case, the judge will charge you with the murder in the first degree. Malevolent as ever, Castillo smiled and then looked out the window at a cluster of cheering admirers. I don't find that likely, he said, eyeing the crowd. He truly believed, without a doubt, that he would walk free. He manipulated, and he was good at it. His jubilant personality always won the jury over. They saw good in his broad, fake-ass smile, trusted the monster behind it. Regular people would often learn so easy that trust was the most fatal mistake of all. When someone noticed blue lights whirling on top of a vehicle, they called out loud and a frenzy began. Spectators half rose to crane their necks and photographers hung from the curbs. When the cop car sailed into full view of the passionate crowds, the clapping and cheering rose in intensity as the sedan approached the entrance to the new central courthouse on Union Street. As the car pulled to a stop outside the courthouse, the sun glistened across the glass panes of the relatively new building. Developers had turned the old courthouse into a huge upscale splendor of glass and precast concrete structure. It was a great feature soaring and rising improbably against the featureless sky as the media jostled for position to get a shot of Castillo against the adorning backdrop. Moving around the car, a marshal went towards the door on the convict's side. Inside the car, Castillo's feet were unshackled. 
Once space was cleared, the door opened, and he exited the vehicle with a camera-ready smile on his lips and freedom in his focus. Pacing quickly with an adrenaline momentum, he marched up the steps that ascended towards the double oak doors that would decide his fate. As he approached the doors, an officer opened one wide to let him pass beyond to the inside. Castillo stomped into the lobby, rehearsing his opening statement in his mind. Shaking the chill from his shoulders, he was immediately patted down and searched. Looking down the long, foreboding hallways, he noticed how deserted they were. The clunk of a doorknob sounded from down the hall, and he observed the judge crossing between two rooms and slowly growled through his teeth. His two eyes didn't leave the man's face, and when he turned towards the commotion, he saw the man note his presence and sent the judge a nod along with a cold grin, a thin veneer of good over the evil that lay beneath. He ain't gonna know what hit him, Castillo vowed, licking his lips. He could feel it, taste it. This was going to be fun, a game he'd already won. The judge smiled back. Chapter 10 Strike 3, You're Out As Bruno De Luca entered the great courthouse, uniformed police officers and paralegal types alike stared at him with wide-eyed curiosity. Curiosity and caution. Bruno needed only to glance at them to know they feared him in every possible way. If they really knew him, they'd know he'd never harm an innocent. To gun for a man or woman who didn't have the capacity to defend themselves would be weak, bordering on pathetic, now wouldn't it? The court steward checked Bruno in on Castillo's case on a check sheet and advised the big man where to go. Castillo's lawyers have arrived. You can wait just down the hall, courtroom F. Bruno barely nodded his head. Tense from the tips of his toes to his hulking shoulders, ice filled his veins, seizing up his muscle fibers as he moved. What the bloody hell was wrong with him? It wasn't anything he wasn't used to. Black aviators hung loosely across his nose, framing his very deadly yet undeniably sexy face. Echoes filled the hallways with the whispers of speculation stirring. Each step he took, more males and females alike looked up. The noise level in the area dropped dramatically as he approached the crowd, but Bruno walked wordlessly past Castillo's friends and family. Then he saw Sofia's face and had to stop as he thought he'd better make sure she was all right. The woman tentatively stepped forward. Wrapping his big arms around her, Bruno held her for a moment. He could feel that she was trembling like panic had flooded into her bones and she wasn't settling like he thought she would. I'm worried, she whispered. Your husband's a tough man, he told her, hoping he'd settle her mind. He'll kill it in there, you'll see. Sophia nodded, flashing a ghost of a smile. When Bruno turned and scanned the area for a place to sit, he found Marco sat against the wall that ran parallel to the door. He paced over to the man. You look like hell, Marco raised a brow at him. Yeah, well... Bruno offered a dismissive shrug and plopped down onto the chair beside his cousin without another word. Checking his watch, he noted the time and adjusted his tie. A half hour or so left before the trial would commence. When Castillo's attorney approached, the three of them stepped into a private room to go over their testimonies. Things he needed them to be specific on and things they needed to answer in a specific way when asked questions. Minutes turned into hours, time dripping slowly like a thick syrup. Usually, they had a waiting room, but the case was running late. Today, the hallway was their waiting room. Castillo's close family were present, sobbing and speculating, but DeLuca sat alone, stoic, silent. Every once in a while, he glanced up and saw Castillo's old lady. Sophia, looking filled with dread and anxiety, kept pacing up and down in front of the courtroom door. Above her, a brass plaque plastered over the wood at head height that said simply, Courtroom F. She, 
more than anyone else, was becoming increasingly on edge with every second that passed. Leaning his head back against the wall, Bruno shut his eyes and said a short prayer. He thought about the events of the night before, how Leonardo had laughed in his face. It had astounded him at the time, how he'd nearly betrayed his own woman so absolutely. When a deep, don't fuck with me baritone announced, all parties for the case between San Diego State and Vincent Castillo, please line up outside the courtroom. Bruno's eyes shot open to find a bearded African-American man in a khaki green uniform stood in front of the now open courtroom door. This wasn't typical, but this wasn't your typical case. It was murder. Rising to his feet, Bruno motioned for everyone to be quiet. The steward appeared and motioned those not giving evidence to go into court. Bruno looked for Sophia as she walked past, and taking her by the hand, he raised it to his lips, locking her panic-stricken gaze with his dark eyes to reassure her that everything would be all right. The woman made no reply, only stared so severely into his eyes he could feel the storm that was to come. Bruno felt immensely relieved to find himself at last in the courtroom. He took his place in the stands. Castillo was already inside, caged behind a plastic screen like an animal. Both his shackled wrists were on the table, and he appeared calm, resolute. Bruno wasn't surprised. This was a game Castillo had played many times before, a game he knew how to win. He didn't play fair, but who did? A fool, that's who. Bruno looked around the room again and noted that Sophia sat behind the defense attorney. Another woman sat next to her, a very frail, very elderly lady, perhaps Castillo's mother. When they met Castillo's eyes, both of them waved crossed fingers at him. Castillo gave them a nonchalant wink and a smile. Sophia's returned smile faltered into a pained pursing of her lips. Order in the court, the bailiff bellowed from the far door. Bruno snapped his head around and glared at the open doorway as the judge entered the room. When the man stepped inside, everyone rose to their feet. He sat in his usual place behind his podium at the head of the room. Just as the trial began, Bruno looked over at the jury sitting up there and spotted three Mexican men in their company. Sleazy-ass motherfuckers. He curled his fingers into fists. Apparently, Marco noticed, too, because he narrowed his eyes at the three men. Who the fuck let in the alley rats? He whispered. Beats me, Bruno whispered back. The security guard who stood beside the judge nodded at the two other officers in the room, and they each shut the wooden doors. As soon as the hearing was in session, Bruno kept his eyes on Castillo, and everyone else did the same. Castillo rose to make his opening statement, all carefully written and practiced. Usually, he was good at it. Today, he sounded cocky and noticeably worked up. Kept his words so far removed from the facts that he made the whole situation look ridiculous, and it appeared to irritate the judge and jury. Strike one. The prosecutor, in a regimental striped tie and heavy, polished, waxed shoes, was introduced as John Nixon. Nixon, a real fireballer, questioned Castillo under cross-examination. The type who talked in bullshit accents to prove they were educated played on Castillo's lack of an alibi for the night of October the 25th. Castillo had lied, a small lie, but everyone could tell, and it tainted all the rest of his testimony. The body was positively identified as a criminal. He had multiple bullet wounds, wrapped up, tied, and placed in shipping boxes. He said this connected Castillo with the victim. Pretty much horseshit, but the jury pandered to his BS, dancing happily to whatever tune he played. Nixon went on to show the jury exactly what happened to the victim, spinning a story out of his ass. Finally, he threw a fireball right into Castillo's nuts. So how do you explain this photograph? Castillo let out a thunderous laugh. Strike two. Holy fucking shit. 
Marco growled in Bruno's ear, and the pair slowly turned their heads toward each other, locking eyes with a knowing look. Bruno was seething, burning with overwhelming rage. Snapping his head towards Castillo, he glared up at the man. He was half tempted to march right over to him and knock him unconscious to quiet his big mouth. The last thing the boss needed to do was test the jury or the judge, or worse, anger them. The worst part? Bruno was powerless to prevent it. Two witnesses testified. Both had tanned features and thick Hispanic accents. They mentioned seeing Castillo in the bar in Tijuana on the night of the murder. And Castillo didn't have an alibi, because he couldn't admit where he really was without sending his entire crew down for twenty years. Someone had suggested at the time that he would need a stiff drink after what he'd done that night. Castillo made no comment. Strike three. Castillo went down for the count of murder with no chance of parole. It was life. In the words of the judge, he had committed a crime, shockingly evil, wicked, and vile beyond belief. Said he recognized a dangerous sociopath for what he was. There were no loopholes for him to exploit. In all his years, Bruno had learned the mantra, the quieter you stay, the longer you survive. Now, for the first time, he would talk. What Bruno didn't know at that time was that Castillo had already been picked out from a lineup the previous evening. When Bruno himself took the stand, his low baritone voice made everyone look up. My name is Bruno De Luca, and I'm here to provide the character testimony for Castillo. He gave a fake smile to the jury. If you're going to send this man down, then you'll be sending away the most charitable man in the state, a hero. The judge stared hard at Bruno, who held his best poker face. Well, I'll be damned, he said. A murmur ran through the twelve men and women in the jury as Castillo interrupted, saying he was speaking the truth. The judge slammed his gavel for silence. He glared at the jury as if to say, or else. The judge took a long sip of his water. Then he narrowed his eyes at Castillo and smirked. A corrupt judge was easy to spot. They gave out all kinds of telltale signs. Castillo narrowed his eyes at him, too. With all due respect, Your Honor, my client will refrain from making comment during witness testimony, the lawyer said diplomatically. Castillo's lawyer looked shocked, every ounce of professionalism dropping from his shoulders, knowing it was pointless to continue. He then said, I have no further questions for this witness. Bruno clenched his fists at his sides and grunted a frustrated curse. He wanted to yell at the judge, rat him out that it was all part of a twisted plot on the Mexican's part. Not going to happen. His sharp, logical mind knew this was the worst choice in this situation. Fisting his knuckles, he used them to wipe the sweat from his forehead. Bastards, he muttered. He then stared at the judge. Too hard. He felt it. The judge's eyes snapped up, blazing into Bruno's like hate-filled lasers. There would be no point in trying to explain it to anyone now. Bruno gave with a wide-eyed look of pity at Castillo and then to Sofia. Castillo cast his eyes to his wife and his grandmother sitting in the jury stands. His wife was wiping tears from her eyes. Everything that was fell in front of their eyes. The witness can stand down. Bruno returned to his seat, and as if it was needed, this was strike four. Within a few more minutes, the jury was sent out to deliberate. Hardly necessary as within the hour, everyone was back in court for the verdict. The judge narrowed his eyes at Castillo. Count yourselves lucky it wasn't the electric chair. If we were in Florida, it would have been. Castillo's lawyer picked up his notes from the table and shook his head. Most guys in Castillo's position would tell all, rat on the mob to save his ass. Not him. Ha ha, funny. Shitheads, he would never do that. The state prosecutor and defense attorney emerged from the courtroom. Bruno turned his attention to the jackass who'd just prosecuted his boss. 
Bruno seethed, stalking across the hall, straight for him. Listen, asshole. His voice echoed around the room. Without a second thought, Bruno smacked him across the face. The blow bloodied his nose and warm blood gushed down his face. He accepted the punch with a silent scowl. A demonic growl ground through Bruno's clenched teeth. Unfucking forgivable. What he wouldn't give to take a swing at him. In his dreams, he was going to slice his balls off with a knife. Screw it. To hell with it. Within the hour, the now former mob boss of the Castillo crime family was in a helicopter lifting off from the courthouse roof, headed to a maximum security prison. There would be appeals ahead, predicted to take years. But for all intents and purposes, Vincent Castillo's story was over. Photographers and journalists bellowed their names, but all Bruno could hear was indistinct sound. As much as he wanted to silence the bastards, he had to take care of Sophia. Why won't you leave us alone? Sophia screamed at them. Sophia then grabbed both his arms and stared at him with tears in her eyes. I've lost him, Bruno. It's over. Bruno shook his head. Hush, he whispered, holding her close. This isn't the end. Sophia cried into his chest. I know you're hurting, but hear me, Sophia. This isn't anything you or I cannot heal from. Above them was a blank gray sky, an uncomfortable sky. When the two women were on their way, Bruno let out a long sigh. To make matters worse, the Castillo crime family was now more vulnerable than ever to attack. The ride back home that evening was almost unbearable. By the time he made it home, Castillo was incarcerated. Bruno would see him again, but never, ever see him again as a free man. An afternoon that officially marked the end of an era. Chapter 11 Too Evil to Ever Be Set Free Two days later, Bruno listened to the choking sound of his car engine as Tough Love by Kiss played in the background. Lying underneath the chassis of his car on a kid's skateboard was about the only escape he'd had since Castillo went down. He held back his emotions, but the truth was, he was still having a hard time accepting reality. So angry, so full of furious molten rage, it scorched his soul. He needed a few days to calm down after the shit that had gone down. If it wasn't bad enough that the boss had gone down for life, the trial had also been televised, shoved down the throats of the nation on every news channel. The local media made a three-part news series of the event, and the public ate it up with a spoon. Vincent Castillo's reputation had spun a 180 overnight. From Robin Hood of the Streets to City Scum. Branded a pathological liar, a manipulator, a serial killer. A monster too cruel to believe, too evil ever to be set free. The world before Bruno and the other cronies left behind blurred. It was almost unbelievable to think that 48 hours ago, the Castillo family was the greatest, strongest crime family in all of America. The name always carried a lot of weight to it. So much so, any one of his merry men could use the boss's connections for practically anything. Like a real-life golden key to the city. Smarter than hell, Castillo himself composed the framework of running a huge business, which everyone else in town revolved around. But now the boss was behind bars. Was the man Bruno admired worth anything at all? Bruno bit down hard, unconsciously grinding his teeth. The future was uncertain. Bruno De Luca and uncertainty didn't mix. Like the jerk, asshole, caveman, control freak he knew he was, he needed order, predictability, control. Especially control. It had been a quiet couple of days, and that only fueled his growing feeling that nobody was safe. He had to come to terms with the fact that Castillo was finished before he, too, wound up in trouble. 
He stared at his car, eyeing her like a mythical creature. Olive skin, slate gray eyes. At least no one knew where he lived, and he planned on keeping it that way. He didn't talk about his shit to anybody. Not his family, not his house, not his money, and most of all, nothing to do with the mob. The paparazzi had shadowed him everywhere but this place. Perhaps this would become a nightmare that would never end. One thing he knew for sure, the next few months were going to be hell. Bruno unscrewed a loose bolt with a spanner, wondering how the hell he was going to fix this mess. He had to do the right thing, and he believed the right thing was to make the rats who set Castillo up pay for what they did. Fuck. Bruno swore, as the bolt separated from the chassis, it free fell onto the ground and went rolling off beyond his feet. Motor oil spurted downwards onto the crotch of Bruno's blue overalls. Tugging a rag from his pocket, he stuffed it into the hole to stop the flow, long enough for him to get the hell out from under there. Rolling out from under the hood of the car, he threw both hands up. Well, she's fucked. He sighed and stared at the piece of junk. A small, banged-up black hatch he'd bought at a sweet price a few months back had turned out to be a not-so-sweet sort of a deal. A sweet pain in his ass was all that pile of scrap metal had been. Laying back down onto the skateboard in defeat, he immediately regretted sinking every dime he had into the vehicle he appropriately named Jackass. Bruno, honey, put those tools down and come inside. It's broken beyond repair. Nothing's going to fix that pile of trash, especially in your frame of mind. Annie's voice, cheery as usual, sounded from the front door somewhere behind him. Bruno tilted his head back over the end of the skateboard and found an upside-down view of his woman hanging in the doorway. He stared at her for a moment before saying anything, taking her in. She wore a crisp, buttoned shirt, tucked into a blue denim skirt and a warm smile. Her dark hair fell loose and free over her tits, wild, uninhibited. Everything about this woman screamed to his instincts. All right, I'll be in soon. She disappeared into the house without another word. Rocking forwards to an upright position, he wiped away the sweat gathering on his forehead with the cleanish back of his hand and decided she was more than right. Getting to his feet, he stepped out of his overalls and went inside. When he made it into the kitchen, he dropped his overalls onto the ground in front of the washer. He looked at his hands. His palms and fingernails especially had collected a dark layer of motor oil. Stopping across to the kitchen sink, he poured detergent into his hand, then sliding the kitchen tap to an on position, waited until he could see steam coming from the hot water out of the faucet. Only detergent and boiling water got oil stains out. Then, cupping his hands together, he scrubbed the coarse particles of detergent all over his hands and arms. Picking up the vegetable scrubber, he dug under his nails with the bristles and ground away viciously. His woman came up behind him. Annie wrapped her arms around his ribs and held him tight. You think I mind a bit of grease? Placing her cheek firmly to his back, she breathed deep the scent of oil from his body. She moaned low and sexy, clearly using the power she held over him. The power he both loved and hated her for. Don't fucking tempt me. Oh, is that so? Drying his hands on his jeans, he reached into his pocket and pulled out a rag, blackened with oil. Ever so gently, she took hold of his shoulders and massaged into the thick, tight muscles of his bunched-up tendons down to his shoulder blades. Immediately, his cock jerked in his pants, dancing to the tune of her touch. He groaned. Tell me what you want, Annie, he demanded. He spun around to meet her eyes and cradled her face in his hands, eyeing her like a mythical creature. Olive skin, slate gray eyes. Lowering his chin, he narrowed his eyes at her, daring her gaze to become unglued. I want you, he demanded. Her velvety lips twitched and she straightened her posture. For what? I'm claiming you. 
his voice husky, not taking his eyes from her. He smirked, trailing his calloused fingers through her shimmering hair. None of this decent bullshit. You know the rules. And girls who don't follow the rules, I have a responsibility to put a stop to it, he explained to her. He knew what she wanted. Nobody knew this woman like he did. She smirked, daring him with her silence to do something about it. He got close to her face until she could feel his own breath bouncing off her lips. An intense, burning silence stretched out between them. Turn around and put your hands on the kitchen table. Annie snorted a surprised laugh. I'm a grown-ass woman. Maybe I find your terms to be too stringent. She flipped her hair back over her shoulder with attitude and pointedly stared at him. The caveman roared inside of him. Spinning her around, he guided her safely forward and bent her over the table. This time, she didn't argue. Dropping his hand, he glided it sensuously over her butt cheeks, while his other hand undid his zipper and tugged his cock free. Then he forcefully thrust his cock of inky steel into her delicate frame. She screamed, but he didn't let go. Do I need to tie you up to get my fill of you? He growled lowly. Annie shook her head. He spun her around, crushing his lips to hers, not breaking his hold on her for a second as he led her to the living room. His lips locked with hers in a kiss, and he growled when she broke it. What do you expect, DeLuca? I've been mainlining the same poison the mob has fed you since the day we met. Bruno stared at her for a moment before he said anything. It broke his heart to see the hardened edge his woman had. Then let my poison be your remedy. He smothered her mouth with his lips. Her knees went weak like her insides had melted. He kissed her breathlessly, fiercely. Bruno spun her around, then firmly gripped her two ass cheeks and thrust into her from behind. She turned her head and flashed him pleading eyes, but Bruno shook his head, maintaining his militant thrusts. A cocky smirk curled from the corners of his lips as he reached out and grabbed her hair, tugging her head towards him until her ass bumped crazily against his groin. The muscles in his arms bulged under his hard flesh, his abs contracted, nostrils flaring as he pounded into her sweet core. The sexual tension in the air thickened as she pulled tight against his grip, turning back to stare at him, and Bruno stared back at her. You're mine, he declared in a harsh growl through gritted teeth. You're my woman. A triumphant smile spread across her face, one she couldn't hide as tears broke free from her eyes. Don't stop, baby, don't stop. Bruno's heat powered up, lit up inside him. He loved to watch as she moaned, begged, and screamed herself into orgasm. He pounded her harder, feeling her get wetter and wetter, as he vowed to make her come so hard she'd forget herself for a while. Over and over, he felt her tightness massage his cock, thrusting harder, claiming more of her. Finally, he released his tension into his woman, emptying it into her warmth. When he was done, Annie leaned close to his ear and whispered, Baby, I don't want you to worry anymore. Castillo will find a way out of this. He always does. She smiled faintly. Remembering the former boss's instructions, foregoing the boss's orders would be a terrible betrayal he couldn't live with. I gotta go make a call. He licked his lips, tasting the sweat from her skin. Annie sat up. Bruno, no. What did I say? Don't leave. Not now. Shrugging on his clothes, Bruno grinned and pecked his woman on the cheek, then disappeared through the door. You said nothing wrong, sweet Annie, nothing wrong. Take care of yourself, she called weakly after him. Moving swiftly to the phone, Bruno dialed the number for Frankie from the letter he got a couple days back from Castillo. When the other man picked up, the guy told him to drive south out of San Diego into Ramona so he could meet Castillo's accountant. Then Bruno called Marco to pick him up, 
and the two of them headed out towards the main street in Coronado, known as Main Street. They stopped to get gas at a 7-Eleven in town. While Marco filled the tank, Bruno stepped out to stretch his legs and felt the ground rumble beneath his feet. A tiny, ominous vibration humming through the concrete. Picking up on it, he glanced to the left and to the right, a sound getting louder, the sound of rising wind. Bruno leaned against the hood of his cousin's car and watched a storm of bikers pass by, hollering, whooping, howling with excitement, all of them riding past 80, only half wearing helmets. Bruno knew they were members of the Hell's Dragons MC by the black leather vests they wore. Three dozen or so it looked like, enough to get his interest, enough to rattle him. He growled as a can shot from under the tires of one bike into the windshield of Marco's vehicle, revving their bike engines to deafening levels. Real ones, not mopeds, big and heavy, gleaming in the late sun. Their bumpers bore the Hell's Dragon's tagline. Impossible is nothing on two wheels. Fucking bikers, the two men growled in unison. Bruno squeezed his fists together. Oh, that fucker just pushed the wrong goddamn button. We'd better check them out, he said, glaring in suspicion. Everyone knew about the dragons, but people rarely saw them. They worked at night, like Bruno, and that meant they had something to hide. They kept to their own social clubs, biker-owned clubs, like the mob had their own bars. You're right, Marco nodded but now's not the time to stir up shit. That's trouble we don't need, even if they are crew of nerve-grating, small-dicked bikers. It ain't worth it, Bruno. Swallowing down a shot of rage, he turned his head to his cousin, locking his gaze on his. You don't win by standing by. You win by taking fucking action. Those fuckers can't ride through our territory and fucking toss cans at us. Marco swore as he shook his head. He knew they wouldn't be meeting Castillo's man today. Taking a deep breath, he pulled the gas nozzle from his car and put it back in its holder. Okay, get in. Chapter 12 Fear is for the Weak Bruno stepped out of the car and narrowed his eyes. He would finally confront these shitheads who were riding around like they owned everything. From across the street, he stared toward the gated compound. The clubhouse building was modestly sized. A large patchwork wooden cabin in a poor state of repair like something out of Little Rascals. There were cabins behind the main building, and Bruno wondered what secrets were housed inside. He also spotted that one of the front gates had been left open. Crossing the street, he walked towards the front gate and Marco followed. When they heard the rumble of a bike engine approaching, they crouched behind a car parked up on the street and waited until it passed them. They crept close to the ground, around to the other side of the vehicle so as to not be seen as the biker pulled into the compound. When the engine shut off, they popped their heads up over the hood to look out over the dirt and gravel parking lot, lined with bikes. Bruno glared at the leathered man who just parked up at the head of the lineup, now kicking off his ride. When the biker removed his skull-painted helmet to show the sweaty mat of brown hair, Bruno frowned. Hard and shaggy, all lean and mean muscle, like a Doberman pincher. Leather covering every orifice of his body. As he looked at the man, Bruno felt a slow, creeping, icy chill of something surge through his veins, and it was a feeling he didn't like. Shit, there are some bastards who you need only take one look at to know you hate. Bruno glanced at Marco for a brief moment, as if to judge whether his thoughts matched his own. Marco pinned his cousin with a cold stare and smiled evilly. Like he was indeed reading the big man's thoughts, he shifted his glare to the biker who was heading inside and sneered, Bikers, they're like rats. You don't know exactly why you hate them. All you know is there's everything right about catching them by the tail, slicing it off, and taking pleasure in watching them bleed out. 
Studying the stranger as he walked into his clubhouse, Bruno felt his hands tighten into fists. He swore. Repulsive is what they are. Vermin dressed in black leather and patches their mama sewed onto their matching vests to make them feel special. Marco laughed, shaking his head. Come on, bro, they're not worth our time. Shifting his eyes to his cousin, Bruno cocked his head to the side. You're right, my brother, but my name is Bruno De Luca, son of Michael De Luca, a man of Vincent Castillo, mafia, before I even had hair on my balls. Marco scrunched up his nose. Bruno continued. I don't let shit slide with my own men, so you don't think I'm about to start now with a bunch of good-for-nothing hood rat bikers? Eyes kindling, he smiled proudly. Besides, we're Italians. Revenge is what we do best. He would teach them not to ride around in Castillo family territory. He snapped his head around to face the biker, but he was gone. Using the cover of the shadows, Bruno came out from behind the car and marched along the chain-link fence to the open gate. He peered inside, eyes darting, inspecting the place all over like a sensor-packed gun, searching for life. He knew his presence would no doubt trigger a code red with the MC. He scanned the area slowly. A bunch of bikes were parked up to the right. Harley-Davidson's, gleaming beasts of vehicles. Models all made in the last couple of years. If the number of bikes matched the number of men inside, twenty men were in that clubhouse. And yet, he could see no sentries, no lookouts. A clubhouse with wooden walls that wasn't guarded by men with guns? What kind of shitty-ass operation were they running here? Were they so brash, so cocksure to think nobody would dare come for them? Or were they all too weak? too afraid to defend what was theirs. Don't do this, not now, Marco's voice sounded behind him. Bruno didn't turn around. Marco scrambled after the big man. What are you going to do? He dared to ask, catching up to him. Bruno locked eyes with him and smiled cruelly. This is our territory he snarled quietly, and we've let those bitch-ass bikers ride our roads for far too long. Whatever I do will be fair and just in the eyes of the bylaws of the Castillo family, and by their own club rules for that matter. That is, assuming they have the integrity in their dumbass heads to live by them. He turned his gaze and lifted his foot to step inside. Shaking his head, Marco stepped in his path, I agree any punishment you send their way would be right and fair, but that doesn't mean you'll come out of this without a dime-sized hole in your skull. Brother, if blood is spilled, I don't want it to be yours. Something tells me it ain't going to be pretty if you or I go in there. Is your life really worth this standoff with a bunch of bikers? Bruno felt offended as all hell by this statement. Marco didn't understand. This was exactly why Bruno had to do this now. He wasn't waiting around for anyone to talk him out of it. Fear is for the weak. I have a responsibility greater than myself, a responsibility I am not afraid of. If Castillo were here, he'd bite those motherfuckers in half at the waist. On a huff, Marco turned back towards his car. Fuck this shit, I'm calling back up. You think I can't handle a few pretty boys in Hell's Angels costumes? Bruno growled quietly. Marco kept walking. Puffing out his chest, Bruno turned his bulldog on. Turn around and look at me, he barked in order. Marco stopped and turned, then opened his mouth to say something, but when he saw his expression, he closed it. Bruno flicked his gaze to the clubhouse and pointed a big, angry finger in its direction. Those men, they use words like honor, code, and loyalty as a goddamn punchline. They know nothing of the sacrifice it takes to honor those words. Men like us, who we are, we use those words as the backbone of a life spent defending something. I have zero tolerance for the so-called men who rise and sleep under the blanket of protection that we provide and then turn the middle finger on our authority. 
This isn't about a beer can hitting your window. This is about preserving what we've worked our asses off to be, everything we are, and everything we represent. Don't know about you, but I don't live a life of discipline, sacrifice, and unwavering loyalty to be disrespected by anybody. Least of all to a bunch of bums on bikes. For the choices they have made, those guys will pay. In this life and the next. Marco swallowed heavily. Okay, Bruno, I'll stand watch out here and cover you. If any more of them try to come in, I'll blast their wheels with bullets. He still had concern in his eyes, but he took a step back. If shit goes down in there, you call out and I'll bust you out of there, capiche? He insisted firmly. Bruno shrugged. Suit yourself. Marco didn't understand. Bruno may have never met the men in that clubhouse. Nonetheless, he saw them for what they really were, and that gave him an advantage that could not be beaten by any amount of manpower. Undoubtedly, those bikers in dragon vests, supposed outlaws, were just like every other tough guy Bruno had ever met. No matter how mean and ugly they looked, they would only ever be men who had adopted a life of darkness. Bruno was born in it, molded by it, and there is no amount of evil that could win against darkness itself. The big man turned and in his usual fearless-as-fuck style stomped right into the compound, glancing around. He wasn't stupid. He knew the threat within was very real, but he'd survived enough nightmares to know he could handle it. He glared directly at the makeshift clubhouse for a moment, preparing his mind to bring the Castillo family some justice. A huge sign above the door read, No dogs or Mexicans allowed. He raised a brow. Considering his own feeling for the cartels, this was something he didn't hate them for. Keeping both eyes on the clubhouse for any signs of movement, he felt in his pocket for a cigarette. In one flick of his wrist, he drew a smoke from its packet and flicked it up in a sideways helicopter spin to land between his teeth. Taking a deep draw, he raised his eyes to the gleaming black Harleys and studied the immaculate specimens, nothing like the rough and rugged men who rode them. His first thought was that these guys had money, that they couldn't hide. His next thought was that he would find out precisely how they were getting it. He studied the wooden clubhouse and cabins a hundred or so yards ahead. Only bikers would construct their hideout like a motherfucking house of sticks. Anyone could tear this place up without any problems. Or set it on fire and blow the place up. Now there was an idea to sit on for another day. Cigarette between his lips, he circled around to one side of the rickety old main building and looked for a way inside. Although windowless on the street-facing front of the clubhouse, at this side, he could see a small square window above his head. Looking around for something to stand on, he jogged over to one of the wood cabins and carefully dragged out one of the two steel trash cans that stood in front of the doors. Positioning it below the window, he climbed on top, feeling the domed lid compress into boot-size impressions of his shoes. He tugged a tissue from his pocket and wiped away the dust, then looked inside. The inside appeared to be condemned to a perpetual twilight. He couldn't see much. What he could see were people. Two large tables of men eating and drinking, passing plates and drinks back and forth between an adjoining room. He could hardly wait. Soon they'd be tasting all flavors of remorse and regret. Filled with vicious thoughts, Bruno narrowed his eyes and smiled wickedly. There's no hiding in the shadows from the man who's darkness himself. Hopping down, he snatched his cigarette from his lips and stubbed out the tip on the crushed lid of the trash can and set his mind to covertly getting inside. Wandering towards the rear of the clubhouse in search of a back entrance, he stopped abruptly in his tracks. Something wasn't right. He shot his eyes from left to right and noticed that the door to the cabin from which he'd tugged away the trash can was now ajar. Quickly and quietly, he snatched his handgun from his belt and backed into the shadows of the cabin wall. 
He couldn't hear anyone, but the signals from his instincts told him enough. Instincts honed to precision through years of training. On the count of one, two, three, whack! The big man's foot made a wreck of the door as he kicked it wide and took stock of what he saw through the crosshairs of his gun. Three rusty bikes, bales of hay in the left corner. Hay? This wasn't a goddamn barn. Bruno disappeared inside, hunting for answers. The room was silent, all but the shuddering cracks of the plywood floor as the soles of his shoes struck the old panels. When the drum of his footsteps stopped, he huffed. A tendril of irritation sent his foot slamming into the sturdy bale, and he stepped back when the ply crate that sat on top toppled down. As it hit the ground, its landing sounded with the uncertain clunk of loose floorboards. Hauling two enormous bales aside, he crouched to his knees and glanced for a moment at the open door. He leaned forward and placed an ear to the hardwood floor, then knocked three times. Hollow as a biker's skull, just as he'd suspected. Not wasting any time, he jumped up and swiped a screwdriver from the ground beside the bikes. He laid back on the ground, then rammed the flat edge deep into the gap between two wood panels. Levering it upwards, he used his other hand to tug the board up. Taking out his flashlight, he shone it down into the hole and smiled cruelly. Well, shoot the fucking sheriff. I've hit the motherfucking jackpot. He flashed the beam of light at a stash of knives and blades that were packed into two beer barrels, their tips stupidly facing upwards like pencils in a pot, sharp and eager to be used. A further four barrels were full to the top with guns of all kinds, different sizes, from different countries, and none of them matching, as if the bikers had created an armory out of police-seized weapons. Then against the back wall, Bruno saw a great mound of black Kevlar vests. Weapons, so that's their trade. Not for long, not in my town. The firm tapping of a foot sounded from the open doorway. When Bruno looked up, he squinted from his place in the darkness to the bright light of the outside to find three fine-looking women filling the gap. For a second, Bruno stared at them. Three blondes in an arrowhead formation, looking fierce as fuck and hot as smoking guns. Dressed in cowboy boots and oversized tees tucked into skin-tight jeans, they wore matching pouty expressions that said, We're the baddest bitches around here. They weren't afraid of him, that he could tell, and it was something he wasn't used to. Rare in men, unheard of in women. Inwardly, he laughed. He could hide from twenty bikers here, but not three women? Without a word, he rose slowly to his six and a half feet, allowing his eyes to roam greedily over their bodies. He knew all the women in town just as well as they knew him, but these three biker bitches he didn't know. Girls from out of town? The woman in the center crossed her arms over her chest to reveal a black and pink heart tattoo on her outer wrist, then stepped both feet into the cabin. You got anything you want to say, stranger? Her voice had a lovely southern ring that Bruno knew he wouldn't forget. A blend of Georgian and a little appellation. What's your name, woman? He demanded. She gave no reply. Her two companions stepped out of the shadows to join her inside. Stomping right up to the three babes, he narrowed his eyes. Up close, Bruno noticed embroidered names proudly displayed across the pockets of their shirts and grinned as he rattled off their names in his mind. Candy Cane, Teacup, and Saskia. Stupid-ass monikers. Licking the grin from his lips, he tried to hold a serious expression together. Listen, sweetheart, why don't you just let me pass so I can have a chat with your prince here and fetch me a drink of something cold? The three women laughed in unison. Bruno frowned, feeling like he'd just fallen on the outside of an inside joke. Teacup, the shortest and younger chick of the three, killed her laughter and looked the big man dead in the eyes. No offense, dude but you can go and suck a bag of big dicks if you think I'm pouring a drink for any man but my own. 
she barked, shoving a tiny hand into his big chest. Bruno's eyebrows shot up, his mouth fell open. This sort of rude insubordination was nothing like he'd ever heard in a woman. Do you know who you're talking to, woman? You can tell me your name, but I doubt I'll remember it, she shrugged. Never stopped you before, Candy Cane quipped, and all three of them laughed harder this time. Bruno growled. What's wrong, you big baby? Don't you like to play? The third girl remarked. Then, before Bruno could even so much as turn his gaze to her, she'd closed the gap between them. As his eyes met hers, Candy's warm, sweet-to-sugar breath tickled his chin, engorged fat lips appearing like they were swollen. Bruno shook his head and pushed her away. It did no good. Plunging her lips into his, she kissed him fast, hard, deep. He should have pulled away, but when he didn't, she slowed down, her soft mouth melting into his. He knew it was wrong, but the kiss was a total mindfuck, their tongues and lips dancing to the beat of their own instinctive drummer, wild and uninhibited. When his thoughts had numbed and the world had stopped, silenced around them, it was too late for him to crawl back to any self-control. Poking his tongue deep into her mouth, he felt her tongue retreat. Her lips drew back over his tongue like she was sucking on a popsicle. The soft porcelain of her pearly little teeth caressing his tongue to the top and then back again. And then, ah, he growled with a pain that was sharp and quick as he hissed until she pulled her teeth out. Bruno groaned as his mouth filled with the irony taste of blood. The salt in his saliva burned as it pooled in his mouth, then he spat it out. The saliva being tinged with his blood stained her white shirt with a pinkish color. Dropping her eyes down to her blood-stained shirt, she raised her gaze to meet Bruno's burning dark eyes, then declared, Let's do this. At once, the three of them had the big man surrounded, squatted slightly at the knees, arms out. When Bruno saw their fingers twitch, he knew they meant business. His bleeding mouth dropped open a split second before all hell broke loose. In the most perfect combination of beauty and violence, they blew up on him. What the fuck? Bruno thundered, right before two of them launched themselves onto his back like crazed baboons. No one comes snooping in our club and gets away with it. Bruno backpedaled, stealing what little footing he had left reclaiming his stance as he swiped at his bloody mouth. Like a stripper without a pole, Candy Kane whirled a double 360, gathering speed, then breaking to a stop with an elbow in his stomach, knocking the wind out of him. With his eyes closed, he doubled over. The big man moaned as he straightened. Oh, shit. Reaching in his pocket, he got out $300 bills and flung them in the air. We don't want your money, big man. Forcefully, Candy Cane smacked him across the face. Yeah, we're biker bitches, and we're not afraid of you, the shortest one blurted triumphantly. Profanities shot through the air. Punches shot into his body. Take it, pussy. She socked him as hard as she could. How'd you like that? Fuck yeah. They laughed manically. Crazy like chihuahuas on crack, kicking, hitting, slapping the shit out of him. Tell me what you want, Candy growled. I won't lay a hand on you women. No real man hurts a woman. He didn't stand for violence against females, even if they were smart-ass little biker bitches who didn't know their place. Shame on them, bitches. Bruno's cheek kissed her knuckles. Take it, motherfucker. He didn't react, not until Saskia went to kick him in the nuts and Bruno blocked it. That was a no-go. He raised his arms to protect his face and neck. They struck his forearms. The blows didn't hurt, more annoying than hurtful, but they wouldn't stop. The big man didn't want to hurt them. When one of them jumped on his arm, Bruno gave her a shove. The push took her completely off her feet, and she flew back out five feet before she landed on her ass with a growl. The other two kicked at him, screaming now. What do you think you're doing, asshole? You can't hurt a woman like that. You don't hit women, remember? We know your kind, 
and we won't stand for it. Shit, now I've really pissed the other two off. I didn't hit her, Bruno yelled back. I did not, but if you don't leave me alone, I might. The short woman marched over to the rusty bikes and pulled a baseball bat out of the saddlebags. The first Bruno knew about it was when a biting pain hit him in the bicep. Gasping, he grabbed for the bat instinctively, but missed. The bat sure did make up for their lack of strength and hurt a lot more than just their hands. The other two threw in a few kicks to his legs for good measure. Bruno held his left hand to his right arm. Real biker bitches would have just slapped the shit out of me. You three are maniacs, he groaned. He was hurt, but he still didn't hit back. That's it. Bust him open like a piñata and see what falls out. Candy Cane spat a wad of saliva on his boot. Bruno was shocked. He managed to get one slap in, but when the woman backed up, she had a trail of blood on her face where the slap busted her lip. Instead of retaliating, she marched up to him and kissed him, smearing the blood all over Bruno's mouth. Bruno took a step back, shocked by her actions, but she just sneered at him. Motherfucker. You're hard-ass chicks. If we weren't, we'd be dead already, the tall woman said, and the other two nodded. Candy? A voice sounded from the doorway. The three girls spun around. You girls okay? The three of them stepped aside to reveal Bruno's raging face. When Bruno saw a male figure, he called out, You, get your women under control. Stepping into the barn with a red toolbox in his hand and a rag over his shoulder, the man narrowed his eyes at Bruno. He was young, looked like a prospect, wore a vest on over his own, but no patch and no leathers. Run along, kid. Bruno sneered as he pushed his way past and shut the four of them inside, securing the door with two trash cans and the toolbox. Walking around to the front of the premises, he looked over to where Marco was hiding and gave him a small nod. As he went right up to the main entrance to the Dragon's Clubhouse, it occurred to him that if Castillo knew what he was about to do, he would have been in the doghouse for a very long time. Castillo wasn't here. No one fucking owned him anymore. He stomped around to the main doors and gave both handles a tug. Locked. But he could hear the bikers inside. To hell with it. Bruno wasn't a man to knock at the front door and wait like a friendly neighbor with chocolate chip cookies. Fuck no. These pussy-ass bikers need to learn who this town really belongs to. He drew his gun and prepared it by pulling back the slide. Aiming the muzzle at the lock, he clicked the safety off. Boom. He blew the lock off. Chipped wood blasted into his body and face. Swiping a fragment of wood from his shirt, he raised his foot and sent a killer I-don't-give-a-shit kick, and the door busted open wide. Without hesitation, he stepped his two big feet inside to be greeted with twenty loaded pistols at his face. Put down your weapons now if you want to keep your motherfucking teeth. Bruno's low baritone echoed through the room as he glared around at everyone. Their snickers and smug-ass smiles told Bruno they didn't care for shit who he was. The place was dark, stuffy, and humid. A sweltering rat hole, more like a prison. Their clubhouse was a makeshift affair, musty and outdated, containing a huge table, buckets of biker equipment, a shitty bar. The big man walked slowly into the center of the semicircle of biker-blooded guys that had formed around him and gazed at the men of the Hell's Dragons MC. Apparently, they hadn't heard his warning. My name is Bruno De Luca. Now one of you stupid-ass motherfuckers threw a beer can into my cousin's car. It hit the windshield. Now the way I see it, either you were rolling stoned or you really are stupid as you look. Because this is my town, and I've got an arsenal of men more dangerous than anything you know. Wanted men in more states than you can count on your two hands. Pow! A shot fired at his feet. You're mistaken, my bitch. 
Bruno threw back his head and laughed, jerking his head sharply to the perpetrator. He knocked the gun out of his grip and brutally blasted him in the shoulder with a single round. Ah! The man fell down in agony. Nobody touch him, Bruno thundered. As I said, my name is Bruno De Luca, and you ain't talking your way out of this shit. Anyone else pulls a stunt like that, and every last one of you will be taught the lesson you won't forget, you hear? The tension in the air rose by at least ten degrees. If you shoot me, Bruno continued, an army of very bad, very twisted men will come back here and kill every one of you men and your families. They will die. Their blood will be on your hands, not mine. The men glanced at each other and then backed up a bit. And why the hell should we believe you? An older man to his left growled. Pacing right up close to the man, Bruno countered. Can you afford not to? He gazed at the man with fire in his eyes. Holding a stony expression, he glanced around at the cautious faces in the room. Drop the weapons and hit the ground he ordered, gesturing to the floor with the muzzle of his gun. Everyone looked around at each other again. Then, one by one, the bikers lowered their weapons. He counted twenty weapons touched the ground before he stepped forwards. Now, which one of you is the prez? Before anyone could reveal or not reveal who the club president was, a deep, grumbly voice barked from somewhere off to the left. What business do you have here, Mr. DeLuca? Bruno raised a brow and looked over to where the voice had sounded. He couldn't see anyone because of the darkened shadows, however. I ask you a question. Do not disrespect me in my own house. What the fuck is this all about? The man's voice was growing closer, and so were his footsteps. Bruno growled. Face me like a man, and I'll show you the respect a man deserves. Out of the shadows stepped a big man, fat, not muscular. A body of marshmallow rather than stone squeezed like sausage meat into skinny black jeans and a grubby white shirt. The stranger met Bruno's eyes and raised his brow. What the fuck is this all about? He repeated his demand, voice cold and impatient. You heard me before. I demand to know why your men are just parading around our territory, spinning their goddamn wheels. The name's Wolf, and I am president of the Hell Dragons. You come up in my club acting like you matter. Lifting his gun from the waist of his jeans, he marched straight over to Bruno. He was twice the size of Big Bruno, nearly twice his age, and carried with him the stench of stale beer, cigarettes, and grease. A badass motherfucker, tattooed all over with a scary face and gold in his teeth. But it would take a lot more than that to scare Bruno. He'd been taught image meant very little. People only showed others what they wanted them to see. It often said more about what a person was trying to hide. DeLuca was a killer if you judged him by his eyes. Bruno glanced briefly at the bikers and then back to the stranger in his face. These were no killers. They were actors, wannabes, right down to their fat, hairy toes. Bruno lowered his gun and, clicking the safety on, slid it into his belt. This is a matter of honor for me, and the man who threw this at my cousin's car will do his time. From under his coat, the big man produced a blue and gold beer can and held it in the prez's face. The other man glared down at the empty can and then raised a brow. You want to know why I'm here? Bruno stated. I'm here to put a stop to this shit. The man swore. I know who you are, Spawn of Castillo, and matter of honor to you is of no interest to me. Bruno growled. If you know who I am, then you know what harm I can do. He puffed out his chest. You little man, bust down my door. No fucking shit. He cleared his throat. You bust down my door and shoot a man that belongs to me. He gritted in a voice made of steel. 
A flesh wound, a shot fired in defense, Bruno roared. The man shook his head. Men as stupid as that don't live long in this world. They're shot in the back of the head. As for this army of killers you have at your disposal, the man drew in a mocking breath. Well, with Castillo locked up in the joint, it looks to me like you and your mob men don't quite carry the weight you used to. Bruno's lips tightened in rage. Taking out his gun, he pointed it at the other man's groin. Multiple guns cocking in all directions surrounded him. Bruno's gaze remained locked on the prez as twenty guns were pointed at his skull. He didn't even glance around, didn't look at them. The prez raised a hand to his men, signaling to their hold fire. From here on out, you'll answer to me, Bruno barked. This is my town now, and I don't want or need your kind of trouble around here. Wolf scoffed, glancing to the men to his left and his right. Or what? You're nothing, DeLuca, mob scum with not an inch of authority you claim to have. You will comply. If you do not, I'll have no mercy. Wolf frowned as he thought about it, as he paced, circling Bruno slowly. See, that's what you mob don't understand about us bikers. We do this for the freedom. You take away that, and you take away the one thing we want most. You take away our freedom, and we don't have a life worth living. Bruno scoffed. I would rather bleed out than stand here and talk about your feelings, bitch. Wolf growled. Now this is how it's gonna go down. I'll pay to fix your man's motherfucking windshield, and you'll pay for shooting my man with something else. Bruno laughed, shaking his head. That's an order, not a question, Wolf roared. He spat a wad of saliva on Bruno's shoe. Bruno's blood simmered. Do not disrespect me, little man. He took a step forward. Wolf shook his head. Leave now, stay out of our way, and we'll stay out of yours. Bruno could see the man's point, but wouldn't give him the satisfaction of letting him know. He was a soulless, amoral bastard, but Bruno could tell he was speaking his truth. Wolf stopped speaking for a moment, then went over to his chair in the corner and sat down. The hell dragons will never answer to mafia blood. Not while there's a breath left in my body. You want to run this, MC? You're gonna have to kill me. Bruno held back his impending laugh. Just then, the clip-clop of heeled boots sounded behind him. Bruno looked over his shoulder to find the three, hot as they were nuts, blondes, strutting into the room, faces twisted in anger. Holy fucking shit. Wolf looked at his women and then grinned at the cut on Bruno's lip. Nice work, Candy, he said. When she came across the room to sit with Wolf, she raised her head to glare at Bruno. She smiled at him. Thanks, baby. Bruno shook his head. I wasn't gonna hurt them. Candy growled something nasty. Could've fooled me, shithead. The two others pranced across the floor, lighting up their smokes as they walked. Wolf shot up from his seat. Bruno noted the man clutching his fists, preparing to strike. You touched my women. The prez who can't control his women. Fucking A. Sit your big biker ass down. Wolf glared at him. And why would I fucking do that? Bruno scoffed a partial demonic laugh and drew a second gun from the back of his belt, then, in one quick motion, cocked both guns at his sides. Sighing forcefully, Wolf took his seat. Now listen up. Everyone in the room stared at him with wide eyes. I got a couple of things I need to say to you fellas and pain in the ass over here. From here on out, you answered to me. Do as I say, and you'll live. Do as I say, and you'll keep your freedom. I want an association with your club. The deal is, I keep you guys safe, leave you alone, but when I call, you come running. Am I clear? Bruno took his time staring into the eyes of everyone in the room, then met Wolf's gaze and held it. And how the hell am I supposed to do that? 
Bruno shrugged. That's not my problem, it's yours. The sound of gunshots erupted from outside and everyone rushed towards the door. It was a motherfucking shitstorm. Eight bikers shooting at Marco crouched below an electrical box. Jesus fucking Christ, muttered Bruno. Rage morphed his features. Anger rode him hard. Sprinting toward the Harleys, he crouched behind the nearest bike and fired six rounds in their direction. He noticed the keys were still in the ignition. He stood up, straddled the ride, and tore out into the parking lot. No word of a lie, he'd never ridden a motorcycle before in his life, but he could handle it. Bruno, duck, Marco bellowed. Suddenly, a barrage of gunfire attacked as the bikers fired blindly at him. He kept his head low, praying he wouldn't be hit. Bullets pinged off the Harley and the ground. Bruno stormed right for them. As he came closer, full acceleration engaged. The bikers dove out of the way. Hey, that's my ride, Wolf shouted as Bruno skidded past, making a turn for the gates. No shit, Bruno growled, his voice made of steel. He blazed away, his middle finger swung in the Prez's direction, giving him the big F you. Fucking pussy wolf should be thankful Bruno didn't kill anybody, only because he was feeling merciful. Wolf kept roaring with instinct bellows. Bruno glanced into the wing mirror. That little bitch could suck his big fat cock. Meanwhile, from the doorway of the clubhouse, the horny biker bitches cooed at the dream brought to life. Six foot six of pure feral power, sex on two wheels. A man who took their blows and never hurt them either. Blood hot as a gun, he stormed through the open clubhouse gate and screeched up to Marco. Come on, you're riding, bitch, he said, hooking his thumb over his shoulder to the seat behind him. With a growl and a look of utter disgust, Marco mounted the Harley behind Bruno and held him around his waist. They hit the pavement and put some serious miles between themselves and the Hell's Dragons. Yippee, motherfucker, Marco yelled. Bruno sped away and felt his mission was a success. Stealing a bike had never been his intention, but making his point was. He didn't fear the danger coming for him. No, he fucking welcomed it. Chapter 13 The Dead End Bruno rode the shadows as he sped away from the compound with wrath in his eyes and twelve angry bikers on his tail. Yells and profanities echoed behind him, drawing closer. He glanced in his wing mirror and sneered. Much as he'd love to take those bastards down with his white-knuckled fists, much as he'd relish slicing off their balls with a shot of his gun, he couldn't do that. Not now. Not in broad daylight. Not when the streets were peppered with women and innocents who could get caught in the crossfire. Storming through back streets and residential areas even he didn't know well, he hoped he could shake them. It wasn't working. Coming out on the main road, he peeled into traffic. Fuck. Honing in on their target, the thundering rumble of the biker's engines were getting louder, hungrier by the second. Bruno zigged crazily through traffic with only his left hand as he held his gun in his right. Just ahead, to his left, Bruno's eyes narrowed on a small opening between two tall hotel buildings, too narrow for a whole pack of bikers to move through at speed, then calculated his next move. Veering left into what he guessed was a side alley to an adjacent street, dark and empty, he inhaled sharply as he skidded to an abrupt halt in front of a dead end. A growl erupted from his lips. Just my motherfucking titty-sucking luck. Knowing that any moment now they'd be caught between a wall and a crew of angry bikers, Bruno rolled behind a large garbage container for cover and killed the engine. In moments, he'd pulled out a gun, cocked and ready to fire. What the fuck are you doing? We gotta go, urged Marco, panting like mad. Bruno remained calm resolute, focused solely on what needed to be done. Pull out your weapon, 
When you see them coming down here, fire like mad. I've got 50 rounds on me. That should be enough to put fear into them. So long as they don't get down here, they can't touch us. He stared at his cousin with hardened eyes. Marco glared at the mouth of the alley and swore. Fuck it. He jumped off the bike and prepared his gun by pulling back the slide. Bruno kicked off the Harley and slung down the stand. Both men squatted behind the trash container with the entrance of the alley in their sights and listened patiently for sound. It was difficult to tell which direction the bikes were coming from. All they knew was that they were close. The yells, the profanities, had vanished from the air, but the engine still rumbled carnivorously over the midday traffic. They waited, expectant. Five seconds. Ten seconds. But no shouting, no bikers. Bruno frowned. Where's the fucking cavalry? Bruno snapped, the silent tension driving him crazy. Minutes passed, and the sounds were becoming more and more difficult to distinguish. Then the noise level had dropped so suddenly, it took him a moment to realize they could hear nothing at all. We're wasting our time. They're not here, Marco grumbled. Hush. Bruno raised a hand, silencing him. Sensing a trap, he walked cautiously out from behind the garbage can and towards the mouth of the alley, eyes panning the area. Engines sounded from the left and right, but the sound of bikes was gone. Retrieving a mirror from his pocket, he looked to either side to see that the bikers were not waiting outside, then made his way back to Marco. When he signaled to Marco it was safe, the two of them mounted the Harley. Stay alert, they're up to something, Marco cautioned. Bruno nodded curtly. Let's get this bike out of sight. Igniting the engine, Bruno waited a few seconds to see that the Hell's Dragons didn't appear when he rolled slowly forwards, the bike emerging from the alley. He pulled out, and turning onto the main road, he looked to his left and right, then grinned slightly. The bikers were nowhere in sight. Revving the engine, he blazed down the side roads beside Coronado's main street. Bruno wore a dark, cold grin. He'd just shaken that whole MC. As he rounded the corner onto the main street, Marco's big finger appeared over his shoulder, urgently pointing towards the pavement. Bruno's eyes popped when he saw a cluster of bikers pulled over at the side of the road. He rolled up onto the pavement on the other side of the road and rode in the cover of the parked cars, dodging the eyes of the lines of pissed-off bikers. He stared at them for just a moment, and that was when he noticed the flashing blue lights of two blue and white sedans and four cops checking their licenses. His lips curled into a smile. I never thought I'd be happy to see the cops. At least the jerks got what they deserved. Dropping down onto the street, Bruno picked up speed and headed for Castillo's hideout. Jeez, that was fucking lucky, yelled Marco in his ear. Karma really is an ugly bitch. Bruno's volcanic laugh erupted from his lungs. Then he looked over his shoulder at his cousin. Lucky for them, you mean. Keep your eyes on the road. You damn near got us killed back there, Marco snarled. Fuck that. I'm not a force that gets killed. I'm a force that people feel, Bruno growled. I had to see inside that place for myself. Besides, I got us out alive, didn't I? Marco scoffed. That Prez is a tough customer. They don't call him the wolf for nothing. And he's tied in with the Red Riders from L.A. Bruno huffed. I'll worry about that when the time comes. My only hope is to seize their weapons before they get a chance to hide them. He raced victorious down the highway at 80 miles per hour and smiled faintly at the thought of what he'd just done. He'd shown them their place, and it didn't matter that they didn't want it. They'd take the place they deserved, under Bruno's thumb. A snicker followed that thought. Not that taking on an entire MC had been as difficult as it sounded, Bikers were nothing but men babies on Harleys playing dress up, right? Bruno, however, well, he wore no helmet, no leathers, no patch, 
And yet, he was more of a man, more of a biker than those jokers claimed to be, and he knew it. Bruno wondered, what if his father had been prez of an MC rather than a mob boss? Would he have grown to be as big of a dumb fuck pussy as those guys? A shiver licked down his spine at the horrendous thought. For now, he was satisfied that the Hell's Dragon's MC would no longer be a threat to them. They had proved themselves to be as useless as they looked. As for the weapons they were dealing in, he'd bring that up with the mob council. He would have to wait and see what they would decide. When they reached the docks, he gazed around as he always did, always alert for the first sign of trouble. Looking over to Castillo's warehouse up ahead, he could see a cluster of guys outside, but he couldn't tell if they were his own or outsiders. When he heard the alarm going wild from the clubhouse, he zeroed in on the men scrambling to their vehicles outside and sank his teeth into his bottom lip. Bruno swore, You gotta be shitting me. Nobody saw the two of them roll up. Leave them to me, growled Marco, and Bruno let him off his ride. You go inside and check for any others. Marco hopped off the Harley, gun in hand. Giving Marco a curt nod, his fingers tightened around the handlebars and he raced around the back. Bruno killed the engine in the parking lot and glared at the hideout, wondering what the hell was going on. Since there weren't any windows on this side of the building, he could only guess at what was happening inside. When a gunshot fired, he knew that men were still inside and his heart froze for a moment in his chest. As he listened, the rage inside of him rose. Not on my watch, motherfuckers. He dismounted his ride and scurried across to the building. Concealed in the shadows of the walls, he made his way around the side. His gaze scaled the vast metal walls and then dropped to a small window at his feet. He groaned and rubbed his calloused fingers over his chin. There was only one way in if he wanted to stand a chance of not being seen, and he was staring right at it. He searched inside his pocket and pulled out his house keys which held a small pocket knife. Flicking it open, he raised the tiny blade up to eye level and ran his thumb along the blade. It drew no blood. It was blunt, but it would have to do. Jacking the window open with the blade, he removed his jacket and squeezed through the window into Castillo's basement study and dropped six feet to the ground. Landing on two feet, he held out his gun and looked around. The basement office was dark and quiet. A vicious cacophony of gunfire sounded above his head. He looked up. Quickly and quietly, he stalked in the darkness, then paused just outside the closed door and listened for a moment. He heard the roar of people upstairs and wondered how many of his men were down. Then, turning the doorknob, he opened the door just a fraction enough to peer through the crack at the gym outside. As the door opened, the noise from upstairs attacked him. He stuck his head out and looked around. It was empty. All seemed clear in the basement as he moved quietly into the next room. He crept cautiously out of the room and through the gym area, then slowly up the winding stairs to where the show was unfolding. When his gaze reached the top of the stairs, he looked across to find that all hell had broken loose. Shots and chaos echoed around him. Six of his own men were there that he could count, and nearly double that amount of intruders wearing black balaclavas. Bruno ground his teeth, holding back a fierce growl. Their home was being overrun, and his men were letting it happen. He tiptoed up the steps, gun held ready. He could hear the voice of the man in charge and moved slowly towards it. They had all his guys bunched together like sheep. When he saw two of his men duck back into the shadows, his blood boiled. Seriously? Suddenly, all fire halted. It was a stalemate. Both sides yelling at the other to put down their weapons. Nobody was so foolish. One wrong move and it would be carnage, but Bruno knew he had the element of surprise on his side. 
He spotted the man in charge once he ran across his line of sight, ordering the others around. As he stood calling the shots, Bruno crept up on the unsuspecting man from behind and held him in a chokehold. What's your name, dumbass? He fiercely questioned, rage growing by the second. What the hell do you want, Castillo scum? Do you have a death wish? The balaclava-covered boss man snarled. The whole room went silent. Bruno didn't fear the wrath of the intruders with their boss's body as a human shield in front of his own. Tilting his head, Bruno stared him in the eyes. I don't want you here, that's for sure. You're not welcome. But since you are, there's something I need you to know. Everyone froze at the declaration. Everyone but the ballsy boss, squirming and growling as his face turned pink-purple. This place is ours now. We're here to take what's ours, he interrupted. Castillo is gone. His son is gone. Face it, sucker. The Castillo crime family is not just weak. It's finished. He cackled manically through his teeth. Hell to the no. Bruno ground his jaw, his anger at an all-time high. The hell you will. Fuck you, bitch, the man choked out. Pow! Bruno growled as a gunshot fired past his head. Tightening his grip on the boss's neck, he looked up to see four guys with their guns aimed at his body. Instantly, his eyes hardened to iron, and he knew what he had to do. Slowly, he looked up to meet the eyes of everyone in the room. I only killed to protect what's mine. This place is mine, Bruno thundered. In one savage crack, he suddenly pistol-whipped the man across the head, then dropped the semi-conscious man to the ground. On impact, the man's head dropped sickeningly to the side. Bruno opened fire with a semi-automatic in each hand. In a succession of echoing booms, four rounds fired into the four men who had their guns aimed at his head. They were launched back several feet onto the ground. Bruno reacted with a bored professionalism, watching their blood flow out onto the floor calmly and then stepping over, not around the man at his feet. He walked into the center of the room. He rotated his head, allowing his experienced eyes to take everything in. My name is Bruno DeLuca, and I have no problem, not one, with killing each and every one of you. His eyes trailed across the faces of the men left standing, then down to the men sprawled out on the floor in front of him. Grunts, groans, and whimpers from all four of the men permeated the air as Bruno turned his attention away from them to those with their feet still on the ground. Bruno stared down each man individually and then announced to everyone, If you want them, come and claim them. Clean up and disappear before the cops show, he demanded. You can take them all, but him, Bruno growled, glaring at the boss. For a moment, nobody moved. At his word, those left standing took hold of their men by the arms and legs, then hauled them away from Bruno, gunning it towards the door. The last man out the door, tall, skinny, with all the confidence of youth, stopped in the open doorway and turned around, gazing back at his boss who was being tied to a chair. He stepped back into the room, then locked eyes with Bruno. Bruno gave a slow, reproachful nod of his head and gave him raised eyebrows as if to say, give it a try. The man halted. Blade, who was standing by the door, shoved the kid outside. When the door slammed shut, Bruno dropped his guns but kept them at the ready. He glanced to his left as two of his men pulled the man up and set him down on a wooden chair. Scanning the area for anyone that could be hiding, he moved cautiously around the room and confirmed the area was secure. Clicking on the safety, he slid the guns back into his belt and went back into the main room where his mob brothers were gathered. He went over to the man they'd taken prisoner, hands and feet tied to a chair. For a moment, Bruno just stared at the unconscious man. Then, slowly, methodically, he began to search him. 
He turned all his pockets inside out, looked at his clothing labels, then stared long and very hard at a California driver's license with Lucia's picture on it. He expertly examined the machine gun when a clunking sound coming from somewhere behind him, downstairs, attracted his attention and he spun, already reaching for his revolver. Crossing the room, he went down the stairs and into the study. The only light was coming from the main room, so Bruno clicked on the light switch. The light came on to reveal a mess. The filing cabinet was flung across the floor, drawers pulled out, papers everywhere. Bruno felt his blood pressure rise. They had done this. On closer inspection, he saw that the safe was open. That's when he saw that the boss's picture was out of place, smashed on the ground. Taking himself over to the safe, he opened the door and reached inside. Castillo's money was gone, and an ace of diamonds playing card was in its place. He grasped the card tightly in his hand, crushing it into a ball. The culprits were mafia for sure. His senses told him that much. Shit. Shit. Double shit. Reaching out, he clasped his hand around the freestanding lamp by the door and flung it against the wall, then punched a hole into the plaster. Footsteps sounded from upstairs. Marco came up to him then and lay a controlling hand on Bruno's shoulder. It won't do any good, Bruno. Fuck, we really dodged a smoking gun tonight. Nobody's hurt. That's what's important. This place is ours. Bruno stared at the playing card, formulating a plan. We'll go now. We'll kill every last one of them and take back what's ours. He stepped forward. Marco stopped him. No, Bruno. Our men need to regroup, and you need time to calm down. After this blows over, they'll think they are safe, lower their guard, and that's when we'll go for our money. Until then, we must be patient. Bruno locked eyes with his cousin. For once, he did not have an answer. He hesitated a moment, fighting his instincts before finally turning to go. Back upstairs, Bruno marched over to the bar and poured himself a double whiskey. He cupped his fingers around the glass and felt the simmering blood beneath his skin cooling against the glass, then closed his eyes for a moment. Tossing it down the hatch, he let out a slow breath as the alcohol burned the back of his throat. As his eyes flicked open, he slammed his glass down on the bar and shook his head, wondering, had he been too merciful by sparing those men's lives? Had he failed in his duty to his former boss? In the eyes of the Castillo crime family, they deserved death. Death and no mercy. If he had killed them, he'd have felt no remorse. Never did. When a man broke the rules of the streets, he would have to accept the punishment that would come of it. Bruno always did what he felt he had to do for the greater good of his mob brothers, and yet at that moment he had to ask himself whether he was becoming weak. He kept his eyes on everyone in sight. The Castillo family had lost the fear they could invoke in others. Inwardly, he vowed to get it back at any cost now. Bruno stood with his back to the wall and watched everyone. Shaking his head, he felt ashamed. Castillo's men had been so stupid he could hardly believe it. They were pathetic. A lead weight dropped into his stomach. He'd never had this feeling before and wasn't sure he wanted it now. This was all his fault. He'd been selfish, taken his eye off the ball for far too long, and in doing so, made a big mistake. Thinking about it some more, the big man took out a comb from his suit pocket and raked back his hair. The atmosphere was in a state of constant tension. Thankfully, only two men from their side had died tonight. He'd gotten at least six of theirs. Did that make it even? Fuck no. Bruno began to pace. Damn them. Damn them to hell. He knew he would have to hunt them down when the time was right.
He stomped forward and shouted, Who was supposed to be on lookout? The room remained tense and silent. I asked you a question, he growled. Who was on lookout? He repeated, the rage inside him overpowering everything else. The men's shoulders deflated, and two guys stepped forward. It was me, one guy blurted sincerely. Frowning, Bruno tipped his head to the side as if to confirm who it was. Immediately, he had to reel in the urge to let off steam. You made a fatal mistake, brother. Not one I can overlook. You got lazy, cocky. In this line of work, you can't do that without paying the price, kid. The man's skin paled as the blood drained from his face. It was my fault, too, another man confessed. Bruno stared at the men for a long moment then frowned. He hated cowards, and he'd met too many of them to count in his line of work. I'm assuming because they made it inside here, Mitch and Bull are dead? The two men had been patrolling the grounds today. The two men nodded. One of them spoke. They'd been killed, killed before we had a chance to stop it. We're sorry. They both bowed their heads. Bruno threw back his head and laughed at them. Really fucking cute. What, are we in eighth grade over here? He asked, looking around. Apparently, they needed a lesson, and they would get one. They had a beating coming. Listen up, little girls. I don't know what idiocy caused you to leave your posts, but this right here shows me all I need to know. It shows me you aren't the men I once knew. He stopped mid-speech to glare into the eyes of every man in the room. I'll live and die for this family. I expect you guys to do the same, he declared. We've got to keep our heads above water, you hear? He bellowed, screaming by the time he finished his rant. We know, one of the pair muttered, still looking down. Bruno's lips tightened into a straight line, burning, seething with rage. You're lucky I'm not going to hurt you. Not yet. Looking disgusted as he spoke. No one else needs to die here today. If Castillo were here, your time on this planet would have just run out. I should shoot you down and leave you where you drop. But for the good of this crime family, I'm not gonna do that. So, you'll live. Then he paused. I'll keep you alive, but you'll get the shit jobs from now on, and you better not leave either. You'll have to live with yourselves the rest of your lives knowing you could have stopped this from happening. Bull and Mitch's blood is on your hands. It may not have been your bullet that killed him, but your mistakes caused their demise. He had no intention of killing his own men, but put the fear in them he would. Marco took a step forward. Do you know how much they've stolen from us? About three million dollars, Bruno told him. Marco coughed, choking on his spit. What? He croaked. A loud collective gasp echoed all the way around the room. To keep himself from running his pissed-off mouth any longer, he turned and stomped towards the man in the chair. He pulled his gun out, and before Marco could stop him, he put a bullet into his head. Damn it, Bruno, Marco yelled. We needed to find out who he was. Bruno let out a cold laugh as his rage abated only a bit. Look at his license and his credit cards. I know who he is. Many pairs of wide eyes followed Bruno De Luca as he passed them. Clean the place up like nothing ever happened. Then lock up when you're done. I'll see you all at 10 a.m. sharp tomorrow. He swung the door wide, disappearing outside. When the door closed, everyone let out the breath they'd been holding. You heard the man clean up, Marco snarled. A few minutes later, Marco met Bruno outside. Bruno slung his leg over his new bike, turned her over, and Marco jumped on behind him. 
they peeled out of the parking lot, heading for home. Losing himself on the road, Bruno flew down the highway. As he rode, he felt something lift inside of him. An odd lightness in his being, but he didn't know why. The change in him had happened so suddenly it took him a while to feel it. It helped him numb his anger and frustration that had folded itself into his soul since Castillo's takedown. That shit had dragged like a dark cloud looming overhead. Life's not fair, and those Castillo's bitches were not going to wallow in self-pity any longer. It was time for a fucking change. Chapter 14 What a Difference a Day Makes Bruno stood at his bedroom window and watched the time of day where night gives way to early morning. The town wasn't awake yet, nor were the birds, but this was when Bruno did his best thinking. Fingering a cigarette in one hand, his mind mused on the events of the day before. All these years, he never dreamed of wanting something different, never felt shame for the brotherhood he belonged to. But after last night, fuck, he hissed under his breath. How will they live with themselves? Men who spent years earning honor, earning respect, and last night, they chose to give it away? Now he stood, closer to being brokenhearted than he'd ever thought possible, angry and wounded, wounds of injustice that could only be healed by unity, something he could only hope still remained between them. Was the mob just something to keep the other men occupied? Why did they now seem to want to shake the chains that bound them? Bruno's hand closed into a tight fist at the thought, inadvertently crushing the cigarette into dust within his palm. Opening his trembling hand slowly, he blew away the tobacco and ash, dusting what was left away. If he hadn't shown up at the warehouse when he did last night, the enemy would have had his brothers on their knees, begging for mercy. Damn fools, damn fucking cowards. Perhaps he was the fool not to gun down every last one of the intruders while he had the chance. Perhaps he would have if they'd outstayed their welcome a second longer. They might have gotten away from him, but they wouldn't for long. Word had already circulated that the Castillo family had been attacked, and reputation was everything in this business. The Castillo crime family was supposed to be untouchable, now they were weak. What a difference a day makes. He growled, bringing his hands to the back of his head, then pulled two fistfuls of his hair tight. Dropping his head to his chest, he shut his eyes. He wanted to erase the memory of last night, had to get this out of his system, out of his mind. At that moment, the bedsheets rustled behind him. Bruno... His woman's tired but pleasant feminine voice filled the air. Bruno looked over his shoulder, then smiled faintly as he met his woman's cool blue eyes. It's okay, baby. Go back to sleep, he whispered. Dropping her head down onto the pillow, she tugged the sheets over her body and rolled over. Taking a breath, Bruno dropped his pajama pants and then his shirt and went over to the dresser. He changed into a sharp black suit. He needed to take care of the task he was supposed to do the day before, follow Castillo's instructions in that letter. He checked himself over in the bathroom mirror, then snatched his keys from the cabinet by the door as he left the room. Running down the stairs, he grabbed his coat and dialed Frankie's number. The man answered and gave him instructions to meet at a location he knew well, in Barona in one hour after he dressed him down for standing him up the day before. Why the fuck would he want to meet there? Barona was nearly a ghost town up in the mountains, on land owned by native Indians. Shaking his head, he hopped into his car, then fired up the engine and prayed his wreck of a vehicle would last the thirty miles out of town into Ramona. 
Bruno drove south on the highway for nearly an hour. The fury he'd felt hadn't gone away, but his emotions had to give way to his duty. As dawn rose in the eastern sky, Bruno squinted in the sun's glare as he turned off the main road onto a steep mountain road climb. Slipping his dark shades over his eyes, he considered why the boss wanted him to meet with this man. He knew who Frankie Peterson was and what he did for a living, but the purpose of this visit eluded him. Perhaps it was nothing. Perhaps the letter he'd received wasn't from the boss. Perhaps it was a trap. But what was he going to do, ignore the boss's orders? Not Bruno. He huffed as the sun crawled up the horizon and he rolled through the looping mountain roads of Ramona. Up ahead, he could see his destination in the distance. Sixty minutes downtown of San Diego, his car choked up to a place signposted, Welcome to Barona, the happiest casino on earth. Bruno's body grew tense. He knew all about this place, the Indian casino and resort on the Barona Indian Reservation. The only place there was to visit out here. The only place that would give him a job when he first came to America. He hated it. The day he left, he vowed it'd be his last time here. In the end, he believed gambling was nothing but a curse to the soul. Where men came to make a deal with the devil for a shot at winning big at the blackjack and poker tables. It profited several billion per year, and all its monies went to the native Indians who lived on the reservation. As the car rolled onto the premises, a waving man, short, tanned, Mexican, in a khaki uniform, greeted Bruno with a smile as he steered down the wide and winding private road to the grand building off in the near distance. The building itself was light brick, with a distinct green-tiled roof like it was earning so much money it was bursting out of the place. Easing off the accelerator, Bruno took a right into the enormous casino car park and chose a spot near the main entrance. Stepping out of the car, he stretched his back, which had seized up traveling in the tiny vehicle, then crossed the parking area to the pavement and marched along the path towards the casino. As he walked, he looked around. A pool and jacuzzi off to the left, a winding path to the right that led to a beautiful golf course and lake, filled with wooden deck chairs and outdoor lighting. Very nice. Directly outside the entrance was a looped driveway, larger than he'd ever seen on any house or hotel, that wrapped around a massive oak tree, which stood before white stone stairs to the doors and gold-colored railings on each side. Uniformed staff dressed in gold and blue were on hand, valets, luggage carriers, and doormen up the steps. Outside the grand entry stood six double doors with gold handles. At the foot of the stairs, he stared up at the eight-story building in front of him. In huge block capital letters above the double doors, it said, Welcome home. His first thought was that it had been a long time since he'd stepped inside these walls. His second thought was that he wasn't sure he wanted to. Straightening, he paced up the white steps, glaring through his shades at the unnervingly cheerful faces of the Mexican doorman in the casino's staff. When he reached the doors, one was pulled open with an ominous, Welcome home, sir. Bruno de Luca strode in. Noise, people, and a thousand different machines. The slots area he came into was like an indoor amusement park. His eyes panned the room, and immediately everything came back. The elevators were stationed beside the buffet, and Bruno went directly there. As he went, he noted that nothing had changed about the place. It had all the universally defining qualities, slot machines just feet from the entrance, lighted fountains, a bizarre aura of homeliness. Nearly every machine, every table was occupied with money-hungry people. The majority chain-smoking addicts fighting to win big on their last buck. Reaching the elevators, Bruno pressed the upwards arrow on the wall and waited. The smells from the food outlets and buffet were always overpowering. Italian, Mexican, Chinese, Japanese, you name it, 
they had it. Everything you could possibly want at a fifth of the retail price. It was the part of the casino's ploy to keep people inside this place. Make the experience so good people never wanted to leave, even while burning away their life savings on a poker game. And they sure as hell knew how to do it successfully. Bruno eyed the sign for all-you-can-eat lobster and the four huge lines for the buffet and shook his head. Chumps. When the doors in front of him pinged open, the big man stalked inside and clicked the button for the eighth floor. He waited in silence, watching the lit numbers steadily rise seven times before the elevator came to a stop. The doors rolled apart to reveal a place very different from the smoke-filled cattle farm downstairs. Quiet and sophisticated, with fresh air, it was refreshing in comparison. This was the hotel, where the big spenders, the high rollers, were housed. Stepping out of the elevator, he was immediately greeted by three smiling faces at the long, sweeping reception desk at the back of the room. He walked across the lobby like he owned the place, as he always did, and went over to the female receptionist in the center. How may I help you? The lady smiled with genuine content, looking way too satisfied with her lot in life for a woman earning minimum wage with no benefits. The name's Bruno, Bruno De Luca, he stated. I have a meeting in the building. Perhaps you can help me. The woman smiled. All righty, let's just find the room number, Mr. DeLuca. She looked down her screen and clicked around. Bruno took off his shades. While he waited, he glanced around the room, inspecting it more closely. Luxury from floor to ceiling, wide halls, ornate mahogany carpets, original art on the walls. Here we are, room 358, our presidential suite she said, handing him a small cardboard pouch containing two credit card-sized electronic keys. You're meeting with a Mr. Frankie Peterson, I believe. Bruno nodded slowly. Wonderful. Mr. Peterson's already here. It's just down the hall. You can go right in. Bruno nodded once. Thank you. Exiting the lobby, Bruno stalked down the hall, eyeing the room numbers until he came to two double doors on his right, set back from the rest in their own miniature cove in the wall, one of which had a golden 358 plastered on the door. From the outside, it was clear this room was larger than the others, with a great distance between it and the doors to the rooms adjacent. Bruno went to the door, knocked twice, then waved the card over a magnetic plate. An LED blinked green. He pushed open the door and went inside. The lush tone continued here in Art Deco and shiny marble. The door locked behind him with a thud, and Frankie, who was busy making a coffee, smiled slightly. It was a smile Bruno didn't trust. The two men crossed the room, meeting in the middle, and shook hands. Bruno gave the man a once-over and narrowed his eyes on the fresh-faced accountant. Dressed in a tux and tie, he was tall, slim, clean-shaven, not a scar on his body, not a hair out of place. His very image screamed boring and mediocre. I hear you want to talk with me, Bruno said in his usual shotgun approach. I take it this ain't some sort of setup. Because if it is, you and whoever you're working for should be very, very afraid. He sneered, narrowing his eyes at the man in the tux. Frankie smiled. Bruno, sit down, please. He motioned the big man toward the study to one side. I'll just be a minute. Eyeing the man with distrust, Bruno passed the entrance to the expensive room and entered the book-lined dark wooded study. He paced for a moment in front of the fire which was dying in the fireplace, then spotted something and went over to the big desk by the window. The surface was covered with contracts, receipts, and reports, all for this hotel and casino. Bruno frowned. What were these out for? Then dropping into the neighboring armchair, he sat back in his seat and waited for Frankie. Frankie entered black leather briefcase in hand, and closed the door behind him. 
What's this about? Bruno repeated. Frankie sat down beside him. I take it you've read the letter from your boss. Bruno nodded slowly. Yes, yes I have. It was rather vague. And to be honest, I'm having doubts it was even Castillo who sent it. Why should I trust you, a man I've never even met? He leaned across in his seat menacingly. Frankie leaned back, cowering away. His lips moved for a few seconds before any words came out. But, but you know of me by reputation, surely. And by reputation, you'll know I've worked for Vincent Castillo for nearly three decades, and in that time, I have never once betrayed the trust he placed in me. Bruno narrowed his eyes on the man. Then he slowly sat back in his seat. Okay, then, spill it. Frankie nodded. Shifting so he was directly facing Bruno, he told him, I'm sorry to say I've got some bad news to share with you. Bruno made no reply, didn't react at all. I'm afraid it's your boss's wish that you pay the bills on this place from now on. Bruno glared. And what's that supposed to mean? Frankie turned to him with a triumphant expression, spreading his arms wide. The casino and resort are yours now, Bruno. Castillo wants you to have it. Bruno stared at him for a moment, then shook his head. This is fucking crazy. This place is owned and operated by the Mission Indians. Any profits earned are divided up among their people. What are you trying to pull? He stood up, shaking his head as he slipped on his shades and took a step towards the door. Frankie jumped up and stopped him. Take your hands off me before I break your fucking fingers, Bruno growled. This place had enough out of me already. It ain't getting any more, he declared. The bitter aftertaste of all the hours he slaved for minimum wage just to line the native Indian's pockets filling his mouth. Frankie didn't let go. Castillo will do much worse to me if I don't deliver his message. Bruno huffed. You got ten minutes. This better be good. He sat back down. Dropping into his seat, Frankie explained. What you say isn't wrong. This place was owned by the Indians 100%, but not anymore. All they own now is the land the casino is built on. Bruno stared at the man, confused. You'll have to pay the mission Indians of the tribe rent for the land. A couple of million per year, but the rest is yours. Castillo bought the chiefs out a few years back. It was a crooked deal, but the contracts are watertight. I oversaw the process myself. Bruno laughed. Castillo's got money, I know that. But the money to buy a place like this? Oh, come on. Frankie drew in a breath. Everyone has a price, Bruno, and he made the chiefs an offer so obscene they couldn't refuse. So what? You're telling me the chiefs took the money from the sale and ran? Frankie nodded slowly. Precisely. Bruno pushed back his chair, shaking his head. Let me see the contracts, he demanded. From within his black briefcase, Frankie produced a brown manila envelope. Here it is. Opening it, he laid it flat out on the arm of Bruno's chair. See? The 400-room luxury hotel. Yours. The casino. Yours. The restaurants. Yours. The golf course and spa. Yours. Taking the sheet from inside the envelope, Bruno stared at it silently for several minutes before he said a word. The contract was professional, watertight, too fucking good to be true. Frankly, I'm more than a little suspicious. First, I gotta believe Castillo owns this place. And second, you expect me to believe he's going to give it to me for nothing? Just like that? Bruno shook his head, tossing the contract into the accountant's lap. Even if I were born with half a brain, I wouldn't believe that. Frankie grinned. Castillo said you'd react this way. He's allowed a phone call from the prison this evening. 
You can talk to him then. But believe me, Bruno, as a man who's been by Vincent Castillo's side for as long as you've been alive, when he says he's gonna do something, he does it. When the two of you talk, he'll only confirm everything I've just told you. So Castillo's had this planned, and I wasn't told about this? Bruno said, raising the end of his sentence to a question. It's nothing personal, Bruno. You probably know as well as I do Castillo doesn't like to put all of his cards on the table, so to speak. Not to his friends, the taxman, his enemies, nobody. Frankie sighed, and his eyes fell to the ground. The boss always wanted this place for Bobby as his successor. Bruno scowled. So why me? Why not Francesco? As underboss, the job should go to him, he interrupted. But now, with no children left to carry his reign, Frankie continued, Castillo had to take a real hard look at who he could really trust. His eyes shot up to lock Bruno's gaze. On the surface, everybody in his crew is loyal. But when the shit hit the fan, the only man who fought for him was you, Bruno. He was pissed when he heard what you did, but you risked everything. Your job, your life, your membership in that life, to save your boss. That's something special. The big man shrugged. I do what I gotta do. Castillo also told me there's no other man alive he'd rather have as his successor, Frankie finished. Bruno felt his eyes pop. Successor? No fucking way. Shit like this doesn't happen to a man like me. Frankie smiled. It's the truth. Castillo said he had noted many characteristics in you that he himself had. You were always a candidate for boss in his eyes, and the more he thought about the idea, the more he liked it. Bruno rose to his feet, then glanced around the extravagant room. It was like seeing everything with a fresh set of eyes. Now he saw it for what it was, a source of the mob's money and power. This is insane, he exclaimed in an out-of-character expressive voice that was one part confusion, two part excitement. Frankie laughed, standing up. You've hit the real jackpot, Mr. DeLuca. This is one of the largest casinos in California, and the most profitable on the West Coast, that's for sure. Fixing his beaming face to his stoic persona, Bruno spun around to face the man. Is there going to be anything else? he asked, voice stern. Frankie's smile dropped and he shook his head. No, no. Bruno scowled as he eyed the man up and down. You said your piece, now get the fuck out of my room. Frankie stuffed the papers into his briefcase and closed it. I'll meet with you Friday to sign the paperwork. Bruno gave a singular nod and gestured towards the door. He followed the man on his way out. Opening the door, Frankie paused and tossed his eyes over his shoulder. Oh, and you might want to check out your new office. That's really something to see. It's on the top floor. Bruno narrowed his eyes at the man. Shaking his hand, Frankie disappeared out the door. When the door slammed closed, Bruno went back into the study. Dropping into his seat, he punched in Marco's number on the phone and waited. Bruno, what's up? Bruno gave that slow, dark grin of his. You're not gonna believe this. Chapter 15 A knife in his boot and a pistol under the table. Bruno sat back in the office chair, laced his fingers together, and waited for Castillo's call. The office was a large, rambling room with alcoves and built-in bookcases, with books lined up perfectly, and filing cabinets. It was dominated by an enormous, hulking oak table, which the boss used as his desk. The high-backed leather chair was on wheels so that he could spin around the room. Bruno looked down at his new desk to see it was empty except for an ashtray, 
a telephone, his boss's appointment book, a marble pen holder, and a pen. He leaned back and adjusted the seat, getting used to his new role. Then he swiveled around to look at Marco, who was now sitting in the office behind him. Glass sliding doors separated Bruno's office from his cousin Marco's. At 7 p.m. sharp, the phone rang. Bruno, you alone? A ghost of a smile passed Bruno's lips. It seemed like forever since he'd heard Castillo's voice, one he never thought he'd miss. I'm alone. I'm up in Barona. So you've spoken to Frankie? You understand what's going to happen? Yes, Vincent, I understand. Bruno knew he had to choose his words carefully. He had no doubt the cops would be listening to everything mob boss Vincent Castillo said. I'd like to thank you for, forget about it, Castillo said dismissively. I just want you to be careful. You'll need protection with you at all times. I understand. Bruno well knew it was going to be a very tense time with him taking over as boss. Times like these were very ripe for killing within the families. He'd be watching his back more than ever, with a knife in his boot and a pistol under the table at meetings. Bruno drew in a breath. Francesco won't be happy about this, not at all. Vincent scoffed. I need someone who's not afraid to get their hands dirty. Francesco's a businessman. He spends too much time with businessmen and not enough time on the streets. You're not like that, Bruno. You're a man of the people. The locals will love you. That's me, boss. There was a pause between them. Bruno then said, Vincent, good luck, DeLuca. The phone line went dead. Bruno then slowly lowered the phone to the desk. Marco came through the door. So, is this real or what? Yep. Bruno let out a relaxed breath. Everything was falling in place. Soon, the DeLuca name will again be synonymous with power. Marco nodded. I've taken a look at the books. You were right, Bruno. This place is the real grease that fuels the family's businesses. We'd better get things organized and fast. Millions will be coming your way, millions every week. Shit, that's more money than I know what to do with. Yep. Marco wheeled a chair opposite his cousin and sat down. Now, it would be wise to put the stash away for retirement. I know that seems far off now, but if you start off early, you get it done, and don't think about it again until you need it later on. Plus, if this a place ever went under, you want a nest egg for yourself. Casinos are risky business, they often go under. Bruno huffed. I suppose it makes sense. You gotta keep your money safe, somewhere only you know about. Charlie is my brother, and you my cousin. It will be for the two of you as well. I reckon for every million you make, you can set aside 10 to 20k without anyone's notice. That makes it 30 to 50k a week in your pocket. Bruno nodded. That shouldn't be difficult. But you can't put it in the bank. That goes without saying. You can, however, do as my father has done and buy valuable paintings and keep the money there. Then, when you so desire, you can resell them on the black market. Not as simple as it might sound, but we can handle it. The devil's in the details. No tax man, no paper trails. That would do it, Bruno nodded. Stupid to keep my money in a bank with the FBI breathing down my neck. Marco agreed. Yes, but you must never tell a soul, Bruno. My father always warned me, money opens doors, but it opens doors to cliff edges. Money has the power to destroy a man, Bruno. Don't let anybody know what you've got, no matter how tempting it may be. Bruno laughed. I know that. Now, can't we just enjoy this? He opened the drawer to his right and, searching inside for a drink, took out a bottle of Dalmore 62 whiskey and two glasses. He poured Marco a drink, but the man didn't take it. Then there's the press, Marco continued. You won't be able to hide for long before word spreads that Bruno De Luca's the new boss. Bruno's eyes lit up. Shit, Castillo's made it almost too easy for me. 
He downed a double shot of whiskey and closed his eyes as the liquid hit the back of his throat. Marco sighed. Let's just hope it's the blessing it looks like and not the curse it became for Castillo and his son. Bruno stood up. We cannot be afraid. Fear makes men weak. Fear itself is the only thing we must fear. Anything else we can handle as we always do. He swung his blazer jacket from the back of his chair and put it on. Marco swore. Where are you going now? We got a lot to work out, Bruno. Bruno paused as he walked towards the door and looked at his cousin dead in the eyes. A cold grin washed over his lips. You mean boss. He walked out triumphantly and left for home, finally at peace in the knowledge that he was going to be the one making the calls from now on. When his car chugged to a sickening stop outside his home an hour later, he vowed this would be the first thing to go. It saddened him to think that something great would come out of a very tragic murder and imprisoning Castillo, but he couldn't change any of that now. The world had finally cut Bruno De Luca a break. I knew it would happen eventually. I knew it. Something had to go my way, he muttered to himself. It was magic. This was the biggest opportunity of his life. And he was taking it. Chapter 16 Win Quick, Lose Quicker One Month Later as the mahogany doors to the elevator pinged, they slid away to Bruno's top floor office. Stepping through his office door, every hair on Bruno's body stood tall like the Statue of Liberty. Five months shy of his 27th birthday and the undisputed mob boss of San Diego. Over the last months, his life had changed full circle from the world of a determined young criminal stuck at the bottom to a made man catapulted to the top. All of a sudden, everybody knew him. Everybody wanted to do him favors. His beat-up car was a thing of the past, replaced by not one, but three gleaming black sedans. He'd paid cash for a luxury home, a six-bedroom detached house in Oceanside. He'd grown fond of the luxuries quick. The struggle, the fight for survival, it all seemed a lifetime ago, almost like another life altogether. DeLuca leaned back in his office chair, watching the packed casino below. Through the window, he could watch hundreds of players hunched over roulette and blackjack tables. One or two tarts and mistresses sat on stools on their lovers' arms, anxious and excited. It was sort of comical. All the transparent chains that tied people to the win-quick, lose-quicker games they played. In that moment, one man who had just lost everything he got, though he'd put the hex on the croupier, smashed him over the head with an ashtray. The doorman butted him in the stomach. It was one of two reactions Bruno had seen when men lose everything. Usually, they go home and top themselves. Bruno shook his head, picking up his phone to see what he was dealing with. As he brought it to his ear, a male voice sounded from behind him, and he lowered it. Like he was reading from a teleprompter, the man spoke in a theatrical, reporter-style tone. He's exploded onto the scene as head of the most powerful crime family in the country. Like Al Capone, the press loves him. The people love him. He dresses like a gangster from the movies, talks like a gangster from the movies. He's the real fucking deal. What do they call him? Throwing his head back, Bruno chuckled. He spun around in his chair and met his brother's eyes. The one, the only, Bruno De Luca. Charlie beamed. Dropping his clenched fist that he pretended was a microphone from his lips, he spread his arms wide. Bruno shook his head. Charlie, good to see you. What can I do for you? He called out, his smile wide. The man who never smiled was smiling a whole lot these days. 
Charlie laughed as he jogged over to his desk and dropped some paperwork on it. Got something for ya? Bruno huffed. More fucking paperwork. Leaning closer, Charlie dropped his voice to a confidential whisper. There's something else you should know while I'm here. Your Annie's been talking to my woman. She's pissed at you about something. Said she was coming over here. Bruno nodded slowly. All right, I'll deal with it. Thanks, brother. As he spoke, his phone started to ring. Glancing at the phone, Charlie patted the big man on the shoulder. Gotta run. Dinner Friday? Bruno nodded. Sure. With that, his brother left. Bruno sighed and stared at his phone as it rang. His phone rang every fucking minute of the day, and his fax machine had over a hundred new faxes every day. Standing up, he marched over to the wall and unplugged the fax line. It was odd. He'd been trained to withstand any sort of mental pressure, but the paperwork was enough to drive him insane. He could never hack it. Marco handled that shit. Kicking off his shoes, Bruno turned his chair to face Marco. Stacks of papers and files piled high encroached him, encasing him in a tiny working area. When he spun to peer out the window again, his eye was caught by a painted lady with a rhinestone bikini. A platinum blonde with the perfect body, breasts up to her chin, and a golden tan. Stunning. But when he looked closely, he saw her for what she really was. Just a manufactured piece of plastic, not the real deal. You couldn't take that shit to the bank. You can't turn glass into a diamond, no matter how much glitter you cover it with. Unaware that trouble stood in the doorway, he watched as the intriguing woman paraded across the floor with sleazy old men ogling and calling out to her. He wondered how desperate you'd have to be to put yourself through that. His big black heart felt for the blonde woman. He was looking straight ahead, his calloused fingers rumming his chin when his woman's voice sounded from the doorway. You didn't come home in time for dinner tonight, just like every other evening this week, Annie called out. Bruno glanced at her reflection in the crystal clear glass, leaning her shoulder against the doorframe, her hands tucked inside the pockets of her floral dress. Then he dropped his eyes slowly to peer at the clock. It was past 9 p.m. Shit. Double shit. Reaching into her shoulder bag, Annie brought out a plate wrapped in foil. Bruno, listen to me. From behind him came the rustle of aluminum foil. Bruno looked up as she tossed the ball in the direction of the wastebasket. He spun his chair around. Hell, if I'd known it was going to be like this, DeLuca. Grimacing in exasperation, she headed his way like a locomotive. Stomping right up to his desk, she slammed his dinner down in front of him. There, she huffed. Bruno grabbed her arm and studied her for a moment. Shit, woman. I worked damn fucking hard to make you happy, and still it's never enough. Annie shot him a pointed look as she shrugged his hand away, eyes like twin lightsabers. She crossed her arms over her chest. Bruno growled. You want to know my idea of marriage? It's a partnership, where people help each other through hard spots. A little consideration would damn well be appreciated. Annie shrugged. Whatever. There was a clumsy pause as if she were almost challenging him to say something, but Bruno set his jaw and said nothing. Annie planted her hands on her hips. Okay, okay, you want to talk about what's right and wrong in a marriage, huh? If you don't think I didn't just see you ogling that woman, you have me down for a fool. She tutted, averting her eyes. Distracted by a showgirl's pair of perky tits. Too distracted to come home to me. Too distracted to even see me come through the door. Bruno's eyes popped wide. Annie, I would never hurt you that way. And don't think I haven't noticed the calls to our house. The letters in the post from other women, she retorted. Bruno swore. I don't tell them to call. I don't tell them to write. 
They're just obsessed with my celebrity, Annie. He shook his head. What do you expect? The media follows me like I'm half Robin Hood, half rock star. You think all that comes without attention? Hell no. Her eyes rolled exaggeratedly into the back of her skull. Oh, please, she quipped. Closing her eyes, she allowed her emotions to settle. Then, taking a deep breath, she said, I think you and I should talk when you get home. There's nothing to talk about, woman. I do my fucking job in this relationship. That's bullshit, and you know it. Annie glared at him. You think you're so hot now that you're... Watch your tone with me. Bruno stopped her mid-speech and shook his head. He knew he wasn't the terrible husband Annie made him out to be. Meanwhile, his phone rang insistently, nearly buzzing off the desk. Growling, he snatched his phone and held it to his ear. Oh, Annie shouted. You really are an insufferable asshole sometimes, Bruno. Get off your goddamn phone and talk to me. Slowly dropping the phone from his ear, Bruno stared at her for a moment. She'd never raised her voice to him before, and it sent a sensation he didn't understand licking down his spine. He hung the phone up. On the one hand, he hated this, this outrage on her part. On the other, nobody had the balls to say this kind of thing to him. He eyed her as she stood there, statuesque. More than that girl next door kind of beautiful. Her beauty wasn't real easy to spot, but when you saw it, you'd never forget. Inwardly, he smiled. She dressed more like a librarian than the vixen she was. His cock twitched in his pants, and he crossed his legs. That's it, Bruno. If you don't start listening to me, I'll be out that door, and I'll never come back. Bruno stood up. Annie, come here. No, you're gonna listen, shithead. Fire them. If you love me, fire them. Bruno licked his lips. Who? The women out there who lost their way looking for the pool. Get rid of them. Baby, this is a casino. I don't fucking care. This isn't the fucking Vegas Strip, Annie snapped. A fiery passion assaulted Bruno's mind, and he swallowed hard. Then he took a step toward her and hoped that wasn't a new dress she was wearing, because he was about to rip it from her body with his teeth. When Bruno made no reply, she turned around and headed for the door. Quickly sliding open his top desk drawer, he snatched a remote from inside and clicked it. At once, his woman stopped in her tracks as the door locked and a partition rolled across the window between his office and Marco's. The room dimmed to an intimate twilight. She spun around and scowled at him. Unlock that door, Bruno! A slow, sly grin crossed his lips. Make me. Make you? She huffed, storming right up to him and glaring into his eyes. Bruno looked down into her eyes, and seizing her brown curls at the back of her head, he thrust her back down against his desk, pinning her. Consequences be damned, he was taking what he wanted. I mean it. Fire them, Bruno, she sneered. It's me or them. Her face was so red it looked like she was boiling through her skin. Crushing his lips to hers, he kissed her into submission. She quieted finally and then clung to him as her legs weakened. Slowly, Bruno removed his lips from hers and his greedy eyes traveled over her body. She was too clothed. At once, Bruno lifted her entire body onto the desk, and her Italian passion came alive in her eyes. They made out like they hated each other, raw, rough, and uninhibited. Buttons popped, tongues fought angrily. Roaming his calloused hands over every inch of her flesh, his cock pressed against her belly button. He lifted her up so that it fell between her legs. Suddenly, Annie went rigid, tense, fingers gripping his stone biceps. Bruno, the window. Shit, they can see us. Bruno smirked. 
all they can see is a mirror. He barely gave her a chance to let the breath out she'd been holding when he spun her around and slapped her bare ass. Pressing up against her, his swelling cock pushed up against her butt cheeks. Reaching around, she took hold of his dick. She should have known better. Bruno was a control freak. He pushed her hand away. His cock found her soft center, and he thrust in slowly. Over and over, he drove into her from behind, right to the core. His engorged cock moved faster, thrashing against her walls, and he didn't relent as she cried out, screamed, moaning into orgasm. He came with a growl and stopped, then rolled her slowly onto her back. He stared at her eyes from above. Her cool blue eyes seemed to burn hot tonight, and he was to blame. He knew he'd spoiled her, corrupted her, spoiled her rose-tinted perception of life. Despite her soft exterior, she was hardened to his world now. Strong, cynical, distrusting. She'd always be his, but she'd never again be the innocent she once was. Bruno only hoped he could live with that guilt. Chapter 17 You can't trust anybody in this world. Five years later. Bruno came into work early, his eyes curtained behind dark Armani shades. He grabbed a cup of coffee and settled into his chair at his desk. He hated coffee. He'd hardly slept last night, too much on his mind. He had the highest paycheck, but he also had the worst headaches, sleepless nights. Insomnia had become the norm. He realized something else as well. He had buckets of cash, and yet he was stressed about money, probably more stressed than he'd ever been. It wasn't that he wasn't grateful for this opportunity, but he felt strangely weighed down. Even stranger was the sharp pinprick of regret for who he had become. Small, but it was there. By the time he put his briefcase on the table and opened it, his body was ready for a bit of shut-eye. Reclining his chair back, he closed his eyes. He woke up to his phone ringing and jolted in his chair, realizing he'd fallen asleep in his own office. Looking at the clock, he realized it was almost noon. Immediately, Marco knocked on the window between their offices and captured Bruno's attention. His gaze swung up to spot his cousin Marco pull open the door. Marco halted in the doorway and then, taking one step into the room, closed the door behind him. As Marco stepped into his office, Bruno narrowed his eyes. Something about the man's stern, anxious expression set Bruno on edge. What the fuck's happened? The loud clearing of Marco's throat told him he had something big to say, and Bruno could feel he wasn't going to like it. Bruno, boss, you're going to want to take a look at this. Don't just stand there. Sit down and tell me. Marching slowly over to the desk, Marco took his seat opposite the big man and locked onto his cousin's gaze. Well, you got my attention. Go ahead. Bruno sat back in his chair. Last night, we went out to our private warehouse to accept the delivery of another painting you've invested in. Bruno gave a singular nod. There a problem with it? Marco took a breath. No, no, the painting was fine. Perfect. The problem is with the others. Bruno only stared at him, uncomprehending. Marco, what the fuck are you talking about? Marco studied him for a moment and then decided to tell Bruno the truth. Since there was no easy way to say what needed to be said, he used the shock approach. They're gone, Bruno. They're all fucking gone. What? It must be a mistake. I'm afraid it isn't. Marco said. Where did they go? How? Do you know who did it? Bruno quick-fired questions. Marco made no reply. Taking a breath, Bruno sat back in his seat, thinking. His lips pulled into a slow, cold grin. 
We have CCTV. The thieves don't stand a chance. Marco gave a slow, regretful bow of his head. Bruno, I've already watched the tapes. There's evidence that it was Antonio. Bruno's eyes narrowed, his dark brows meeting in the middle to form as one. Marco was accusing his closest friend. Oh, of course, you would be the first to suspect that it was Tony who took them. He shook his head. And how do you propose he pulled that off? One man? That's real fucking believable. Marco sighed. I'm not the saying it was Antonio for sure, but I know what I saw. One man, dressed in black, pulls up in a white van. He climbs up a ladder and unscrews the air vent from the wall. Then removing the vent, he climbs inside. Bruno swore. Air vent, you told me the place was fucking secure. It is secure. No windows and all the doors are alarmed. But the painting's gonna breathe, Bruno. Otherwise, they won't be worth anything. Bruno smashed his fist down onto the table and stood up, towering over his cousin. Well, they're not worth a cent to me now. You did this, not Antonio. This was your negligence. You are liable for what happened to those paintings. And if you think I'm gonna let this slide, you're mistaken. Bruno gave him a cold look, then turned and walked toward the fireplace, musing over what he'd just been told. Antonio might have known about the money, but surely he'd never take it? Marco cleared his throat. You told him, didn't you? Told him what we were doing and where we were stashing the paintings. Bruno looked at his cousin, but didn't say a word. Marco shook his head. I knew it. Bruno growled. Whether I told Antonio or not is no business of yours. But since you've interrupted me with your little cock and balls theory, here's what I want to know. Why in God's name would Antonio steal the paintings? He glared at the man, then turned his gaze to the raging fire. Marco shrugged. Money changes people, Bruno, even your friends. Once you got money, people want a piece of what you got. Perhaps he was jealous. The two of you used to work the streets together, and now? Now you're up here every day, enjoying the fruits of his labor. He stretched back in his seat. Seems like motive enough to me. Bruno turned from the fireplace. In his hand was the poker, its end glowing orange. He advanced on Marco. Prove it to me. Prove it was Antonio, you filthy lion son of a bitch he growled in outrage. Marco stopped talking, shot to his feet, his eyes widening in terror. Bruno pinned the man up against his office window, poker at his side. Marco panted, I'll prove it to you, I'll fucking prove it. Bruno raised the poker to Marco's face and watched a bead of perspiration drip from the man's forehead to his nose. Slowly, he lowered it. Sit the fuck down. Backing away from his cousin, he went over to the fireplace and tossed the burning poker down on the metal plating in front of the logs. Marco waited for Bruno to sit down before he spoke. All right, so only ourselves, Charlie, and Antonio knew the paintings existed, right? Bruno nodded. That's right. Marco pulled out his phone. Watch this. Onto the screen came a gray and white CCTV image. Marco skipped to the end when nearly all the paintings were in the van. The man pulled off his balaclava in front of the camera to reveal a mean scar that ran right down his face. Antonio. Unease sank down into Bruno's spine. There's more, Marco added. The building the van drove to is owned by Antonio's uncle. Antonio has them, Bruno. Bruno growled. This makes no sense. Acts like this don't come out of thin air. There's always a build-up to the act. Marco drew in a breath. And you don't think Antonio's been more than a little off with you lately? Come on, Bruno. The contempt is in his eyes. Bruno stood there, glaring at him, hating what he was hearing. In truth, he'd hardly seen the man in the past month. Once a week for a few hours, that was all. 
Feeling his pulse rise and his trust in his brother popped like a soap bubble, he said. You need to go home, Marco, Bruno yelled, right away. Marco's eyebrows jumped up. What? Get out, Marco. Get the fuck out, Bruno bellowed. Now, Bruno was pissed off as well as afraid, but he knew he'd do well not to show that. Marco sighed and tucked the papers into his briefcase, disappointed. I'll let him know he's to come and see you here ASAP. Let's see what he has to say for himself. He stood up and moved toward the door. No, Bruno growled in Marco's direction. The instinct for revenge mixed with the instinct to protect the man whom he trusted was at war in his mind. And he wasn't sure which emotion was going to win out. Nobody's doing anything until I say so, capiche? First, he needed to figure out what he needed to do in his own fucking time. We're on lockdown, tell the boys. That's all anyone needs to know. I want those paintings recovered. And what are you going to do? Bruno looked him up and down. He let out a frustrated growl, almost angry enough to punch a wall. You know goddamn well how betrayal is dealt with, he glared at Marco. A man who could do that doesn't deserve to live. Marco left his office, and Bruno stared after him. Enraged, he picked up his things and stormed out of the room, slamming the door on his way out. As he drove out of the mountains, toward San Diego, the burning beneath Bruno's skin increased, clawing and tearing at his insides. When he stopped at a red light, he placed both hands on the wheel. Fucking Antonio. Bruno spoke his name like a curse. His hand squeezed into a deathly grip around the wheel. The ride home from Barona was long. He hoped to God it hadn't been Antonio who stole the paintings. As much as it would hurt, that'd be a betrayal Bruno could never forgive him for. Still, he would have a little more investigating before pulling the trigger. Cash could be replaced. A friend like Antonio, all 250 pounds of him, could not. A friendship that had seemed so genuine. He had killed a fair amount of wrongdoers in his time, but this was different. He suspended judgment until he had proof. Until then, he would wait. When he reached San Diego, he sat down at his local bar with the only man left in this world he knew he could fully trust, Charlie. His brother gave his word that he hadn't told anyone about the paintings. Bruno had no doubt about it. He had the right man. He returned home that night at God knows when, shit-faced on beer and whiskey. He parked the car in one of the spaces in the garage and stumbled inside. Despite his best efforts, Bruno tossed and turned in bed. He felt betrayed, hurt. That asshole really thinks he can steal from me? For years, this man has been his pal, his best friend, and for what? The money he would have gladly given him if he'd asked. His friend's betrayal would end his life. Pissed off, he tore out of the house in the middle of the night. Outside, he sat thinking at the wheel of his car. He wanted the son of a bitch dealt with quick so that his mob was safe again. Perhaps he'd been asking for it. He'd befriended one of the most dangerous men in America, always went the extra mile, only to shit on him. Bruno made a firm vow never again to have trust in a man as he once had. Finally, he put the car in gear and drove away. As he sped away, something deep in his unconscious mind surfaced. A lesson his father had drilled into him when he was alive. Wisdom from the great Michael DeLuca he himself ignored and paid the price. You can't trust anybody in this world, Bruno. You were a fool to trust him. You're a fool to trust anybody. And instantly, Bruno knew what he had to do. Nothing could be done. Not now. The threat of losing everything he'd worked for, and the paranoid fear that if his friend did have the evidence on him, he could blackmail his entire family. 
Once Bruno was headed back home, thoughts led him to the only solution that made any sense to him. Traitors get what they deserve. The countdown on Antonio's life had begun. Chapter 18 A Curse and a Blessing All His Life 36 Hours Later Rolling over in bed, Bruno looked at the clock and saw that it was only 8 a.m. Seething, he got out of bed and dashed to the bathroom to throw cold water over his face. Slowly, his eyes rose to meet his own reflection in the mirror above the wash basin. His squinting eyes widened when his cold reflection looked back at him. The color from his face had vanished completely. Bruno growled. He didn't want to hear shit about Antonio today. He wasn't so soulless as to leave his wife on her birthday. Dabbing his face with a hand towel, the cold water cooled his searing skin, but did nothing to relieve any of his tension. He slumped in the bathroom chair, shaking his head as he contemplated what he'd do with the jackass. When he finished, he threw the towel onto the bathroom floor. Bruno swore. Leaving the bedroom, he flicked on the hallway lights and went downstairs. The entire house was littered with pink rose petals, candles, and lilies. And it made him proud, knowing that his wife had friends who loved her enough to do this for her special day. All that shit, it wasn't his thing, but Annie would love it. With Annie sleeping, Bruno left the house for a while and took a walk through Balboa Park and then called his driver asking him to pick him up outside the florist. Nice morning for a walk, Mr. DeLuca. The driver jumped out of the car and opened the back door for him. Everything all right? I couldn't reach you by phone this morning. Everything's perfectly fine. I just decided to sleep in this morning. Sleep in? He stared at Bruno, puzzled. Really? Bruno huffed. Get in the goddamn car, Ernie. He slipped onto the back seat. Of course. Ernie closed the door. As he drove, Bruno switched on the limo phone, hitting the red button each time somebody called him. When Marco called, however, he answered. This better be good, Bruno grumbled. I know it's Annie's birthday, but I got something you need to know. I think Antonio got suspicious, and he's planning to run. Bones saw him clearing out his whole locker last night when he thought everyone was gone. Bruno swore. All right, I'll get it done. You want me to make the order? asked Marco. No, I'll handle this personally. With Annie's birthday party this evening? Come on, Bruno, let me help you. I said no, Bruno growled, his voice catching suddenly in his throat. There was a short, uncomfortable pause between them before Marco spoke. All right, Bruno, good luck. Cutting the call, Bruno looked down at his watch. He couldn't have his wife waking up to an empty house, but he couldn't let Antonio live, either. He wasn't his friend anymore. He was a bad man who disrespected the family. He couldn't do it now, but he'd have to do it tonight. In front of the mirror, Bruno adjusted his tie and checked himself over in his black tux. It was 10 p.m. and the party was in full swing. A shit ton of Annie's friends and relations were there, more than enough to cover him for the hour or so he'd need to disappear for tonight. When he was done, he went out into the hall and searched for Annie on the floor below, spotting his woman in the middle of the floor, rocking a sexy little red number. He marched to the staircase. One leisurely step at a time, he descended the marble staircase towards his woman, watching her every move. The whole place smelled of perfume and champagne. A hip-hop playlist reverberated off the high ceilings, its seductive pulse threading its way through Annie's skin, claiming her every sexy little move, shoulders back, wiggling her hips, igniting the dirtiest pieces of Bruno's soul. It was hard to imagine what was to come that night. When one of her friends spotted her man, she tapped Annie on the shoulder, whispering in her ear. When she turned around, he saw her eyes scan him all suited up, and she gave him a warm grin of approval. 
she rushed over to meet him at the bottom of the stairs. Giving him a peck on the cheek, she draped her arm loosely over his, lip syncing to the live music playing. Her favorite pop group fresh from L.A. Isn't it wonderful? She gasped softly. Bruno smiled, but he wasn't listening one iota. Panning the room with his eyes, his gaze fell on Marco, and his mind immediately reverted to thoughts of Antonio's betrayal. He leaned in close to Annie's ear. Let me go see if I can't find some better champagne. She smiled with a giddy excitement. Crossing the floor, he made a beeline for the kitchen, then went down into the cellar. The second the door shut, Bruno immediately picked up the phone there on the wall and dialed Antonio's number. When the man answered, Bruno didn't make time for conversation. Told the man what he needed to know, a time, a place, and most importantly, to come alone. Meanwhile, he reached into a top cupboard and pulled out his twenty-two hidden there, then went out. He snatched a black duffel bag from the pantry and slung it over his shoulder. He sneaked out the back door and hopped the fence into the driveway. He started down the street and hadn't gotten twenty steps from the house when Charlie caught up with him and grabbed Bruno's arm. Hold up, brother. Where do you think you're going at this hour? Jerking his head around, Bruno turned back. It's nothing. Don't worry about it. Enjoy the party. Charlie sent his brother a knowing look, and he sighed. You need any help? Bruno shook his head. No, go on, get out of here. He smiled, but he knew his brother wouldn't believe it. Charlie stared at Bruno for a long moment. You don't have to do this, screaming from his eyes. But he didn't fight it, didn't try to stop him. It was no use. Bruno was a train and had always been a train and there would be no stopping him. Instead, he gave a singular nod. All right, be careful out there. Slowly, he turned back towards the house. The big man marched around the block to somewhere dark and discreet in the neighborhood and to where he had one of his cars waiting for him. Slipping into the driver's seat, he pulled away. In his mind, he imagined pulling the trigger how it would feel, out on the bridge that ran over the lake where no one could hear, in the darkness where yellow streetlights weren't blazing. Arriving at the bridge, Bruno killed the engine. With the headlights out and nobody around, he pulled plastic gloves on and his disguise from out of the duffel bag. He twisted the silencer onto the gun and waited. 11 p.m. was fast approaching, Bruno got out of his car, marched down the street and onto the bridge. He waited on the pavement, right at the center, right where he wanted the filthy traitor to die. To get his mind off what he was about to do, Bruno glanced around. There was, of course, no one about, only silence as severe and eerie as the darkness. After a few minutes, the sound of footsteps steadily grew closer closer, and suddenly it was all too clear again. Antonio was a bad man, too dangerous, too evil to survive. Bruno checked his gun a final time. Closing the gap between himself and his ugly fate, Antonio walked briskly towards him with no idea that he had less than ten minutes to live. As Antonio neared the big man, Bruno watched as the fool who'd betrayed him walked toward him, cool and unaware impeccably dressed. He smiled when he saw Bruno, but when Bruno did not return his smile, his smile faded. Antonio stopped dead. In that moment, Bruno was almost certain the man knew that death stood no more than three caskets length away. With his hands clasped behind him, Bruno clicked the safety off his gun. Then, holding it behind his back, he pulled off his dark shades. You got anything to say to me? Antonio shook his head, slow and cautious. A man of few words, Bruno cut right to it. You're in trouble with the mob council, Antonio. It's their wish to have you retired by the time the sun comes up. Antonio shifted the balance on his feet uneasily. Christ, he muttered. What did I do? 
Bruno narrowed his eyes, but didn't say a word. His face betrayed no intention, no feeling. So my future's in limbo, and you're here to get me out of it, right? Antonio asked. Again, Bruno made no reply. His stoic expression shielded any hint of emotion. He waited. As the silence between them stretched out like an elastic band, the air getting tenser, strained between them. Bruno? Antonio sounded scared. A different man. Don't give me your dumb ass. I don't know what you're talking about, BS. Bruno snapped with a fierce growl. Tell me the truth. Don't lie to me. Raising both hands, Antonio stepped closer to him warily. Bruno. Bruno, I'd never be disloyal to you. Come on, admit it, Bruno sneered. I'm not fucking playing around. Quit stalling and answer the goddamn question. Why did you steal from me? If you needed money, I would have helped you out. You know me, but it hurts my heart that you did that. Antonio gave him a blank stare. Do you think I'm being evasive? Bruno laughed. You're a filthy snake, Antonio. I've worked with you for five years. All this time, and apparently, I don't have a clue who you are. Shit, it makes me sick to hear your name aloud. Antonio looked utterly confused. Bruno, boss, I'm sure we can talk this out like brothers. What do you want me to do? Bruno felt his blood begin to boil. It's too fucking late. There's nothing you can do. You've earned your fate. Bruno pointed the pistol at him. The muzzle was like a black eye that saw through his lies. Antonio's jaw dropped, stunned. Fear replaced curiosity, and he smiled with a twitch of fearful bewilderment. You're fucking kidding me. Bruno closed the gap between them and felt a little satisfaction watching Antonio sweat between the crosshairs. Antonio narrowed his eyes at him. His cheeks reddened, and he looked as if he were holding back rage, but he held it back, pressing his lips into a line instead. Bruno, look, he said. I don't deserve to die. Let's go and have a drink and talk this out. You're in no position to bargain, Bruno bellowed, holding the man's head in the sights of his gun, mouth salivating, heart thrumming. Then he let out a sigh and shook his head. All right, one last drink with my best pal. Bruno moved the barrel of his gun away from him. Dropping his gun, he patted the other man on the arm. I'm only fucking with you, you little pussy. Antonio let out a relieved breath. What you drinking tonight? He sounded happy, relaxed as he turned around. His turn was followed by a heart-stopping boom. That was when Bruno shot him, the bullets slashing right through his skull and brain tissue. Antonio's body hit the ground with a loud thud, and Bruno felt instant relief in his heart. Hit before he knew it was coming, it was the kindest death he could have had. Bruno lifted the smoking gun to his nose and inhaled the fumes with a look of satisfaction. Let's go have a drink and talk this out. Imagine the nerve of him telling Bruno what to do. It took perhaps 30 seconds for Bruno to feel the full impact of what he'd done. He stalked slowly over to the man's body. He heard the short, muffled cries which carried from the traitor's lips. The shot to the head hadn't killed him. A precise and deliberate man, it was unlike Bruno to fuck up a bullet to the brain. He had ten kills under his belt so far. All of the men died instantly. Looming over his former friend, Bruno watched his filthy blood pour from the dime-sized hole in his head. Raw, fatty contortions of brain matter hanging from it. His face so pale, his eyes a horrific mixture of terror, desperation, and pain. It's guys like you who give the mob a bad name. Dying. Antonio panted and whimpered, reaching with the tips of his fingers on the outstretched arm for his gun, which had landed cruelly a hand's length out of his reach. There would be no mercy. It was too late for that. 
Shooting himself dead was his final wish, and even the hands of fate decided that was asking too much. With the heaviest sigh he may have ever heaved in his life, Bruno crouched down to where his friend lay, close to death. Blood ran river-like from the corpse which lay still, his head cocked lazily to one side. Bruno's jaw tightened a few times and his cold, efficient eyes scanned the remains of somebody he'd once thought was truly a great man. This wasn't the man he'd known. He stared at him, and the face he looked into may as well have been the face of an absolute stranger. Antonio died crying and begging. Assuming he'd be remembered for anything, the man who would forever be remembered as a traitor and coward, too a filthy fucking traitor who'd sold out. Certain that he was dead, Bruno let out a deep breath. He removed the golden mafia ring from Antonio's hand and said in a flat monotone, rest in peace, my brother. Rising to a standing position and stepping over, not around the body, Bruno hurried away. Heading south, he left the bridge and scurried into a small park across the street. Two uniformed cops stood on the corner. Damn it to hell. He was in a hell of a mess if he couldn't get out of here. Fast. Quickly, he stripped off his clothes and put on a black skull suit and balaclava. He gave the suit he'd worn to commit murder to a homeless bum out by the bridge. In assholeish fashion, Bruno beat pavement back to his car and shoved Tony's gold ring into his jacket lying on the seat. Then he swiftly put some serious miles between himself and the bridge, not even mildly affected by what he'd just done. A level of detachment that had been both a curse and a blessing all his life. He didn't look back. Chapter 19 As Lovely as She is Fearless Annie's dog instantly started barking from the other side of the front door when Bruno arrived home three hours later. DeLuca was fresh from a kill, and somehow the dog sensed that. Bruno poised his hand on the cool knob, forming his fingers around the brass. Looking up, he peered at the light from his bedroom window and caught sight of the silhouette of his woman inside. His anchor. Bruno immediately unlocked the heavy double door. Inside, his woman would be as angry as her dog sounded, not to mention heartbroken. The festivities had jumped off by this hour. The noise from the party was gone. He should have come straight home, but he hadn't, needing to be alone. Sealing the bubbling emotions that were boiling in his system behind stoic eyes, he tucked his gun into the waist of his trousers and headed inside. The smell of champagne dancing in the air hit his nostrils. Inclining his face to the mongrel clawing at his feet, he arrested the dog's bark with his eyes. He set his duffel bag on the white marble floor and slipped off his shoes. Sorry I took so long, sweetheart he called out to the upper stairs. He set his phone and his keys down on the hallway cabinet and took off his shoes. Annie appeared over the upstairs banister, a shimmering nightgown and bare feet where her heels had been. She sighed, moving out of sight. It's okay. It's the world you and I live in, I suppose. I just gotta live with that. Slowly, Bruno made his way upstairs. Peering through the open bedroom door, his woman came into view, gleaming brunette hair curling down her back and a tiny waist. His hard features softened as he slowly glanced down along her body. The way her nightdress clung to her smooth curves and teacup-sized breasts she usually disguised in bulky sweaters and loose-fitting jackets. Always before, with one look at her, he'd feel his cock go rock hard. Not tonight. Walking towards her, Bruno placed a hand on her shoulder, his silent way of apologizing. Annie, baby. Well, you made it home. I suppose I should be thankful for that, she voiced fatalistically. Annie threw her arms around his neck. The way her sapphire eyes sparkled like twin gemstones in the light totally captured him. 
Her pale skin as pure as fresh milk, her quick smile so naive with a childlike innocence that warmed his big black heart. Bruno returned her hug, wrapping his forearms around her lower back. She buried her head in his chest. Unfortunately, something about Bruno's guilty face had caught her eye. Pulling away slightly, she paused in front of him, unsure. She stood for a moment and then saw blood on his shirt. Alarmed, she stared deep into his eyes. At that moment, he was sure that intuition told her something wasn't right. Sometimes, Bruno hated those keen eyes of hers. They were intense and all-knowing. The bond they shared was beyond words, beyond measure. He could hide nothing from this woman. Who? She whispered softly, tears pooling in her eyes. Tell me who you killed this time. Bruno held her tight, squeezing her arms with the tips of his fingers like he never wanted to let her go. It doesn't matter. You are all that matters to me. I wasn't asking, Bruno. I'm telling you, I want to know. Bruno shrugged her off, and when she tried to grasp her husband's arm, Bruno pushed her away, gently but firmly. DeLuca didn't let his walls down in front of anybody, not even in the arms of his woman. Annie frowned. Other than Castillo, she was the only other person in this world who could hold his heated, steely gaze. Everyone else wanted to avoid it, quickly averting their eyes. Not her. Annie, his sweet. None of that sassy bullshit. She's my sweet Annie, as lovely as she is fearless. Bruno sighed. All right, all right, you're not gonna like it. In a low tone, he told his woman that his best friend was now dead. Annie gasped. A streak of fear struck through her as real as a lightning bolt. He, he's dead? She echoed. She shook her head frantically. And they want you to believe it's your fault? She shook her head again. You're just doing your job, B Bruno. You're not safe with these men. The damned mob is a ticking time bomb on your life. We need to get out. We have to leave. Bless her. She knew what he did, but Bruno was always an innocent in her eyes. This was something he loved about her. He angled his body so he could hug her from the side, then wrapped his arms around her slender shoulders. Threading his fingers through her hair, he shushed his woman. I know it's hard, even if I wanted to leave, which I do not. We cannot just leave, fade into the woodwork. It doesn't work like that, he honestly admitted. She turned her head and looked at him, her eyes matted with unshed tears. You're a big shot now, DeLuca, but I can see that you've forgotten where you come from, who your real friends were. You remember how it used to be for us? Eating cold food from a can. Spam and fruit, Bruno interrupted with a nod. I haven't forgotten any. He held her close and planted a kiss on her forehead. We will never go back to that, but I'll never forget who I am and where I come from. Never. I swear, but I'll kill to protect my family and my honor. She locked onto his gaze and whispered softly, And if I can't live with that? Her voice trembled, sounding scared and broken. Bruno caught her eyes with his. You'll always be at my side. Annie's eyes filled with tears. You don't know that. Bruno shook his head. Yes, I do. I've seen the proof. I'm a dangerous man, Annie. In all my life, I've never met the match I couldn't handle. Not until I felt your flame. You burned through every part of me. A wisp of a smile crossed her lips. He gave her a slight smile. Baby, you were made for me. No one else can ever hold a candle to you. What I have with you is everything to me. Bruno, I... She melted in his arms, her high level of emotion nearly bursting at the seams. 
Lifting her off her feet, Bruno slammed her back against the wall, lips fusing with hers, shutting her up. She wrapped her legs around his waist. When he kissed her slender neck, it pulsed with the beat of her heart. Annie's head rolled from the sudden pleasure. He tore her bra from her body, ripping the metal fasteners to shreds. She felt for his cock at the crotch of his pants, but he slapped her hands away. Nope, he growled. This one's all for you. Despite the sexual frustration she caused him, his cock wasn't hard enough to do everything he wanted to do. Instead, he dropped her onto the bed. The sheet still smelled of sex from the night before, but Bruno liked it that way. When he ran his hands up her inner thighs, she shuddered and smiled with delight. He touched his fingers against her pussy, making her wet against her will. And the more he did, the wetter she became. Stroking her clit until she was whining, crying out, pleading while looking up into his eyes. Unable to control her body's reaction, she melted underneath him, hands pressing his rock-hard pecs, nails digging deep. Oh, Bruno, I don't know how much more I can take. A ferocious, demonic growl erupted from his lips. I'm not done yet. I got big plans for you. She kissed his neck and chest as he worked on her, and the heat from her tongue radiated into his flesh as her body bucked under his hands, and she came. Wow, she said breathlessly. Bruno chuckled deep and sensuously. They both laughed, and he plopped them down onto the bed. Her cheeks were flushed, her complexion glowing. She let out a long, rich sigh, depleting into the sheets. I'll be just a moment, Bruno whispered. Getting up from the bed, he passed the chair at the bedside table to go and wash up. As he did, he knocked his jacket, and Antonio's big gold ring dropped to the ground, the heavy metal falling to the floor with the clunk. Turning over, Annie leaned over the edge of the bed to see what it was. Whoa, what's that? In a great rush of excitement, she leaned over the bed and brought up the shiny gold ring from the ground. Clutching his hand around hers, Bruno took Antonio's ring and paused for a long moment before he put it in his pocket. Annie's eyes searched his face while looking concerned for him. What are you thinking? Bruno met her gaze and held it. Only that I got so lucky. Really lucky with you, my sweet Annie. Annie blushed. Reaching out, she stroked his cheek. Me too, she said, smiling proudly. Chapter 20 The Bitter End One month later, the Friday before Christmas was icy and bleak. In the last dark month since Antonio's murder, Coronado had been bitterly cold with low-hung clouds that promised snow but never quite delivered. Even though Christmas decorations hung from every mantel and window in Bruno's home, it was difficult to feel festive. For the past thirty days, the memory of what he'd done had made his heart heavy with sorrow and loss. His mind kept spinning on the grim similarity of Antonio's death to how his father had died at the hands of his best friend. He had awakened to Annie's touch, hands shaking, drenched in sweat. It took several minutes, with his woman dabbing his forehead with a cool flannel, to reacquaint himself with reality. Shh. She gazed into his eyes and held him like an anchor, sinking his body down slowly onto the sheets. Sweat ran down his face, and he grimaced in distress. Clutching his dancing heart, the overwhelming notion that he may never get over this flooded his thoughts. Weak from reliving the nightmare of what he'd done, he eased himself back down. Nightmares weren't something he was used to. No, bitch, he was the nightmare, not the victim. He'd had one of the most intense nightmares of all time. In it, he was the sheep in disguise, and everybody knew it. Bruno, you're no son of mine. His father's ghost had screamed. An ugly beast came for him, 
an ugly son of a bitch named Karma. The motherfucker had Castillo's killer eyes and Antonio's voice, and Karma promised he would die too. Deeply disturbed, he could not go back to sleep, not now. Like the stubborn ass fucker Antonio had been, the jackass came for him in his dreams, over and over. The torment was eating DeLuca alive on the inside, another damn headache in his life. It was hard to live with, but Bruno knew he could handle it. A tired groan escaped his lips. The bed creaked as he stuffed another pillow behind his head. Lifting up the covers, he gazed at Annie's heart-shaped face. Annie leaned over his groin, between his legs, sucking his cock between his legs, she went to town. Although dazed and still in a fringing on sleep, he moaned and clutched a fistful of her hair tight. All at once he was in ecstasy, his cock was being forced to feel, and it felt fucking good. Fuck, babe, he muttered on a groan. The woman knew how to deep throat his cock. Fuck, he loved the way her mouth felt. Stopping for a moment to meet his eyes, she crawled up his body and kissed his face, then went back down, clasping his thick cock in hand as she slowly pumped it. She licked and French kissed his cock like a lollipop. Her tongue was smooth as silk, lighter than air. He moaned for more, gritting his teeth in pleasure. He watched her the whole time as his mind swirled in a hurricane of ecstasy. His leg muscles twitched as his breathing became erratic. With voracious lust, he reached out and grabbed another fistful of her hair. His hips humped the air until he couldn't hold on any longer and shot his load deep into her throat. Without a word, she leaned forward and wiped his cum from her lips, capturing his mouth in a searing kiss. As their tongues danced together, he took control of her body, spinning her around and bringing his cock to her tight ass. Still rock hard, he rammed into her, stretching her pussy out from behind. She was screaming, begging for him to keep going, verging on hysteria. Hands squeezing tight around her tits, he could feel her heartbeat bumping crazily. He released into her again with a husky, lustful moan. When he was finished, he stood up, tugging his boxers on, and steadied his woman as she tried to stand on wobbly post-climactic legs. He felt so much better now. His Annie knew how to pull him out of the darkness. Bruno turned out the lights and then raised the bedroom window to get some fresh air. He glanced out of his window to the city, ablaze with Christmas lights. Since it was so early, no one was about on the streets. He took Annie into the shower with him and lovingly soaped her sweet, curvy body and rinsed her form under the warm water spray. He shampooed her hair and kissed her neck when he was done. Ooing and awing at the lavish attention, her body slumped with utter satisfaction. Yes, Bruno knew how to treat his woman right. She was his whole world, and he let her know this in every way he knew. After toweling her dry and kissing her soundly, he went downstairs. Bruno's home looked spectacular. Ivy pregnant with berries hung everywhere while mistletoe hung from the walls and no less than three Christmas trees stood on the floor. He'd gone out back for a smoke when Annie popped her head out the door in her dressing gown, his mobile phone in hand. Taking the phone, he answered the call. Marco sighed. I don't know how to tell you this, but we got the wrong man, Marco said, his voice shaking. A low growl rumbled from Bruno's lungs. Raising a fist to his lips, Bruno bit down hard on his knuckles. What the fuck are you talking about? And Antonio, he didn't steal the paintings. It wasn't him. For one second, Bruno's body froze dead and every part of him went numb. You fucking messed up, Marco. When Marco made no reply, reality came down on Bruno like a brick to the brain. 
Stepping inside and slamming the door, Bruno slid back the deadbolt on the kitchen door and sat down. With considerable effort, he tried not to tear the man's head off. You've really fucked this up, Marco. You told me you knew firsthand who did it. Shit, I'm getting a damn headache just thinking about it. He shook his head. Motherfucker, this can't be happening. Was this a mistake? For his sake and sanity, he hoped so. Bruno, I feel terrible. Marco sent him a mugshot of a man who'd just been taken into custody for theft, the thick red scar right down his face verifying the truth. Fuck how you feel, you stupid ass bitch, he bellowed, voice cracking. Marco sighed. Boss, tell me what I can do. You can't do shit. Needless to say, DeLuca was pissed as hell. His body a pressure cooker, his brain a hellacious storm. It wasn't just Marco he blamed. Both of them had made something out of virtually nothing. Bruno was furious, furious at himself. He'd always said people were stupid, illogical, irrational, dumb as fuck. Now, he was one of them. And that was tough shit to deal with. Bruno growled. It's me that will live with his blood on my hands. Ah, he bellowed through gritted teeth. Guilt had kicked in like a bitch. Gripping the phone firmly, it cracked in his enormous hand. He slammed the remains of his phone into the wall. It smashed to pieces. Bruno, baby, come and sit down. Annie's soft voice sang from the doorway. Bruno glanced in her direction, so naive, oblivious, hanging calmly in the open doorway. It's Christmas Eve. Whatever needs dealing with can be dealt with after Christmas is over, Bruno. Bitch, I'm working, he seethed and instantly felt a pang of regret. He ground his teeth, looking out the window. I'll get him, who really did it, he muttered to himself. He threw open the kitchen window. The cold air slashed at his face. Don't you talk to me like that, she snapped. Bruno didn't turn around, didn't look at her, hands trembling, seething, furious with himself. Lighting up, he hid in a cloud of cigarette smoke at the window, thinking with a depression that was unlike him. Had Castillo chosen the wrong man to succeed him? Growling, he slammed the window shut. One thing was clear. He hadn't come this far to allow weakness into his bones. On a huff, Bruno's naive little woman marched her two size fives right up to her man and clutched his cold cheeks, angling his face so they were looking at each other. Read my lips, Bruno. It can wait. Bruno tried to shrug her away, but she gripped his arms tightly, firm and aggressive. The little pocket rocket of a woman was small, but strong as iron. Whoever you got a vendetta against this time, killing won't fix whatever it is, Bruno. It never does. Bruno made no reply. The woman sighed fatalistically. Releasing her hold, she dropped onto the chair beside him. Just as soon as she'd sat down, Bruno, in one smooth motion, ripped the chair beside her from its place at the table and sent it flying sideways into the kitchen cupboards, smashing the chair beyond use. Oh, real mature. Annie rolled her eyes. Blind rages were the norm with this man. Chest heaving, Bruno stilled, catching his breath. He stared at his woman for the longest time, but didn't say a word. The big man wanted to cry, but was unable to release his tears. That part of him had withered and died a long time ago. Slowly moving over to him, Annie sunk into the arms of the big beast, her beast, her eyes meeting his. Talk to me, talk to me, she whispered. Caressing her arms with his calloused hands, he felt goosebumps all over her skin. She was frightened, anxious. There's only one thing you need to feel right now, she voiced calmly, smoothing her hands up along his muscled chest. Dropping to her level, 
He touched his lips to her ear. I'm sorry, he whispered. She tugged him closer until his cock could feel her soft mound through their clothes. A deep, seductive craving to take her right now shot fire through his veins. He growled. Now was no time to play. Pushing her aside firmly but carefully, Bruno stormed out of the kitchen and bolted up the stairs. In the bedroom, he went over to the dresser and put on his suit in rapid, almost robotic movements. Far from okay, he had to get out. He ran downstairs. Bruno, please, where are you going now? Annie's voice wavered. Stop and relax a while, she pleaded. Bruno just made his way towards the door. I won't be long, baby, he said, choosing to ignore her pleading. Where are you going, Bruno? Annie shrieked as he yanked open the front door. You can't just storm out like this. The room shook as the front door slammed shut. Bruno marched to his vehicle with the fiery determination of an army. Hopping into his black sedan, he kicked it into reverse, knocking over his wife's concrete potted plants, soil and flowery shit spilling all over the ground. Then he revved forwards on a turn and hit the street. A fire in his soul and gangster rap on the radio, Bruno raced north away from the quiet of Oceanside toward the nice part of San Diego. Kicking the car into higher gear, he gripped the wheel hard into a tight turn to avoid veering off the road, then raced down the clear streets at 60 miles per hour to the heart-stopping boom of the speakers. Leaning forward to the windshield, the day was clear, but all he saw was fireworks. This was the last fucking straw. After an hour of driving the empty roads, he pulled into a bleak little car park over by the town's government offices. Easing on the brake, Bruno rolled into the small, dingy car park out back. Killing the engine, he hopped out of the car. Seagulls coursed the air overhead as he looked over to the sign for the Coronado graveyard. Marching up the foggy walkways of the graveyard, Bruno passed through the world of irregular rectangles, cemetery headstones that marked the graves here and there. His legs moved as though possessed, like the walking dead, numbly drifting through time. The silence in the graveyard was as gray as the air, as deadly as the man who roamed through it. When he reached Antonio's final place of rest, feelings slowly returned. Reaching into his pocket, he pulled out a cigar and noticed that his hands were shaking. Lighting up, Bruno took a hard sock off the stogie while his eyes locked on Antonio's grave. This amazing man was dead, gone, never coming back. This was all he was now, a dull gray stone. A gull screamed in the air, and Bruno's stomach turned to lead. His heart beat so hard it was as if he were having a heart attack. What he really felt was shame. Was this the price of success in this life? Those who achieved it were left wandering the world alone in self-disgust and regret. In a world obsessed with vigilante justice and revenge, everything he loved and cared for was being ripped from his soul. And soon, all that would be left of him was a shadow of the man he once was. Running two calloused hands to his cheeks, he whispered out loud, What have I done? He could hardly hear his own voice, lost in the wind. A cutting stitch gutted him from the inside, feeling as if the wind had been punched out of him while chained to a treadmill. What have I done? Bruno repeated, his voice raging like a wild animal. He looked up to the clouds, but all he saw was darkness, black like his heart. The cloudy sky seemed to morph into an image of something, a shape, a figure, a face. Not Antonio, but his father. As he stared at the image, creeping closer, looming overhead, something deep in his unconscious mind surfaced. His father's words, words he'd been living by for so long. You can't trust anybody in this world, Bruno. A single tear free fell down his face. The big man fell to his knees, shaking his head. 
Why would you say that to me, Dad? Why? But the clouds were as silent as the cemetery itself. Tears began to flood down his cheeks and chin, and he cursed it. Swiping the tears with the back of his hand, he closed his eyes and relaxed his body, praying for this feeling, all feelings, to melt away as they always did. He had seen too much violence, too much tragedy to let this get to him. It was tragic, but normal. It shouldn't be affecting him like it was. Get control of yourself. Get control of yourself. If you don't, who's going to lead the crime family? Slowly lowering his eyes to Antonio's name engraved on the tombstone, he vowed, Antonio, my brother, I swear, I'll break the fucking man who did the crime you paid for. I'll break the shit out of him. I'll break him slow so he feels the impact of what he's done. Even still, disgust gripped his heart and lungs, squeezing hard. Bruno huffed. He hated himself, but what happened had happened. There was no changing it. This man had been his only real friend outside of his blood family. Bruno hated to think this way, but he knew it was the mob that had led him to do this. He'd allowed himself to become so brainwashed by that life. And now, nothing could be done. Right and wrong, good and bad, weren't black and white anymore. Suddenly, he finally understood that his brother was right to have taken the position he did. Charlie was smart, turning his back on the crime family before they could get him by the throat like they had Bruno. He was a man of that life now, a man of his word, mob for life, and you don't walk away from the mob. They carry you out feet first, if you know what that means. Emotions bombarded his hardened heart. Hanging his head, he dug his nails into his palms, willing his heart not to go berserk. Was he crazy? Was he nuts? Killing people left and right, committing murder with the nonchalance of somebody opening a can of beer. He realized why his father had been so tough on him growing up. It had shaped him, molded him into the monster he was. A man who could kill, unafraid of anyone. Michael DeLuca had built his definition of a man, not a pussy. And although he was doing him a favor, in the mob, it showed weakness to have a heart. You couldn't have a heart in this business. Without this edge, he wouldn't have survived. Yes, he survived. He'd made it. But he still had to live with who he was. God damn it. Bruno threw both hands over his face and yelled, hands trembling, tears free-falling down his face. A man pulled to the edge, hollow, stripped away. He asked himself, was this what he deserved? His fingers tucked into his coat, and from within, he withdrew his twenty-two from under his jacket. Holding it in both hands, he pointed the muzzle at his tortured face and stared deep into the dark, hollow barrel. Chapter 21 The End of the Road A cork from a bottle of Dom Perignon exploded across the large office floor, decorated for Christmas. Up in the top office of the casino, Bruno stood alone. Turning on his heels to face the windowed wall that overlooked his casino, he removed his blazer and kicked off his shoes. He drank the champagne right from the bottle, and as the alcohol burned the back of his throat, he held up the bottle triumphantly to the empty casino, imagining an adoring audience below. It was Christmas Day, the only day of the year the casino wasn't open. As Bruno raised the bottle to throw another gulp down the hatch, the door sounded behind him. His face changed from joy to anger as he quickly drew his gun, cocked it, and spun around. When he spotted Marco in the crosshairs, he narrowed his eyes, then slowly lowered his weapon. Marco sighed, pacing steadily into the center of the room. What are you doing, Bruno? Bruno stared at his cousin for the longest time, then clicked the safety on and shoved his gun back into his belt. Turning on his heels, he gazed out of the window again. 
Marco was saying something behind him, but Bruno didn't want to listen. Marco came marching up to him and stood at his side. Bruno, it's Christmas Day. Family, stockings, chestnuts, Rudolph. Those things ring a bell? Bruno was musing and uncommunicative. In his own time, the big man finished a swig of champagne and then turned his head to face his cousin. Marco was dressed in a tuxedo, a dark tie to match his dark eyes around his neck. Like a military officer, not a hair on his head was out of place. Bruno cleared his throat. Well, this is my building. I've got to make plans for the new year. And it's the only day of the year I can be alone here. Not a crime, is it? Oh, and that's the only reason? Bruno fixed him with a look. Perhaps it's me that should be asking what you're doing here, he quipped. Your wife's worried about you, Bruno. It's Christmas. A long, pregnant pause stretched out between them. Tell you what, why don't you and Annie spend Christmas with the wife and me, Marco suggested. She's cooking up a storm at home, and we'd love to have you. They locked eyes for a moment, an intense moment. Bruno huffed, his attitude changing instantly. A smirk crept across his lips. Then plonking the champagne bottle down on his enormous desk, he started for the door. Marco jogged to catch up. So that's a yes then? He called, sounding surprised. Bruno kept walking. Falling into step with him, he kept his eyes on his cousin, looking concerned. Bruno? Just before he reached the doorway, Bruno stopped and looked at him thoughtfully. Annie and I would love to spend the holidays with you, but we got something to handle first. Marco's big black brows met in the middle. What? Planting a page into his pager, Bruno called a meeting in one hour's time with his men. Unfair at Christmas time? Sure, but Bruno wasn't a fair man. Rules were rules. His guys would be there. The only medicine that would sober up his emotions quickly was work. He had a job to do, a responsibility to those who were living. His personal problems were something he couldn't afford to indulge in. He could rise or he could crumble. He had to become himself again, be a DeLuca again. He wouldn't let this mind-fucking storm win, no way. You could bet the fucking farm on that. Bruno opened the door, with ice in his veins and revival igniting in his eyes. Why, Bruno, it's Christmas Day. What's the big emergency? Marco laughed. Because I said so, that's why. Then, without looking back, he left. A black Mercedes limousine appeared around a corner and squealed to a stop at the front gate of the mob's iron-gated warehouse, which was manned by two sturdy Italian men. There were three men inside the vehicle. One was the driver. Rolling to a stop, the driver killed the engine and got out to open the passenger doors. When his door opened, Bruno stepped out of the vehicle. He looked around, then ambled towards the front door. Marco followed close behind him. Meanwhile, the common room inside was packed and noisy. Everyone was merry and drinking, toasting to the holidays. Only the doorman stood quiet and alone, waiting expectantly for the boss. When the boss approached the doors, he narrowed his eyes through the peephole in the door, then whistled to the others. At once, the room quieted ominously, so it could be heard with startling clarity when the outside door slammed open with a huge bang that made everybody look up. The big man, DeLuca, glanced at his men as he marched into the dimly lit room, his muscular body nothing but perfection in his expensive Italian suit tailored just for him. Making a beeline for the meeting table, the solid click-click of his leather shoes and heavy weight resonating underfoot. A path cleared for him as he crossed the room. When Marco entered the warehouse, he cleared his throat. Everybody take your seats. This is a formal meeting, fellas, not the bar crawl. He gestured for everyone to sit down at the hulking oak table. The mob men exchanged apprehensive glances, then they all gathered around the meeting table. Everyone squeezed together to give enough room for all the guys. 
Taking a standing position at the head of the table, Bruno was silent for a long time, mentally preparing for his audience. Marco came to stand beside his cousin. Everyone watched the two formidable men, both silent, both composed. Their composure wasn't for the men, though. It was for them to keep a clear mind. Bruno took one look at them and cleared his throat, his steely eyes angry as hell. The men shrunk in their seats under his gaze. DeLuca had no idea what he was going to say, but he knew the message he needed to send. Before the big man could even say a word, Bones spoke. No word on who shot Antonio yet, eh? Bruno turned his eyes on the man. Nope, he answered, voice casual. A tense quiet pulled out over the room for several minutes until Bruno's composure finally snapped. That does it. I've been patient with you no goods long enough. When each and every one of you was taken into this family, you took an oath that you were prepared to live and die by the family. To do what you must for the good of the family. And when I look into your ugly faces, that's not something I see anymore. Everyone stared back at him, looking shocked. Oh, now you're fucking speechless. Bruno kept his eyes on his brothers, awaiting a response. Something. Anything. Face stern, eyes penetrating, he raised a brow. Everyone silently jerked a nod at the big man. Everyone has a job to do. Don't think I haven't noticed you guys have become a hell of a lot more relaxed since Castillo went down. And I'm here to tell you, this ain't gonna fly. He glanced at his cousin. Marco nodded. You listening, fellas? Marco's baritone rumbled. You disobey the boss's rules. You don't toe the line, and you'll suffer the consequences. Snapping his head around, Bruno gave his men a swift, piercing look. Listen, we all miss Bobby. We all miss Castillo. We all miss Antonio. But what do you want me to do? Tell you it's over? Tell you it's finished? Well, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but this ain't the end of the road. It's only the beginning. As he spoke, it was as if a magical current threaded swiftly through him. A long, invisible wire had pulled him from the guilt and ripped off his somber feeling. All that I do, I do for you. And how do you repay me? With laziness and trouble. I won't have it. Not anymore. This is a test of strength that I refuse to fail. And if any of you have a problem with that, if this ain't what you want, you got one chance to walk out that door. Everyone looked at each other, dumbfounded, but no one moved. All right, then. It seems we got a solid understanding. From within his jacket, he produced a fresh bottle of champagne. Popping the cork, he raised the bottle high. For all the sacrifices, for all the hurt, we'll come back stronger. Cheers filled the common room. Bruno took a swig, then handed the bottle to Bones at his right, who also took a swig and passed the bottle on. You got the rest of the day to get the shit from this year out of your system. Then I'll see you all here at 7 a.m. tomorrow morning. Capiche? Capiche? His men grumbled in unison. All right then, everybody out. Have a merry fucking Christmas, Bruno called out. The place cleared quickly. Then Bruno and Marco were alone at the bar in the common room. Marco polished off his drink. You about ready to make a move? Bruno glanced at his phone, feeling the growing count of missed calls from his Annie. Yep. He hopped down from his stool and marched over to the stairs to the basement, the metallic chink of his keys in hand sounding as he moved. Downstairs, he crossed the gym towards the office door and checked to see if it was locked. Before leaving that day, he eyed the gym and his eyes fixed on Antonio's locker. The metal door hung wide open and crumpled in the center from when Bruno had punched it open in a fit of pure rage. Walking slowly over, he pulled open the tiny door and peered inside. It was empty. Bruno lowered his eyes, shook his head, cursing himself for doing that. He had to stop this. Just as he went to leave, his eye caught something else. 
Bobby's locker. The tragic deaths would always be there. They could not be undone. Shaking his head again, he was about to make an exit when something else occurred to him. There still remained the mystery of Bobby's death. It didn't quite add up. The pieces of the puzzle never quite fit right. Bobby hadn't been right leading up to when he was murdered. His eyes were hollow and vacant, like the mob had washed his sweet soul away, subtracted him from the world. Being here, where it was so quiet, helped Bruno realize that. Bruno took out the boss's keys that he'd inherited all those years ago when Castillo went up. He then crouched to the ground and opened the locker with the small key. Nudging the locker compartment wide, he peered into the locker, stocked with his gym shoes, a six-ounce water bottle, boxing gloves, and Bobby's gold mob ring. Why would that be in here? It was tradition. They wore their rings religiously, always, never took them off so this was especially odd for the son of the boss. If Castillo had seen the boy wasn't wearing it, he would have nearly killed him with his own two hands. It niggled at Bruno. With a growing sense of foreboding, he reached out to take the ring in hand, and when he did, he noticed a small piece of paper rolled up inside like a napkin in a holder. Slipping out the paper, he unrolled it, and dropping the ring to the ground, held it open with both hands. Holding it up to the light, his eyes went wide as he scanned the words on the page. Its contents seemed seeped in the bleakest loss of hope. It could not be interpreted as anything other than a suicide note. I could not ask for help. I am saying goodbye. He wrote that he could no longer struggle under the pressures of his father that he was not just having a bad day, but that he had reached the end of all hope, the darkening of all dreams. Tragic. Irreconcilable. Fucking hell. Bruno's face broke into a grotesque, pained wince. His thoughts relentlessly took him. The more he thought about it, the more it made sense to him. The kid had been acting off in the months leading up to his death, and in a world where nobody walks away, suicide would be the only way to escape his father's empire. Bruno closed his eyes, and he bowed his head. Castillo had been right about one thing. Nobody had any cause to kill his son. What he could never know was that it had been him that caused his own son to commission his own death, his own boy smothered by expectations. He must have hired someone to do it and that is why he was found all shot up. That would explain the man Castillo had in bits and pieces that one night. Bruno scrubbed his hand to his face and exhaled a frustrated sigh. There were so many variables that could have changed this kid's terrible ending. Bruno, you about done, Marco's voice echoed from upstairs. Bruno immediately scrunched the paper, shrinking it to a tiny compact ball in his enormous hand, then glanced towards the stairway as Marco came down the stairs. His cousin, like everyone else, would have a luxury Bruno would never have, the luxury of not knowing what Bruno knew. Just as Marco came into view, he released his bone-crushing grip on the ball of paper and bringing his palm to his mouth, tossed his head back and swallowed the cancerous secret hole. Anyone else would run away. Anyone else would leave the mob forever, too weak to face it. Bruno, you ready? Marco huffed. Bruno gave a slow, cold grin. He wasn't going anywhere. Epilogue Tasks, life's full of them. I came from the gutter to touch the bright sun, and today, people call me a champion. People say they want to be like me, and I laugh. If you think I'm a good man, the Robin Hood of the streets the press tells you I am, you are set to be harshly disappointed. I'm no animal, but I'll do what I've got to do to survive. I'm a wanted man with blood on my hands. I'm the product of a dark life, and it's broken me in places that can't ever be fixed. 
This life can and will make your life a living hell. It's a rigged game and your live bait. In this life, you make a mistake and learn from it. Make it once more and it will be the death of you. I've never been afraid for myself. But my family at home? Oh, yes, for my family. How do I deal with that? Well, I have a responsibility greater than most can possibly fathom. A responsibility to my mob family, the men who made me who I am today. I guess you could call it a pain in my ass and a privilege. My life is a truth stranger than fiction. A winner, not a quitter. I'm only just getting started. But for you, a word of advice. You should never, ever trust my kind. Bruno DeLuca This has been Bruno, a dark mafia romance. Written by Raven Scott. Narrated by Jack Callahan. Copyright 2020 by Raven Scott. Production copyright by Raven Scott.